Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. The Winter Brothers A Second Chance Romance Audiobook Book 6 of the Nightclub Sin series by Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2024 BFA Publishing Blow I promised not to fall for anyone again. But these two bad boy brothers are too hard to resist. Meeting the Winter Brothers changed my life forever and everything turned upside down when they arrived because now I'm caught up in a sibling rivalry. Tommaso is friendly and outgoing, while Raffaello is a distant, brooding bad boy who keeps himself. My heart longs for one, but my body craves both of them. Nothing will stop them from staking their claim on my heart and body. I can't deny the desires of the flesh as they both ravage me. I thought the hardest decision would be choosing between them. But all of that changed when people around me began to die. Snowfall Inca pulled her coat around her tighter as she ran from the truck to the inviting warmth of the coffee shop. The squall, which had blown in from the sound overnight, brought with it searing cold winds and fine rain that invaded clothing relentlessly. The door blew open just as Inca reached it and she dived in, grateful that it pulsed with heat. Someone had turned up the heating way too high, thank God, she thought, and smiled at Nancy behind the counter. Hey, kiddo. Her adoptive mother offered her a towel to dry her hair. How are things? It had been two days since the attack in the city parking lot, and although Inca had been thoroughly interrogated by Scarlet, she'd also sworn her to secrecy. I just want to forget it and the fewer people who know, the better. I don't want Tyler and Nancy to worry. Scarlet hadn't been happy, but something in Inca's face had made her agree. Now, Inca smiled at her mom. Good thanks. Nancy watched her hang her coat up. Really? Inca didn't answer her for a moment, and when she turned back to Nancy, her voice was strained. I'm fine, Nancy. But she knew she couldn't keep the truth from Nancy for long, especially after last night, when, tormented by nightmares, Inca had suffered a full-blown panic attack and called her adoptive mother at 3 a.m., sobbing and incoherent. Inca waited until the tea house was empty, then asked Nancy to sit down with her. In a halting voice, she told her what had happened. Inca had spent her day off in Seattle, happily avoiding the rain by ducking in and out of bookshops and coffee shops. Busman's holiday, she grinned to herself, trying not to compare this coffee house with her own small tea house in the small town just outside Seattle. Overlooking the bay, the little Japanese-influenced gathering place had been Inca's dream when she was studying business at college. With the help of Nancy and Tyler, she'd opened it five years previously, not knowing what the people of small-town America would think. The Sakura Tea House was about as far from Starbucks as they could imagine, but they loved it. Even the grizzled old mountain men came to drink her specialist brews and chat with their friends. Inca lived in a small apartment above the tea house, but whenever she had a day off, she would escape, either to hike along mountain trails or to the city to find new reading material. Two days ago had been the latter. She'd finished the pile of books on her nightstand, and although there were still a couple of other piles of unread books in her living room, she told herself there was always a good reason to buy more. Books were her drug of choice. Hours of browsing and reading relaxed her into an almost soporific state, and she simply did not consider the fact that by the time she left the bookstore and headed back to the parking garage, it was already dark outside. She didn't hear him behind her until the last second, and then, as her assailant grabbed her, she went into survival mode. Adrenaline flooded her system, and she fought back as he attempted to wrestle her to the ground. Inca Sardi was no pushover, despite her diminutive height of 5 foot 2 inches. 
She'd studied self-defense martial arts, and she used her body to unbalance her attacker, elbowing him rapidly and firmly in the solar plexus, then turning and ramming her thumbs into his eyes. The attacker, a young guy with dirty blonde hair and a pockmarked face, yelped and staggered away, cussing her out. Inca quickly got into her car and banged down the locks. She drove out of the parking garage, and it wasn't until much later, at home, that she began to feel the post-traumatic effects. She practiced deep breathing to calm down. She tried to stop her body trembling. She thought it had worked until the moment, almost an entire day later, she awoke screaming at 3 a.m. and crawled downstairs to call Nancy. Nancy had her hand on her chest, her face pale. Oh, good grief, Inca, why didn't you tell me? Inca looked guilty. I didn't want you to worry. I'm fine. Not even a scratch. Nancy looked disapproving. Have you told Ollie? Ollie Rosenbaum was the town's police chief and Inca's very amicable ex-boyfriend. Inca shrugged. Although she and Ollie were still close friends, she still felt the pain of the breakup Ollie initiated a few months ago. It's not that I don't love you, he'd said gently, it's just... I think we both need more than just being good friends. But you are my best friend, Inca, you always will be. And he'd kept true to his word, he still came by the tea house every day, and they hung out all the time. Inca hated to admit it, but in fact, once the constraint of a relationship had been removed from them, they seemed closer than ever. She shook her head now. Ollie has enough to do, and it was no big deal. I told Knox yesterday, and he agreed with me. Knox Westerwick was the town's deputy chief of police and local Lothario. Inca thought he was funny, but she also knew how to keep away from his type. Knox never gave up though, and Inca had warmed to him lately. Underneath all the crap, he was a decent guy, not that she'd ever let him near her heart or her bed. You told Knox that? Nancy's voice was hard, and Inca looked at her curiously. What's up, Nance? You and Knox have a fight. Not exactly. I just gave him the mom speech. Inca giggled, feeling her mood lift. The mom speech? Nancy swatted her with a towel. Less of your sass, Inca. Seriously though, kiddo, I got your back. It's what happens when your kid calls you at three in the morning in tears. Inca's smile faded. Sorry about that. I guess I just panicked. Nancy frowned and opened her mouth to speak, but just then, the door opened, and a wave of customers came in. For the next couple of hours, they barely had a chance to exchange words, and it was only when Scarlet greeted them noisily that Inca looked up from her work. Yo, 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 you old crumbles. Still alive? Good. Nancy rolled her eyes and Inca laughed. Scarlet Moyer might be 19 years old and a brutally confident young woman, but they still loved her. She was bright, funny, and didn't stand for any nonsense, but she had a big heart. Dressed, as always, in her short skirt with Doc Martens and a t-shirt that read Smile Muthoff CKA, she snapped her gum and gave them both a cheesy grin. Inca studied her apparel. That t-shirt needs a comma, she said thoughtfully, and Scarlet laughed. Only you, Inca Minx, would be more offended by a grammatical error than by foul language. She grabbed a sharpie from the counter and added the missing comma after smile. Happy? Definitely. Now get to work, slave. Inca grinned at her young friend. There might have been nine years between them, but they'd clicked the minute Scarlet had walked into the tea house two years ago. Scarlet, an undergraduate at the University of Washington, was wise beyond her years, and Inca trusted her implicitly. Now Scarlet slipped her apron around her tiny waist. I have gossip, she said as she began to stack cups in the sink. Someone, or rather several people, have bought the old Fletcher mansion. Inca's eyebrows shot up. Really? After all this time? Yup. And you're never going to believe who. Nancy rolled her eyes impatiently. Just spill it, Scarlet. Scarlet grinned. If I said the name Winter to you, who would you think? Both Inca and Nancy looked blank, and Scarlet gave a hiss of frustration. Gosh, grandmas. She grabbed Inca's iPad from the counter and quickly pulled up a photograph and newspaper article. Tommaso and Raffaello Winter. Look at them. 
Inca glanced quickly at the photograph. She saw two young men with identical dark curly hair and intense green eyes. I have no idea who they are, she said, turning back to her work. Nancy took the iPad from Scarlett and read the article aloud. The Winter Twins, heirs to the Winter Property Fortune, are billionaires in their own right. The brothers, 35, decided to relocate from their native Italy to Washington State to pursue their respective careers. Tommaso Winter is working with the U.S. government to promote clean energy in the Pacific Northwest, whereas Raffaello Winter is the owner of the international club franchise, Zensual, that will be opening a new club in Seattle at the end of the month. Widely considered the two most eligible men on the planet, the Winters will have the pick of the Seattle social elite to choose from when they arrive in the state. The twins are still reeling from the death of their Italian mother, Silvana, who lost her battle with cancer earlier this month. Silvana Winter was divorced from the boy's father, Edgar Winter. Inca had stopped listening, but she caught Nancy's tone and grinned at her. You hate them already. Nancy shrugged. Poor little rich boys. Strange that two 35-year-olds still live together. Twins, Scarlet shrugged by way of explanation. They are gorgeous, though. Look, Inca, look at those eyes, those bodies. Gosh. Inca grinned. Drooling at work is most unseemly, Scarlet. But look. She shoved the iPad back at Inca, who, sighing, took it. Scarlet wasn't wrong. Tommaso and Raffaello Winter were heartbreakingly handsome, they had that brooding, seductive thing going on. Inca studied them, trying to pick out the differences. Raffaello's eyes were wary, his curls slightly longer and wilder, but that was it. They looked like movie stars. Inca handed the iPad back. You know what they look like? Trouble. Scarlet grinned. Yeah, fantastic. Inca opened her apartment door, rolling her eyes and giving him a disapproving look. It's 11 page M. Ollie shrugged. Come on in. Inca stood back to let him pass and squinted at him. Nancy told you, right? Question is, Ollie said, why didn't you? She fixed him some tea and Ollie thanked her as she passed him the cup. Inca sank into the sofa, pulling her legs up under her and studied her friend with a critical eye. Ollie, at 33, was five years her senior. His light brown hair was cut short, his hazel eyes crinkled at the edges. Clean-cut All-American, Ollie Rosenbaum was the epitome of trustworthy and noble. You're not my bodyguard, Ollie. She softened her words with a smile. It was really nothing. I handled it. Why didn't you tell me? Ollie raised his eyebrows at her. Inca rolled her eyes. Because you have enough to do, and what could you have done anyway? Nothing. It was over in less than two minutes, and I'm fine. Like I said, you're not my bodyguard. Ollie sipped his tea. Are you pissed with me or something? No, sweetie, just tired. How are things with you? Ollie nodded. Good. Good. Listen, Inks, um. Inca suppressed a smile. What's her name? Ollie laughed, his expression sheepish. Molly. She's a criminologist, working out of the city. Inca felt a pang in her chest but smiled at him. Nice. How long have you been seeing her? A week or two. Look, I wanted to tell you because I'm thinking of taking her to Levi and Jim's, and I didn't want to just tip up there and... I get it, Inca interrupted. Look, Ollie, we're adults and friends. It's okay, really. I look forward to meeting her. We both need to move on. Later, after Ollie left, Inca went into the bathroom to shower and get ready for bed. She stepped out of the shower and wrapped a towel around her long, dark hair and grabbed her moisturizer. Gazing in the mirror, she looked at herself critically. She had cafe au lait skin courtesy of her Indian birth mother and almond-shaped green eyes from her Japanese-American father. She knew people considered her beautiful, but Inca could never see what the fuss was about. She had to be honest, the attention she got wasn't always welcome. Catcalls, lascivious and repellent remarks, and even grabbing hands had all been part of her life since she was a teenager. Her curvy body drew men to her constantly. 
it was the reason why she had taken self-defense classes. Inca couldn't remember when her dislike of the attention had started. Nancy and Tyler had adopted her from a very young age, and she couldn't remember her life before that. She'd asked Nancy once, and Nancy, her face pale, had merely told her. Be thankful you can't remember. Inca had been satisfied with that for a while. But lately, she had been having vicious nightmares about violence and a woman screaming. She had woken up shivering and gasping for air. Even with Ollie, it had taken her a few weeks of dating before she trusted him enough to sleep with him. Inca laughed softly to herself now, wondering how many other 28-year-olds could boast of only ever having one partner. She clicked off the bathroom light and got into bed, thinking about what Ollie had told her. Inca wondered if she herself would ever find anyone else and realized that if she didn't, it wouldn't bother her. She was happy enough alone. Ollie Rosenbaum made his way to the small town's police department. His night shift was just starting, and he flicked through a couple of messages before settling down to some paperwork. It was a half hour before one of his deputies, Fred, stuck his head in the door. Boss? We just got a call. A body's been found down near the reservoir. Looks like a homicide. Everyone was talking in hushed tones as Inca arrived at work the next morning, clumping down the stairs, still half asleep. She definitely wasn't a morning person. Hey y'all, she said sleepily to Scarlett and Tish, the other teenager she employed. Tish had bright red hair and wore full makeup even at this time of morning. They grunted in greeting, then went back to their conversation. Inca switched the coffee machine on and went to open the front door. You two thinking of doing any work today, she said pointedly. Scarlet, her usual grin missing, turned to her. Have you heard? About what? There was a body found up near the reservoir last night. A young woman. She was stabbed to death. Inca felt sick. Gosh, that's horrific. How did you hear? On the news, national as well as local. Really brutal, too. Poor woman. As if on cue, Ollie pushed into the teahouse, followed by a small dark woman. He greeted them and introduced her. This is Molly Welsh, she's been collecting evidence at the scene. He gave Inca a meaningful look, and she realized that this was his new girlfriend, Molly. She smiled at the newcomer, noticing how different she and Molly were. Molly was even tinier than Inca and effortlessly chic, almost French in her way of dress. She had short cropped dark hair, huge brown eyes, and a cute face. She smiled back at the Inca with genuine friendliness. Inca got them both coffee and sat down with them. Ollie shook his head. It's bad inks. Poor kid was only young, late teens or early twenties. She was stabbed repeatedly. Inca grimaced. Who would do that? I can't remember the last time we had a murder around here. 1976, Ollie said before either of us was born. That's how rare it is. Any leads? None. Inca smiled at Molly and changed the subject. So, I hear you're going to be wined and dined at Levi and Jim's. Molly nodded. I've heard great things. You heard right. Levi is a genius chef, and what Jim doesn't know about wine isn't worth knowing. They're a couple, right? Right. However, don't be surprised when you see them, you would never know they were a couple unless you knew them. Always busting each other's balls like they're brothers. That's what best friends are for, Ollie said, winking at Inca. Inca rolled her eyes and got up. I'll leave you two alone. Gotta get back to it. It was really good to meet you, Molly. You too. It was only later, when Inca skipped out to go to the farmer's market, that a sense of loneliness crept over her. She might be having trouble getting over the breakup of the relationship, but she knew Ollie had been right to end it. Still, she wondered if her heart would ever unfreeze, the idea of that shocked her. Had she even given her all to Ollie? Was that the reason why he had ended it? She couldn't tell. Loading her groceries into her car, she was startled by the squeal of tires as a Porsche screeched into the parking spot beside her. The driver got out, he was tall with wild dark curls and when he turned towards her she could see his intense green eyes. 
He stopped when he saw her, and Inca flushed at his scrutiny. His eyes seemed to bore right into hers, searching, questioning. Inca got flustered, and one of her bags slipped out of her hands, spilling fruit across the parking lot. She scrambled to retrieve it, and she sensed him walking towards her. He crouched down and helped her without saying a word. As he handed her an orange, his fingers brushed hers, and she felt a jolt of electricity. She looked up to see him staring at her. A furious pulse began to beat between her legs, and she couldn't look away. He was unsmiling but his face wasn't unfriendly, just entirely focused on her. Inca managed to find her voice. Thank you. They both stood at the same time. He dwarfed her petite frame, and Inca suddenly felt both utterly vulnerable and supremely turned on. He gave a curt nod then, in a motion so quick she hardly registered it, brushed the back of his finger down her cheek. It left her skin burning, but he turned away and stalked off, leaving Inca open mouthed behind him. She got into the car and sat, blinking. What the hell was that? She glanced at her burning face in the mirror, half expecting there to be a scorch mark where he had touched her. There wasn't, of course, but her entire face was bright red. She sucked in a deep breath. Jeez. On her drive back to the tea house, she suddenly remembered where she had seen him. He was one of the winter twins. She suddenly wished she'd paid more attention to the article Scarlet had pointed out. So, they must have completed the Fletcher mansion and moved in. There hadn't been as much fanfare as she would have expected, given Scarlet's excitement but maybe they were just a private family. She got her answer when she returned to the Sakura. Gasping from the cold air that whipped around her, she stumbled into the back room of the tea house and dumped the bags of groceries on the floor. Tugging her coat off, she could hear Scarlet's infectious laugh, Nancy's soft chuckle, and another voice, masculine, deeper, accented. Inca felt a thrill go through her as she walked into the tea house's main room and saw him there. Dark curls now brushed into a neat style, intense green eyes, but now he wore a friendly smile. He looked up as Inca came into the room, and his smile widened. She felt her face burn. Hello again, she said, but his eyebrows shot up. I'm sorry? Gosh, that voice. Deep, mellifluous, sensual as hell. Inca blinked. We just met at the farmer's market. He smiled. I very much wish we had but I think that may have been my brother. Now that she saw him, yeah, he was wearing entirely different clothes, and instead of being combed neatly, she realized this man's hair was shorter. Apart from that, there was absolutely no telling them apart. She smiled. I'm sorry, my mistake. He stuck his hand out. Tommaso Winter. Inca Sardi. His green eyes sparkled. Unusual name. She grinned. Indian. My birth mother was Indian. She had no idea why she was telling him that, and gave an embarrassed cough. Scarlet and Nancy were watching the interaction, Scarlet grinning openly. Inca surreptitiously kicked her friend. Well, I hope my mom and this reprobate were making you feel at home. I understand you've bought the Fletcher mansion? Now, she sounded like she was interviewing him. Gosh, woman, are you really going to fall apart at the sight of a handsome face? But handsome didn't really cover it with the winter twins, she decided. They were glorious. Tommaso Winter smiled at her, and she noticed how his eyes crinkled at the corners, his cheeks lifted and his beautifully shaped mouth curved. Gosh, what is wrong with you? First his brother and now him. Inca was sure her face was burning. We have. My brother and I decided we needed to be in the States for the time being. I would have thought high flyers like the Winters would be more New York-based. This was Nancy, who was peering over her glasses at Tommaso. Inca groaned internally. Was Nancy about to go into one of her rants about the uber-rich? Tommaso grinned at her. Neither Raph nor myself are New York people. And besides, Seattle is at the forefront of business, Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks, Boeing. It made sense. Nancy seemed satisfied with this. She gave Inca a slight nod, this one's okay. Inca suppressed a smile. Mr. Winter. Tommaso, please. Tommaso. The name felt like a caress in her mouth. Have you had time to get to know the town? 
He shook his head. I was hoping to find a guide. His eyes twinkled at her, and Inca felt her stomach flutter. Desire. Gosh. Scarlet nudged her. Inca's an excellent tour guide, she said brightly. And she's a total geek. She'll tell you all about the lovely but dull little town we call Willowbrook. Tommaso snorted with laughter. Well in that case, if you're offering, I'd like that. His eyes settled on the Incas, in a way that made her feel like the only woman in the world. Of course, she said, swallowing her shyness. Just let me know when you have some free time. Tommaso considered. Is tomorrow too soon? Inca didn't look at Nancy or Scarlet. Not at all, it's my day off. Say 10 a.m. He smiled and took her hand, kissing the back of it. Perfect. I'll see you then. Thank you ladies for your warm welcome. I have a feeling this place will be something of a haunt for me. When he'd gone, Inca looked almost open-mouthed at her friends. What the hell just happened? Scarlet and Nancy were both giggling like schoolgirls. I think you have yourself a date. Nancy looked beside herself with glee. With a billionaire. Scarlet goggled at her and Inca rolled her eyes. It's not a date, I'm being a good neighbor. Good naked neighbor. Scarlet? Yes? Get back to work before I fire you. Knox Westerwick walked the half mile or so from the harbor to the police department. The station was as quiet as he'd found it yesterday. A couple of faxes sat on the machine, and he glanced at them. Warnings about Lyme disease and a flyer for a town committee meeting. He checked the answering machine. No blinking red light. Knox wandered around the building. The police department took up no more than four rooms in the big stone-built structure. A glance at the bell pad indicated the other offices were let to a surveyor and an insurance company. He wandered to the big window overlooking the back of the office to see the back of a firehouse to one side and apartments to the other. He could see down to the water in the distance, glittering green against an azure sky. Knox had to be honest with himself. He was bored, bone-crushingly bored. Even scraping around, offering to speak to school kids about road safety or whatever small-town cops talk to kids about these days, was a no-go. Ollie had done all that recently, so Knox accepted the grateful apologies of the principal and gave up. Knox glanced at the clock and wondered when Ollie would make an appearance. He went over to the filing cabinet, searching for any old case he could follow up on. Nothing. He slipped the files back into the cabinet and sat back in his chair, toying with the idea of sneaking over to the tea house to flirt with Inca and Scarlet. Instead, he picked up the phone to check in with Ollie. Hey boss. Missing me already? Hey Knox. Man. Can you get whoever you can together and come out to the reservoir? There was the briefest pause, and in that moment Knox knew something was terribly wrong. What is it? Ollie's voice was defeated and tired. We found another one. Inca glanced over to the man in the passenger seat. As they had driven from Main Street, Inca had kept up a commentary, a practiced overview of the town's McNuggets, the Twin Harbor Lighthouses, Gayer Lake and its adjoining golf resort, the West Coast Road with its views of the Cascades. Tommaso Winter was good company. He was funny and erudite. But he made her nervous. He would listen to her talk intently, his gaze occasionally dropping to her mouth, which made her feel both sensual and vulnerable. Every inch of her skin was tingling from his presence. He looked out of the window, seeing now the dense greenery, Douglas firs, and trails leading off into the forest. Where are we now? Inca grinned. The cunningly titled Forest Road. Top of the town. Around this bend. He swung the car around a sharp bend, the right side of the road dropping down a steep cliff to the sea. A huge, stately building came into view is the main source of income for our little place. Hunter's Ridge Private School. Massive fees board rich kids. Hey, that's beautiful. He pointed out of the window. They were traveling back down the town now, along the coast road. Tommaso was looking at an outcrop of rocks just off the coast, rising out of the dark water. Desolation rocks. 
just off Desolation Point, close to the Desolation Point Lighthouse, just in case you didn't get the name the first time. So, Desolation was it? And they both laughed. You got it. Look, I'm going to find somewhere to park, and we can hike into the forest if you're interested. Tommaso smiled that devastating smile at her. Love too. Inca and Tommaso trekked the trail that led through the center of the town. She took him to the town's unusual stave church. He seemed interested when she told him about the church's history, how a Scandinavian immigrant had built it because he missed his homeland so badly he wanted something uniquely Norwegian in this little piece of America. Inca pointed out how the structure's strange, quirky architecture was locked together by careful dovetailing wedges and post and lintel construction. When we were kids, Inca told him, we were convinced that the lack of glue or nails meant it would come alive at night and turn into a transformer. She grinned at Tommaso's raised eyebrows. Hey, we were kids. We were pretty stupid. We. Me, my ex Ollie, and his sister Luna. You grew up together. They moved to the town when I was 12. Before that, I was pretty much alone. She regretted her last words. She felt his questioning gaze, but to her relief, he didn't ask anything further. They walked on for a few minutes in silence along Cemetery Trail, through the old growth forest, the nursery trees springing from the decay of the fallen. At the gates of the cemetery, which stood in the center of the town, Tommaso stopped. You know what I'm wondering? What's that? We've been walking a while now, and I have yet to see any willow trees. For a town named Willowbrook, I would have expected there to be more. So far I've seen one, the one in the middle of Main Street. Inca grinned. And you know what? That's it. That's your one. The founder of the town didn't get far into the town before naming it. You're kidding. Nope. Tommaso considered this. Well, I guess this town has another unique beauty then. His eyes met hers and she felt her face burn. Tommaso smiled, moving closer, and when he leaned him, the feel of his lips on hers sent her heart pounding. His mouth sought hers and she leaned into the kiss, feeling his arms snake around her. They were breathless when they finally broke apart. I'm sorry, he said in a low voice, leaning his forehead against hers. I just could not wait any longer. Inca, dazed, shook her head. It's okay, but we barely know each other. I wanted you as soon as I saw you yesterday. Gosh, the thrill his words sent through her. Inca, why don't we do this the wrong way around? Just go with it. She was trembling so much that she could barely answer him. Tommaso lifted her into his arms. Bella, tell me to stop at any time and I will stop. But she didn't tell him to stop. Feeling as if she were in a dream, she let him lead her back to the car, him sliding into the driving seat this time, and then he drove them to his home. The Fletcher mansion had been empty for many years, and Inca had always wondered what it was like inside, but at that moment, she couldn't focus on anything but Tommaso Winter. Her senses had fled, who was this man? And why was she going along with it? All she knew right then was that if he wasn't inside her soon, she might die of longing. Tommaso held her hand as they walked to his bedroom, and as he closed the door behind them, Inca realized what a risk she was taking. No one knew she was here. All worries fled when Tommaso kissed her again, pushing her overcoat from her shoulders and running his large hands down her curves. Bellissima. His low, deep voice, with that Italian accent, sent vibrations of pure pleasure through her. With a growl, he tumbled her onto the bed and his mouth was on her then. What am I doing? What the hell am I doing? But she didn't stop him. Tommaso. He grinned, standing to quickly take his clothes off. He had a firm body, elegantly shaped, masculine, a small smattering of hair on his chest. The feel of his skin next to hers was intoxicating, and Inca couldn't tear her eyes from his clear green gaze. Tommaso teased her. Inca had never experienced this intensity before, it was all-consuming. His prowess obvious, his focus on her absolute. Tommaso buried his face in her neck. He collapsed on top of her, his mouth seeking hers, whispering her name over and over. Inca closed her eyes, reveling in the feeling of him holding her. 
Was this what she had been missing all these years? Sensuality, desire with the thrill of the danger. Who was this man? When she opened her eyes, he was watching her. His mouth hitched up in a smile. You are beautiful, Inca. So beautiful. His fingertips traced a line down her body, to her belly. She gave him a shy grin. I have never done something like this before. Just go with it. He was so confident, and his hand, tracing a pattern on her belly, was making her crazy. Inca touched his face. I know you said we should do this the wrong way around. I think we achieved that. He kissed her. Inca, the moment you walked into that tea house yesterday, I wanted you. But I suppose you have the same effect on most men. Inca felt uncomfortable then. Honestly, Tomaso, I hadn't thought about it. As I said, this isn't what I would normally do. But you, sir, are something else. And I thought, what the hell? Tomaso grinned and moved on top of her. You're the perfect tour guide, he murmured, and I hope much more than that. Inca smiled as he gently wound her legs around his waist. As he teased her, she sighed happily. I don't expect anything from you, Tomaso, but, oh. Tomaso grinned wickedly. I'm going to make you mine all night long, Principessa, in every way you'll allow. Say my name, Inca. Tomaso. Inca woke cold and shivering. The light in the room was blue, and she could tell it was very early morning. The bed beside her was empty, and the sheet that had been wrapped around her was now down at her hips. She sat up, blinked, and shook her head. What the hell had she been thinking? Last night had been the most pleasurable, sensual time of her life, but in the cold light of day. She got up and went into the bathroom. There was a toothbrush and a basket of toiletries left out on the side for her, and she smiled. She showered quickly and got dressed, shoving yesterday's underwear into her pocket. Feeling incongruous and shy, she padded through the large mansion, only now just noticing how beautifully it was decorated. The winter's aesthetic was obviously minimalism and clean lines. Navy, gray, and a monochromatic color scheme made her shiver a little. It was the opposite of her messy, cozy, colorful apartment. She found the kitchen and saw him at the stove, flipping pancakes. Grinning, she walked up to him and slid her arms around his waist. Good morning, Mr. Winter. She jumped back as he dropped the pan and spun around. Oh shoot. Inca stepped back, horrified. Raffaello Winter glowered at her. Gosh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were Tommaso. She felt the heat rush up her body and suddenly she felt like a slime ball. The man in front of her was as physically divine as his twin, but somehow, danger radiated from every pore. His eyes were hooded, dark with menace and anger. Inca felt a frisson of fear. Hey. Both of them turned to see Tommaso watching them, a strange smile on his face. Inca felt a wave of humiliation. I'm sorry. I mistook your brother for you. Tommaso grinned. Again. Inca flushed, but Tommaso wrapped his arms around her. Don't worry, Inca, it's no big thing. Is it Raf? Raffaello said nothing, just stared at his brother, an unreadable expression on his handsome face. Tommaso smirked. I should officially introduce you. Inca Sardi, my brother Raffaello. Inca owns the Sakura Tea House in town. Inca held a trembling hand out to Raffaello. For a horrible moment, she thought he was going to ignore it, but then he took it and nodded. Good to meet you. His accent was a lot thicker than his brother's, his voice deeper and softer. Inca was surprised. Was his glowering demeanor actually shyness? She dismissed the idea the next moment when Raffaello stalked out of the room. Tommaso laughed softly. My brother isn't the most social of people. He kissed Inca's forehead. You are very different, Inca said, and Tommaso nodded. People are always surprised at that, but yes we are. Now can I make you some breakfast? After breakfast, Inca told him she had to go home. Tommaso walked her to her car. Can I see you again? Inca hesitated. He was undoubtedly gorgeous and an incredible partner, but the scene this morning with Raffaello had given her pause. She smiled at him. 
Tommaso. I like you, and last night was mind-blowing. But I don't know if I'm really suited to the whole wrong way around thing. Maybe we should just get to know each other as friends, and then see where it goes. Tommaso looked vaguely disappointed, but took the rejection with a good heart. Whatever you think is best, but don't expect me to stop trying. He gave her a wicked grin, which made her burst out laughing. Mr. Winter, I knew you were trouble. Tommaso kissed her before she got into her car, and when she drove away, she saw him watching her. Inca tried to park the car out of the way and sneak up to her apartment, but she failed miserably. Scarlet was waiting for her in the back hallway between the stairs and the tea room. Where the hell have you been? Inca gave a shocked laugh. Okay, Mom, calm down. She dumped her bag on a chair and took off her coat. Scarlet narrowed her eyes at her. You were wearing those clothes yesterday, oh my gosh. You slept with Tommaso Winter. SSH, Inca, frowned at her friend. The door to the tea house's main room was open, and Inca glanced nervously around it to see if anyone had heard. Scarlet scowled at her. Do you know how worried we were? Inca rolled her eyes. Dude, I'm 28 years old. I don't need your permission to stay over at a billionaire's place. She grinned at Scarlet, but her friend shook her head. No, I know. It's not that. Inks, didn't you hear about the new murder? Inca stopped. What? Scarlet nodded. Two women now. Ollie was called to the first up at the reservoir. Then, while they were there, they found the other one. Gosh, that's horrible. Realization dawned. Oh gosh. I am sorry, Scarlet. I honestly didn't know, or I would have called. Scarlet sighed. As long as you're okay. I am, truly. Scarlet grinned. So. Details, please. Yeah, Inca said dryly. Because that's what's going to happen now. Spoil sport. Nancy stuck her head around the door. Ah, daughter mine. Glad to see you're not dead. Any chance you two can do some work today? Tommaso had been waiting for Raffaello to say something all day. After meeting Inca, his brother disappeared into the depths of the mansion to work, and Tommaso couldn't see him. Now though, as Tommaso sat chatting with Debbie, their new chef, Raffaello, made an appearance in the large kitchen. Good evening. Tommaso smiled at his brother, and Debbie nodded to him. She was a middle-aged woman, no-nonsense, and very discreet. Her food, the twins had discovered in a very short time, was out of this world. I was just trying to persuade Debbie to let me open a restaurant for her. It's a crime her food is hidden away from the world. Debbie laughed. Your brother is very generous, but he exaggerates. Raffaello half smiled at her. About some things, but not this. Tommaso, may I speak with you outside for a moment? We won't be long, Debbie, I promise. Tommaso followed his brother outside. The night was cold and cloudy, threatening snow. Raffaello lit a cigarette and studied his brother. What the hell were you doing with that girl? Tommaso hid a grin. Debbie? You know damn well who I mean. Oh, Inca. I would have thought it was obvious. Raffaello shook his head in disgust. That's not why we came here, Tommaso. We said no complications. No situations that could compromise. What? Tommaso was irritated now. I met a beautiful woman, I was attracted to her, I slept with her. I hope to do it again. Many, many times. What's wrong with that? Raffaello sighed. Just don't. Get too involved. You know we can't. Tommaso was silent. Finally, he shook his head. I can't promise anything. Inca's a very sweet woman and beautiful. I know you noticed that. Raffaello hesitated, then nodded. Heartbreakingly beautiful. Which concerns me, Tommaso. Women like that. What? What, brother? Women like that are what? But Raffaello didn't answer him. Ollie Rosenbaum dumped his paperwork on the desk and clicked off the light. He'd been working for 48 hours straight with the homicide team from the city, and he was drained. 
The horror of finding the two murdered women had finally hit him, and he wanted to go home and forget their faces. At home, he threw back a scotch and poured another, knowing it probably wasn't the best idea, but to hell with it. Molly was in the city working on the same case, and Ollie toyed with the idea of calling Inca and talking to her, but he talked himself out of it. He couldn't keep dumping on her, after all, he'd been the one to finish it. Something else stopped him. Both the women who had been killed were of Asian descent, and he kept seeing Inca's face when he thought about them. Willowbrook had only ever had one murder before, long before his time, but this was a whole new level of terrifying. He hadn't recognized either of the women, which meant their killer had brought them here to kill and dump them. That was way too close for Ollie's liking. Don't be ridiculous, he thought. You don't even know if their ancestry had anything to do with it. But he couldn't stop imagining the killer seeing Inca and deciding she would be next on his list. No, stop it. It wasn't as if he had any right to be her protector. You're the police chief, you have every right. Damn it. He picked up the phone and called her. She answered after the second ring. Hey. Hey, Inks, you busy? There was a hesitation. I was going to have an early night. Can it wait? Ollie couldn't help but feel stung. Yeah, sure. You okay? I'm fine, why? Doesn't matter. Look, I'll see you soon. Good night. He ended the call and hissed out his frustration. Shit. He really had to get used to this idea of not being with Inca anymore. You don't have the same rights now, buddy. I know, I know, he said to himself and decided to go to bed. He fell asleep quickly, but was haunted by visions of Inca lying dead on the banks of the reservoir. A week passed before Inca saw Tommaso again, although he called her every day, and they talked for hours. The tea room had been busy, Christmas season was coming up, and the weather outside had turned to snow. Thick snowdrifts piled up at the sides of the roads. Inca was shoveling the sidewalk clear and sprinkling kitty litter down when she heard a car horn. She looked up to see Tommaso in his Mercedes, pulling up to the curb. She grinned and shook her head. Mr. Winter, roof down? In this weather? Tommaso leaped out of the car not giving a hoot about the slippery ice underfoot. I like to live dangerously. Hello again. She liked that he kissed her cheek and not her mouth. There was something respectful about the embrace. She nodded towards the tea room. Come in. I'll make you something hot. Tommaso grinned and Inca blushed, swatting him. You know what I mean. They were still laughing when they walked into the tea house, and they chatted easily. Tommaso looked around. Busy today. Has been for a week or two. She lowered her voice. We're getting a lot of homicide cops and journalists because of the murders. Tommaso nodded. Did you know the victims? Inca shook her head. No. They weren't from around here. The door opened with a swirl of cold air, and a young woman with black hair staggered in. Inca smiled at her. Hey, lunatic, long time no see. Luna Rosenbaum shook the excess snow off her coat, then looked down at the mess she had made. Sorry, Inks. Inca laughed. Don't worry about it. She went to hug her friend. Come and meet Tommaso. Inca introduced Luna, and she studied the Italian carefully. So, you're the new billionaire in town? Tommaso choked on his coffee. You could say that. One of them, anyway. Oh, that's right. She took the coffee the Inca offered her. Thanks, Inks. Have you met the brother? Inca colored and Tommaso grinned. I'll say she has. Luna looked between them both, seemingly to make up her mind about something. She gave Inca a strange look that Inca couldn't decipher. Well, anyway, I just came to say hi before I went to Ollie's. I assume he's snowed under, ha ha, with this murder case. I'll catch up with you later, Inca. Inca watched her go, a frown on her face. That was weird. Tommaso sipped his tea. Are you okay? Inca shook herself. Yes, sure. Sorry, it's just, well, I used to be with Ollie, as it were. 
Maybe Luna's not dealing. She stopped and shrugged. Sorry, it's nothing. Tomaso reached out and took her hand. So, I was wondering if I could take you to dinner one night this week. Inca smiled. I would like that, but can I just say? I have a rule, Dutch, all the way. So, if you were planning on something billionaire style, she grinned at him. Think again. Plus, I would have nothing to wear at one of those places. Tommaso rolled his eyes. Fine. How about your friend's place? Inca clinked her coffee mug against his. Deal. When he'd gone, she marveled at how quickly they had become friends. Even if they hadn't had that wonderful night together, she felt like she had known Tommaso Winter her whole life. Was it her imagination? Did that instant connection come from her need for love? Gosh, she hoped not. She hated to think of herself as a needy woman, hell, she wasn't a needy woman. However, Ollie had gently shifted her expectations of what men wanted. She was still deep in thought when Nancy came in, and she asked her adoptive mother if she thought she was just looking for an Ollie replacement. Nancy thought about it. I don't think so, Inca. You've never been someone who needs a man at all times. Maybe it's just that you and this winter boy clicked in a way that you haven't experienced. Inca reddened slightly and Nancy laughed. Inca, I'm not talking about intercourse and it's okay. You know, I'm not dead below the waist just because I'm over 50. He's a very handsome young man. Just remember, you might want him but you don't need him. You are your own person. Inca smiled at her gratefully. Hey, anyone serving? Ollie grinned at her as she went to greet him, and as she poured some hot tea for him, she studied him. You look tired. He gave a small laugh. Got time to talk now? But his words were without rancor, and she sighed. Ollie, for you, of course. Just I can't be the person you call last thing at night anymore, you know? For both of us, we need to take a step back. Yeah, I know. Listen, Luna says you have a new friend, one of the winters? Inca looked surprised. Haven't you met them yet? Ollie shook his head. I don't know whether this sounds bad, but for once, the department has been busy. I wish it wasn't for the reason it was. Me neither. Any progress? Inca saw Nancy join them, listening to what Ollie was saying. We've identified one of the women. Kristen Chu, a lawyer from Seattle. Her family is pretty broken up. I would think. How did she die? Ollie hesitated. Stabbed. Multiple times. Poor kid. Inca looked sick. Gosh. Nancy shook her head and Ollie looked at her. The other woman was Asian, too. Nancy and Ollie shared a look and Inca sighed. Just say it. Wouldn't hurt to be extra vigilant. I thought serial killers were only called that after at least five victims. Don't be a smug. Nancy gave her daughter's butt a swat. Just be careful. Inca rolled her eyes. Okay, okay. Ollie smiled at her. So, when are you going to introduce me to your new boyfriend? Not boyfriend. Friend. But Inca felt relief that Ollie seemed to be okay with it. Add anyway, I wanted to talk to you about Luna. Is she okay? She was a bit off earlier, N. Ollie looked uncomfortable. She's having trouble with us splitting. You know how unstable she feels all the time. Gotcha. Tell her I miss her, will you? We need to have some girly nights in. Ollie nodded. I will. Thanks, Inks. Look, all joking aside, you'll make this old man happy if you make sure your deadbolt is on at night, okay? Promise. Inca remembered his words that night, and when she went up to her apartment that night, she shot the deadbolt across and double-locked it. Weary, she took a long bath, then heated up some leftovers in the microwave and sat in front of the television. Outside the snow was piling up again, and she gave an involuntary shiver as she watched the snow fall silently over her little hometown. Willowbrook was the only town stuck out on a tiny peninsula on the Washington coastline. The one road out of town would sometimes get blocked with snow during winter, and then the town would become like an island. 
Inca had always loved the place since Nancy and Tyler had adopted her and brought her home from the children's home in Seattle. She had never questioned that their love for her was as strong as hers for them, and she had never shown any interest in finding out her family history. Lately, though, feeling lonely was becoming a habit, and she'd wondered if she should push Nancy harder for information. Maybe I'll ask Tyler, she thought, grinning to herself. Tyler was softer than Nancy. Younger by ten years than his seventy-year-old wife, Tyler, a tall African-American with a slender figure and a kind face, doted on his girls. As far as Inca was concerned, he was her father and nothing would change that. Her cell phone buzzed, and she picked it up without looking at the caller ID. Hello. Nothing. Inca frowned. Whoever this is, this is a bad line, I can't hear you. Hello. Nothing. She shut off her phone and forgot about it. She switched off the TV and the small lamp and sat in the darkness, watching the snowfall. Her attention was caught by a movement down the street. A figure stood under the street lamp. He looked up as if sensing her scrutiny, and their eyes met. Inca felt a thrill go through her, fear or desire she couldn't tell. Raffaello Winter stared up at her, his expression unreadable. The next day, she was still thinking about him. It was her day off, and as she did her chores, she wondered what he had been thinking of standing outside her apartment like that. Weird. Her phone rang again, and this time, it was her realtor, Mindy. The apartment Inca lived in was leased from the owner of the building, but had offered Inca first refusal on it when he decided to sell. She'd scraped together the deposit and had put her offer in, and now she knew Mindy was calling her to finalize the details. Hey Mindy. What's going on? Inca sat on a kitchen chair, pulling her knees up to her chest. She heard Mindy draw in a deep breath. Inca honey, I've got bad news. The thing is, Inca heard her sigh, the apartment's gone. It's been sold. For a moment, Inca didn't process what the realtor had said. Then her heart thudded, heavy with dismay. It can't have. I mean, I thought the offer I made was a lock. It was. It was, sweetheart. I'm sorry, but the owner just called me. They were called late last night by a private buyer who gave them a crazy offer. Inca sat upright in the chair. I'll match it. Call them. Tell them I'll match it. I want this apartment. There was a silence. Honey. Mindy hesitated. You can't. You can't match it. The buyers offered three times the market price. Inca was speechless. Her shoulders slumped, and at that moment, she realized how much she had been relying on getting the apartment to kick-start everything and move forward. She felt suddenly tearful. Hun? You okay? Mindy sounded concerned. How did they know who to call? She heard Mindy give an annoyed hiss. Jeb? Don't worry. I've nailed his butt to the wall. He knows better than to give out that information. Look, I'm going to email you over some other prospects, we'll find you something. Inca drew in a deep breath. Yes. Yes, of course. I'm sorry. I'm just disappointed, is all. She jumped slightly as the doorbell rang. Look, Mindy, thanks, I've got to go. She looked around the apartment, her home, and felt tears threatening. This was her home, her space. She couldn't imagine living anywhere else. She grabbed her jacket and headed out of the door. Inca knocked once on the back door of her parents' home, then let herself in. Tyler, standing in his apron flipping pancakes and frying eggs, smiled at her and bent to kiss her cheek in greeting. Hey, bubs. Hey, popsicle. She heaved herself onto one of the stools. How are things? Good. Nancy's gone to the city, so I thought we'd have a little father-daughter chat. He handed her a plate of food. She grinned her thanks. That always sounds ominous when you say that. Honestly, I didn't break my curfew, Pa. She grinned, her mouth full of food, and he laughed, tapping her on the head with a spoon. Your mother tells me there's a new man in your life. Inca rolled her eyes. Not really. Just a new friend. I swear to God, you and Nancy are the biggest gossip. Every adjective you can think of. 
This is yummy, by the way. Tyler sat down with a plate of his own and studied her face. Thank you. Is it a good thing? Inca grinned. Yes. You've always been a great cook. Tyler didn't smile. I'm serious. I worry, Bubba, especially after all that business with Oliver. Inca smiled. Tyler had never called Ali Ali, not once. Inca thought about it for a long moment. I think so. I mean, I'm just getting to know Tommaso. He's not my boyfriend or anything, we're just friends. Tyler put his head on one side, his expression kind. So no romance then? Inca acquiesced with a small laugh. Possibly. I really don't know. But Pops, that's not something I want to discuss with you, no offense. They ate in silence for a few minutes, then Inca remembered. I got some bad news before, I didn't tell you, the apartment was sold out from under me. So, now I have to start looking all over again. Tyler was taken aback. What? Yep. Apparently, someone offered three times the asking price late last night. Can you believe it? She sighed and shook her head. I didn't actually realize how much it bothers me. I had it all planned, how I'd redecorate and fit all my stuff in. It's like I had it all planned in my head and now, damn. It's frustrating, is all. Ollie had tried not to think about the murders, but couldn't let it go. When he'd returned to the station, he flicked on the TV and watched the news on Como. King County Police have now confirmed that the second body found in Willowbrook early Monday morning was that of 25-year-old Kumiko Yu. Miss Yu left her job at a convenience store just after 11 p.m. last night, but failed to return home. Police found her body at Willowbrook Reservoir when they were called to the discovery of the body of Kristen Chu around 6 a.m. that morning. Early reports indicate that both victims had been stabbed repeatedly. Seattle Homicide Police will not confirm at this point whether the murders are related to the spate of other murders of Asian American women over the last year across the country. Ollie sat up and switched his computer on. Other Asian American victims? He started a nationwide search. Victim description, female brown hair Asian. Was that too broad? Ollie wondered. He looked over to the Sakura and decided it wasn't. He set the search going and got up to grab some coffee from the pot. He looked out of the window and saw Luna talking to Inca in the tea house. Ollie gazed at Inca, her dark hair, almond-shaped eyes, gorgeous honeyed skin, and he couldn't help imagining the body at the reservoir being hers, cut up, brutalized. He'd ask her not to go out alone. Eviscerated, bled out, slaughtered. Bile rose in the back of his throat, and he looked away quickly, pushing the image out of his mind. He rubbed his eyes as if scrubbing the image from his mind, sat back in his chair, and looked for something to distract him. He'd already dealt with the report from a robbery at the golf course. He picked a drawer at random and pulled a handful of files from the cabinet. Fixing himself some instant coffee with a wistful look across to the tea house, he sat down to read. Hunter Leeds, the town's mechanic, limped into the tea house just after lunch, carrying a large, expensive box. Inca greeted him, turning to pour his usual brew. Hunter, an old school friend of Ollie's, didn't look happy. Got a delivery for you, Inca. He put the box on the counter. Inca gaped at him. What is it? Hunter shrugged, obviously put out. Scarlet ran her fingers over the name on the box. Expensive. She sounded impressed. Winter asked me to bring it to you. Hunter's voice cracked with tension. Inca was astonished. Why didn't he bring it himself? Hunter shrugged. Beside Inca, Scarlet shifted, impatient. Open it, open it. Inca lifted the top of the box. Tissue paper. She pulled it apart and pulled the dress out. It was gorgeous, pale pink, decorated with tiny beads. Wow. Scarlet was impressed. Well, he's just gone up in my estimation. She peeked inside. Even got your size right. That is going to look amazing next to your skin. Inca was frowning. Okay, this is weird. Why on earth would he buy me a dress? Kind of personal, don't you think? 
and why the hell wouldn't he bring it to me himself, instead of getting Hunter to do it? Scarlet shrugged. Perhaps he's just marking his territory. She stuck her tongue out at her boss, but Inca was frowning. Flowers would have been enough. If anything. Scarlet could see she was disconcerted. Hey look. The guy's a billionaire. Could you imagine the type of women he's used to? He's probably just doing what he thinks you'd expect. You have to admit that. Inca nodded. Okay, yes, but I thought... I thought he knew me well enough to know I'm not like them. Scarlet shook her head. Give him a break. Inca ran her hand over the dress. I don't know what to do about this. It's too much. But I don't want to offend him. Wear it. Scarlet shrugged. What harm can it do? Hunter stood silent, watching the two women. The phone rang and Scarlet stepped away to answer it. Inca smiled at him. Hunter, you look worried. It's okay, it's just a dress. Hunter shook his head. You just be careful around him. I don't want you getting hurt or anything. She leaned over and grabbed his hand, squeezing it. Hunter, why would Tomasa Winter want to hurt me? I don't trust him. Inca gave a frustrated laugh. You don't even know him. I saw him watching you. You've seen Tomasa watching me? A little thrill of pleasure ran through her, and she tried not to smile. He watches you. He said things. What things, Hunter? Hunter flushed and shifted in his chair. He didn't look her in the eye. I told him to leave you alone. He says he could have you if he wanted you. Inca didn't know what to say. I'm sure you're wrong, Hunter. He doesn't mean any harm. He's just new in town, getting to know everyone. You are very sweet to worry about me, but it's okay. Later, she asked Scarlet if she minded covering for her. Inca picked up the box. Scarlet looked disappointed. You're taking it back to him, aren't you? Inca nodded. It's too much, too soon. Be careful on that road. More snow is on its way in. Inca steered her car carefully along the steep hill leading to the Fletcher, no, the Winter Mansion now she grinned to herself. How very apartment. She cursed as her car's back wheel slid out from beneath her, and she wrestled the wheel until she straightened up, heart thumping. She pulled up in front of the big house and, box in hand, carefully climbed the icy stairs. She rang the doorbell and waited, shivering. The door was yanked open, and the familiar man stepped out, staring at her. For a moment, she thought it might be Raffaello, but then his smile stretched across his face and she relaxed. Inca. Gosh, come in. I'm sorry, you just took me by surprise. He guided her inside and took her coat. As you surprised me, Inca said gently, trying not to be distracted by the way his green eyes locked onto hers, or the soft way his fingers brushed the inside of her arm as he took her coat. Tommaso smiled at her, leaning in to brush his lips against hers. Didn't it fit? I had to guess your size. It's not that. It's just too much. Tommaso stepped back to look at her. It wasn't a thank you for sleeping with me gift, if that's what you think. Inca laughed. I know that. You are very generous, but I can't accept it. Tommaso considered for a moment. Fair enough. Look, now that you're here, you must stay for dinner. The weather's getting bad. Raf and I were in the kitchen, come meet him properly. Inca felt her stomach churn with nerves as they walked hand in hand to the kitchen. Tommaso introduced her to Debbie. They already knew each other vaguely, and so the conversation was easy. Then Raffaello made an appearance. Inca's chest tightened when she saw him, and all she could think of was seeing him on the street, gazing up at her apartment. He seemed to notice her reticence when she greeted him. You're well. She nodded and wondered why his accent was so much thicker than Tommaso's. During dinner, which was a mouth-watering lobster bisque followed by lamb so tender it fell off the bone, Tommaso led the conversation, but Inca found that Raffaello had thawed a little. Ironic, she thought, glancing out of the window. Outside, the weather had worsened, and now all she could see was a whiteout. Raffaello noticed her glance. 
Did you drive here tonight, Miss Sardi? Inca suppressed a smile. So formal. Inca, please, and yes, I'm afraid I did. He nodded and looked at Tommaso. Our guest must stay the night, I think. I was hoping she would, Tommaso said with a grin, but Inca felt awkward then. Tommaso noticed. Because of the weather, of course. Of course. After dinner, they moved to the living room, where Raffaello poured them all large drinks. Inca took the glass of scotch, not wanting to spoil the atmosphere by telling them she didn't drink much. She felt the effects an hour later, and for the first time, she saw Raffaello smile. I think the scotch has taken effect. She half smiled. I think it has. Raffaello drained his glass. I'll give you two some privacy. Good night, Inca Tommaso. Good night, Raffaello. His name felt foreign and exotic in her mouth. Tommaso gave a soft laugh when his brother had gone. You realize you called him Rasilo? Inca clapped her hands over her mouth. I'm sorry. I don't drink alcohol, and it was a big glass. Tommaso chuckled. You are adorable. He kissed her, taking her by surprise. When she didn't resist, he kissed her again, pulling her to him. Inca didn't know how to react, but she felt herself respond, kissing him back. His large hands cradled her face as he kissed her. Finally, they broke apart. Tommaso closed his eyes and leaned his forehead against hers. Be mine, Inca. Be mine. He half walked, half carried her up the stairs and sat her on the bed. He sat down next to her. You're a good friend, Tommaso. The words slurred together. She sighed. He said nothing, just smiled. He took her face between his hands and kissed her on the mouth. I'd like to be more than that if you'll let me. He could see she wasn't really taking in what was happening. He kissed her again. I adore you, Inca. I've wanted you from the moment I saw you. I had to have you, do you understand? You had to be mine. She frowned, swaying, blinking slowly. He pushed her back onto the bed. Just let me take care of you. Just relax now. He undid her jeans and pulled them off. She was really fading now, completely malleable. He pulled her t-shirt off. He smiled down at her. You're beautiful, Inca. His lips were against her belly, and Inca let herself sink into the sensations of his tongue circling, then dipping into her navel. Tommaso pushed her legs up, hooking them over his shoulders. Inca gasped and shuddered, obviously enjoying his total control over her body. His hands roamed over her body. He dominated her completely. His hands pinned her above her head, his eyes riveted on hers, dark and intense. Inca sought his mouth hungrily, wanting to be possessed completely. You want me? He mummed in her ear and she nodded, gasping at the feel of him. He took her into such a state of desire that she was almost sobbing. Still, he would not let her rest, pressing her against the wall of the shower so hard they toppled out of the cubicle onto the hard floor. Afterward they lay talking, Inca exhausted, but still enjoying the feel of his big hand stroking her skin as they talked. She fell asleep wrapped in his arms, feeling safe and above all else, loved. The girl was trying desperately to clear the snow away from the windscreen of her car. The snowstorm was unrelenting, and she was almost sobbing, knowing that if she couldn't get her car started, she would die out there. When she saw the other car, she almost screamed with relief. She waved him down, and as the driver got out, she beamed at him. Thank God you're here. It's okay, get in the car and I'll see if I can start it. She climbed into her car and in moments heard him shout. Try it now. She did, and it started. Oh thank God, thank you, thank you. Her savior got into her passenger seat. Will you be okay now? I think so, thank you. The car's heater was kicking in now, and she unzipped her jacket. I can't thank you enough. How about a kiss? She looked startled. Excuse me? A kiss to say thanks. Oh my, a weirdo. She decided to keep him happy and pecked his cheek. Thank you. Relief. He was getting out. Take care. She nodded and smiled as he got out. 
She switched her windscreen wipers on, just as her door opened, and he dragged her out into the snow. She screamed, but her scream was lost in the storm. Watching in horror, she saw the knife. Oh my! Please no no! The pain was unimaginable, and as she felt her life slipping away, she wondered how someone so beautiful could be such a monster. The girl died quickly. Gosh, he lived for those moments. So lucky to have found her. Her black hair, her olive skin, she looked even more like his girl than the first two. The first two, here in Washington. The first since he had found her. Inca. All the girls wore her face now. Maybe it was time she knew he was coming from her. He wanted her to feel that fear and know that she was going to die very, very soon. Tomaso was still asleep when Inca woke the next morning. He looked so peaceful and boyish, she smiled down at him and silently slipped from the bed. She showered quietly and dressed. This time, she knew the way to the kitchen and walked down there. Raffaello was already there, as was Debbie. Raffaello smiled at her. Good morning, Inca. I trust you slept well. Ignoring the heat in her face, she nodded. Thank you, yes. Have some breakfast, Debbie said, setting down a plate of freshly baked croissants. I'll be making some eggs in a second. Would you like some? Yes, Inca smiled at her. Thank you. She sat down opposite Raffaello, who poured her some juice. She thanked him, watching as he also took the coffee pot and filled another mug for her. I feel spoiled. Raffaello laughed. It's just breakfast. How are you enjoying living here, Raffaello? She watched as he considered. I'm not as gregarious as Tommaso, so I find it difficult to meet new people. Also, my English is not as good. She smiled at him. I was wondering about that. He nodded. Tommaso attended Harvard. I did not. In fact, this is my first time in America. Inca was surprised. Really? Raffaello smiled. I know it is surprising, but my heart lies in Italy. Tommaso persuaded me to come with him and open some American clubs as a way to expand the business. Not that it needed expanding. I have to be honest, Inca said, sipping her coffee. I'm not someone who goes to clubs. Raffaello's smile widened. I don't blame you. Terrible places. Inca laughed at his mischievous smile, and the tension in her chest eased a little. Hello. They both turned to see Tommaso watching them from the doorway. Something in his demeanor made Inca's smile falter, but he came to kiss her temple and sit down with them. Inca swallowed her sudden nervousness. Raffaello was telling me it's his first time in the States. Tommaso smiled. I think maybe he needs a guided tour from the best guide in Willowbrook. Inca smiled at Raffaello. I'd be happy to when the weather improves. Raffaello nodded, glancing quickly at his brother. If you don't mind, I'd like that. Good, Tommaso said, seemingly approving, then he leaned in and whispered in her ear. Well, not exactly like the tour you gave me. The meaning in his words was clear, and Inca's whole body flushed with embarrassed heat. Was this the way it was going to be? Tommaso marking his territory? I don't think so, mister. Inca gritted her teeth and smiled at Raffaello, who she noticed was studiously ignoring his brother. It's really no problem. Come by the Sakura soon and we'll go from there. Thank you, Inca. After breakfast, Raffaello disappeared into the big house, and Tommaso and Inca sat in the living room, watching the weather close in. Inca bit her lip, frustrated. I'll have to try and get back into town today. Tommaso shook his head. It's too dangerous, Bella. Stay here for as long as you like. Inca sighed. You are very kind, Tommaso, but I have a life to get back to. I have the business, and I have to start looking for somewhere to live. Oh. She told him about the apartment. It was such a shock, you know. For weeks, I was the only bidder on the place, and then boom. Another buyer slammed in a ridiculous offer at the last minute. It kind of broke my heart. I know that's ridiculous, but it's my home, you know. Tommaso stroked the back of her neck. 
Bella, say the word and I will buy it for you. Just say the word. Inca was horrified. No. No way. My gosh, did you think that's why I told you? Believe me, Tomaso. Inca, calm down. I know that wasn't your reason for telling me. I'm making the offer anyway. Say the word. Inca was gaping at him. Tomaso, we barely know each other. We're not even in a relationship. We're not. His green eyes were soft. They dropped to her mouth in a way that made her belly flutter with desire. Inca relaxed. Tomaso, even if we're at the tentative stages of something, I'm still not ready for that kind of offer from you, however kind. And it's unbelievably kind, but no, thank you. I can find a place on my own. He stroked her hair. You could always move in here. We have plenty of room. Inca smiled at him and kissed him gently. Again, way too soon, but you are a sweet man, Tomaso. He grinned wickedly, his eyes crinkling, and he moved quickly, pulling her onto his lap and tickling her. Inca screeched with laughter. Oh, you lunatic. Tomaso suddenly stopped tickling her and pressed his lips to hers. You intoxicate me, Inca Sardi. I'm completely under your control. She tangled her fingers in his hair. Gosh, he was gorgeous. Take me back to bed, she whispered, nuzzling her nose to his. Take me to bed and make me yours. Ollie fought his way over to the Sakura, not expecting it to be open, but inside he found Scarlet alone. Why are you open? She grinned at him. If you expected me to be closed, why did you come? Ollie shrugged. You got me. Well, Scarlet turned to get him his usual Americano, you're officially my only customer. Ollie looked around. No, Inca. Scarlet grinned. Nope. She drove up to the winter place to return something to Tommaso Winter. She called me a little while ago. She got snowed in up there and is staying until it's safe to drive back. Ollie nodded. Okay then. Jealous? Damn it, Scarlet never let up. Ollie tried not to grimace. Not at all. If you hadn't noticed, I too have moved on. Snippy. Ollie gave up and grinned. You are annoying. That's me. Scarlet studied him. Seriously, though. She's fine, so what's your thing with the winters? Who says I got a thing? I know you, Scarlet said. You're not sure about them. Ollie sighed. It's not really the winters bothering me. It's the murders. Scarlet, in my ten years of being a cop, I've never seen anything so depraved, so brutal. I can't shake the image of those girls and the fact that they're Asian American. You can see why I'm a little antsy about Inca's safety. She's a big girl, Scarlet said gently. And she can look after herself. It's my job to make sure you're all safe. Scarlet shrugged. Fair enough. Just don't get too controlling. You. Don't have that right anymore. Gotcha. Look, Scarlet, why don't I walk you home? No one's going to come in today. Scarlet shook her head. I'm good. I have stuff to catch up on, stock checking, stuff like that. Thanks, though. Later that night, Ollie shouldered his way into his apartment and flicked on the lights. He snagged a bottle of water from his refrigerator and opened the door onto the small balcony. The snow had finally stopped, and now the night was calm but still bitterly cold. The apartment overlooked the harbor and the ferry landing, and he saw now that the last ferry of the day was waiting. He had thought the weather would stop the ferry service to the city, but no, he saw the lights of the ferry bobbing in the water. He was surprised to see a familiar figure striding along the jetty. One of the winter twins, he couldn't tell which one, jogged up the gangway and disappeared into the ferry. Where the hell are you going at this time of night? Ollie frowned and glanced at his watch. A quarter of twelve. Ollie pondered for a moment and shrugged. No business of his what they got up to after hours. He drained the water bottle and headed inside. He showered and brushed his teeth and collapsed gratefully onto the bed. 
In the morning, he woke to the news that another woman had been murdered in the city as he watched the news briefing. A shock drilled through him as they showed a photograph of the dead woman. She looked so much like Inca that it took his breath away. The victim was older than the others, an Indian-American woman in her early fifties who had been released from a mental health facility earlier that day. She had been stabbed to death like the others, but this time, a message was carved into her skin. Police are not releasing the details of the message, but say it could help them in the search for this vicious and merciless killer. Ollie felt sick, but not as sick as an hour later when Knox called him and in a flat voice told him that another girl had been found dead. He drove out to the site and saw the horrific scene. Ollie looked at Knox and saw he was as shocked and horrified as he was. It was what Ollie feared the most. The carved letters and pale skin. Inca. Inca drove home alone, despite Tommaso's insistence that he should come with her. She had gently declined. I have so much to do, Tommaso, to get back to work and find a new place. Thank you for everything. She'd been at the winter home for two days before the weather had settled enough to return home, but she had to promise Tommaso she would keep the dress he had bought her and wear it to dinner that night. Smiling, she kissed him goodbye. I'll see you tonight. He slid his hands around her face. I'll miss you. She opened the door to the Sakura to find it busy, and Nancy and Scarlet ran off their feet. I'll be down in one minute, she promised them before running upstairs to change. More like ten minutes, Nancy grumbled when she returned, but she kissed Inca's cheek. How was your sojourn at the billionaire's mansion? Inca rolled her eyes. Very pleasant, thank you. We burned $100 notes for warmth and made the servants race naked in the snow so we could bet actual gold bullion on them. Sarcastic flirt. Nancy tried not to grin. Get to work. Yes, boss. Apparently, the entire town of Willowbrook had been going stir-crazy at home during the storm, and they had all descended to the tea house that day. Inca, Scarlet, and Nancy didn't get a break all day, and when evening rolled around, they were all exhausted. As they were closing, Ollie and Knox came in. Inca locked the door behind them. Both men looked shattered. What's going on? Inca went to make them some hot sandwiches as they told the women about the new murder victim. Nancy watched them carefully. There's something else you're not telling us. Ollie sighed and Knox looked uncomfortable. You all better sit down. The woman exchanged glances but sat down as requested. Ollie took a deep breath in. The body we found and the one found in Seattle, both had been stabbed to death. A name had been carved into the dead women's stomachs. A warning. A threat. What name? Inca already felt a heavy dread settle over her as both Ollie and Knox turned to her. Just say it, she said in a low voice, and Ollie nodded. I'm so sorry, Inca. Yes. It was your name. Inca put her head in her hands. Nancy looked shocked and sick. Are you sure whoever it was meant? She nodded toward her daughter. Ollie patted her hand. No, we can't be sure, of course. It's just, with the ethnicity of the victims, the location of the deaths, and the relative uniqueness of your name, Inks, especially in the county, we have to assume that it could be a death threat. Inca threw up her hands. But why? I don't think I have any enemies. Could be someone who's fixated on you. Anyone could have come in here and seen you. Or maybe there's someone from your past. Inca shook her head, silent, shocked. I don't think so. But in the back of her mind, there was something, something she had never told anyone, not even Nancy. Something she had forced herself to forget. Ollie was studying her face. Inks, you okay? Look, we're going to be on this 24-7 until this guy is caught. Who says it's a guy? Scarlet wondered. What if it's a girl? Unlikely, Knox said, and Scarlet scowled at him. A woman is just as able to. Scarlet, we know it's a man, okay? Just leave it at that. For once, Knox was without his usual swagger, he just looked shell-shocked. Scarlet opened her mouth to argue but then took pity on him, squeezing his hand. There's something else. Ollie looked at Nancy and Inca. 
The woman who was killed in Seattle, this one was different. She was older, a former mental health patient. Inca, her resemblance to you is undeniable. We would like to take a DNA sample from you to test against the dead woman. Nancy gave a distressed cry, and Inca stared at Ollie in horror. What? He nodded. I'm so sorry, Inca, but we have to investigate the possibility that the woman murdered in Seattle was your birth mother. Ollie looked up as his sister Luna came into the police station, balancing two cups of coffee. Hey, haven't seen you around for a while. Luna gave him one of the cups and sat down opposite him. I've been staying in the city. Okay. Luna was never very forthcoming about her movements, and Ollie couldn't help but feel concerned about his younger sister. She was the same age as Inca, 28, but somehow seemed so much younger. Her dark blue eyes and black hair made her stand out in a crowd, but Luna always seemed to be trying to avoid any interaction with her peer group. Only Inca had ever broken through Luna's high walls, and now that she and Ollie were no longer a couple, Luna seemed to be backsliding. It bugged Ollie. Thanks for the coffee. You go see Inca. Luna shrugged. She's out to dinner with the billionaire, apparently. Ollie grinned at his sister. Don't be judgy. You know Inca's not a gold digger. Why are you taking our split out on her? I'm the one who instigated it. Luna sighed. Then you're the idiot. Sweets, we couldn't have stayed together just for you, you know. Don't be patronizing, that's not why I'm pissed. Then why? Because she's the best thing that ever happened to this family, and you blew it. Ollie blinked, surprised at the venom in Luna's voice. Wow. She relented. Sorry, just keeping it real. Luna. Gosh. What the hell? Luna, I think you need to get used to the fact that Inca and I are not together. I have Molly, she has Tommaso Winter, but we both still love you. Luna rolled her eyes. Whatever. You met the billionaire? No, actually. Luna gave him a sly grin. Scarlet told me Inca's bringing him back to the Sakura later. Wanna go check the rich guy out? Ollie glanced around the empty office. Knox? His deputy poked his head out of another door. Yep. You good here? Okay, if I step out for a time? Go for it, boss. Ollie stood and hitched his pants up. Right. Time for a little stakeout. He winked at Luna, and they crossed the street together to the varsity. Inca and Tommaso were just leaving Levi's restaurant. Tommaso had his hand on her back. Ollie stopped. He couldn't breathe for a moment. Wow. Luna pulled him into the coffee shop. Ollie, walking backward, collided with a table just as Inca came in. She grinned at him. He couldn't take his eyes off her. The pale pink against her golden skin was luminous, the lights of the teahouse glinting off the beads through tiny strands of light onto her face into her eyes. Tommaso walked in behind her, a proud look on his face. Hey dude. Inca touched Ollie's arm, breaking the spell. She walked behind the counter and grabbed the coffee pot. She filled three mugs and passed one to each of them. She grabbed a soda from the cooler for herself. Wow, Ollie repeated, and she flushed. Tommaso sat down at the counter. Ollie eyed him and nodded at Inca. That's a nice dress. Tommaso bowed his head. Just a little token of my esteem. Aha. Uh -huh. Ollie suddenly didn't like this guy, he was way too confident. Tommaso smiled. Chief Rosenbaum, I feel I haven't had the chance to get to know you properly. He offered his hand, and after a hesitation, Ollie shook it. Inca beamed. I don't want to offend you, Tommaso, but I'm just going to go out back and change. I'm terrified of spilling coffee on this dress. She gave them both a smile and disappeared. Scarlet went to clear the tables and close the door. Luna sat in silence. Ollie couldn't resist. Personal. Address. Tommaso nodded. That's what Inca said. Perhaps it was inappropriate. Ollie was taken aback by the other man's admission. 
He thought a little. How long do you think you'll be staying? Tommaso smiled. At the moment, we have no plans to leave. Plenty of time to get to know everyone. Ali nodded. Sure. Tommaso leaned over and refilled his coffee. He offered the pot to Ali, who shook his head. Tommaso looked at the other man. Perhaps you and Molly is it would like to join us for dinner one night? Ali felt his conciliatory mood disappear at Tommaso's proprietary tone. He stood up. Aha! He knocked on the backroom door. Inks, I'm going now. Tommaso smirked into his mug and Ali gave him a withering look. Inca poked her head out of the door. Okay, night then. Ali touched her face and smiled. Night, darling. He walked towards the door. Good night, chief. Ali nodded at Tommaso, curt and annoyed. He waved to his sister and went out into the night. Outside he crossed the street, looking back over at the teahouse. He watched Tommaso talking to Inca, touching her face, kissing her tenderly. Us he thought. He knew exactly what he was doing. Ali sighed, reminded himself that he had no right to be annoyed or to be jealous, but a knot of tension had lodged itself in his chest. He lit a cigarette, feeling like an intruder as he watched the two of them. His friend. His Inca. He knew he was being petulant. He coughed and pulled himself together. She's not your Inca anymore, buddy. He winced at the pain the thought caused him. He crushed the remainder of his smoke under his heel and went to work. Tommaso stayed over at Inca's apartment and she saw him taking it all in. I like it, he said. It's very you. She smiled and he took her in his arms. Inca, I need to tell you something. I've never been this happy. She smiled at him, both touched and nervous. Tommaso, I love spending time with you. I do, but I don't know if I'm ready for a serious relationship. Tommaso shrugged. It's okay. You will be. She laughed at his certainty, and he grinned and swept her into the bedroom. As he started to strip her, she kissed his neck. I really do love that dress, Tommaso. I'm glad you decided to keep it, he said, brushing his lips along her collarbone. But I prefer what's underneath it. I'm going to make you mine all night long, Principessa. The fact that he was still dressed in his impeccable Armani suit while she was with no clothes was a complete turn-on for Inca. Inca let herself go, feeling every sensation he was sending through her body. He smiled up at her. Inca loved the way Tommaso looked at her. With this man, she felt more sensual, more feminine than she ever had with anyone else. Afterward, they soaked in her little bathtub together, Inca leaning back on Tommaso's hard chest. His fingers traced a pattern in soap bubbles on her belly. Bella, I like this place. It is a shame you have to move. I know, she sighed, distracted by the feel of his fingers on her skin. I guess I'll really have to step up the search for a new place. You know my thoughts. His lips nuzzled her ear, then moved to her shoulder. Inca smiled, closing her eyes. I do. They lay in silence for a time. I don't think your police chief likes me. Inca opened her eyes. Ollie's harmless. He's probably doing that man thing you all do. Tommaso laughed. I have no idea what you mean. The marking your territory thing. Not that I'm either of your territories, just to remind you. She felt his laugh rumble through his chest. I hear you. Tell him, though. Oh, I will. She was quiet for a long moment. Tommaso, there's something I have to tell you, something that's going on. It kind of explains why Ali is a little overprotective. She told him about the murders, and Tommaso listened in shock. Silence. Why didn't you tell me before? She sat up and turned to face him. His eyes were troubled. Because we don't know if it actually has anything to do with me, or it's just a coincidence. They took some DNA to run against the older women they found in Seattle. Her breath hitched in her throat at that, and he cradled her cheek in his palm. Are you okay? I just never considered my birth parents. As far as I'm concerned, Nancy and Tyler are my parents. 
Tommaso nodded, his face serious. I hope it is not your birth mother, but I do know something about family disharmony. My parents were very unhappy before they divorced. My father is a difficult man. My mother was an angel. Inca smiled. You've never talked about your family before. Tommaso laughed softly. Neither have you. Inca realized he was right. I guess we really don't know each other that well. I guess not. They gazed at each other for a long moment. I would like to get to know you, he said softly and leaned in to kiss her. Wrapping her arms around his neck, Inca suddenly felt optimistic. The man in her arms was gorgeous, funny, and smart. Maybe it was time she told herself it was okay to fall for him. Tommaso surprised her the following morning as she was opening up the Sakura. The day was surprisingly warm, the snow from the storm was almost gone. Inca had arranged to show Raffaello around the area today, so she was surprised when Tommaso showed up. Inca grinned when with him, she saw a huge Labrador retriever bound out of his car. The dog immediately went to her, wagging its plummy tail, and Inca hugged it delightedly. You got a dog. Tommaso grinned. Technically, you got a dog. Since you won't let me pay for a security detail, I thought this was the next best thing. Inca was touched. That's really sweet. Gosh, he's so beautiful. What's his name? Boomer. Hey, look, I didn't choose it. I got him at the pound. Inca almost felt like crying. Tommaso, I don't know what to say, thank you. I hope it wasn't presuming too much. It was, but Inca didn't care. She fussed around the dog, making him excited and crazy. She grabbed a bowl of water for him. Tommaso, he's lovely, thank you. She kissed him as they heard a horn toot outside. I think my brother is here, Tommaso said, then looked at Boomer. Shall I take him for today? Raph isn't keen on dogs. Inca was still smiling as she slid into the passenger seat of Raffaello's car. When Raffaello didn't start the car, she turned to look at him. He was watching her, his green eyes intense. Is there something I should know? Inca felt her face burn and looked away. Not at all. So where shall we start? I saw another road along here. I'm assuming it leads around the town. Inca sighed, relieved. Yes. It's the only other. I was going to say highway, but that would be overstating its size. She laughed and Raffaello smiled. For a small town, it seems bigger than it looks. Inca nodded. It's because there aren't many buildings. The population is less than 250 people, not counting the pupils at the school. During the semester, the population triples. Good for business. They drove in silence for a little while. Inca gazed out of the window at the coast road, its fur-lined cliffs, the steps down to the beach carved into the stone. Where does this road go? Raffaello's question brought her out of her reverie. Around to the school. We'll pass the golf course soon. So, you have a large school and a golf course for a population of 250. She laughed. And you don't want to know how few of us play golf. Do you? Play golf. No. Do you even know how to have fun? Inca thought to herself. She thought back to the nights when she and Ollie, Knox, and Scarlett had played board games and gotten drunk together, falling asleep on the couches and chairs in their living rooms, waking in the early hours to cover her friends with blankets. She couldn't picture Raffaello sprawled out in an easy chair, a half-empty beer bottle at his feet as he tried to name all fifty states. She remembered Ollie squinting at the ceiling, trying desperately to recall Arkansas, while she, Knox, and Scarlett heckled him. Inca grinned again and looked at Raffaello, ramrod straight in his seat, dressed impeccably as always. Inca narrowed her eyes at him, a mischievous grin on her face. Raffaello, what do you do for fun? The question seemed to surprise him. What do you mean? Just that. We're supposed to be getting to know each other and I still know nothing about you. And your first question is how do I have fun? The tension was back. With a simple question, he'd made her feel frivolous and shallow. Stung, Inca turned away and stared out of the window. 
After a while, Raffaello gave a little cough. Inca, I feel as if I have. I didn't mean to offend you. Sometimes I don't express myself as I would wish. Your question was completely legitimate, and I apologize if. He cleared his throat again. I read. I watch television. I go to the cinema and the theater. I don't play golf, but I like to run and sometimes play tennis. He smiled at her, and Inca saw genuine regret in his expression. She nodded out of the window. Pull over up here. I want to show you something. Raffaello pulled the car to the side of the road, and they got out. Inca led the way down one of the stairways carved into the cliff. Halfway down, she turned into a small opening in the rock. Raffaello had to bend to walk into the cave. Inca sat down on a rock and he joined her. The first time I showed Tommaso around, I showed him this place. Raffaello squinted into the blackness of the cave. How far does it go back? She laughed. No idea. We did think about investigating, but we were too chicken. Anyway, I wanted to show you this because he wanted to know where I had grown up. Raffaello nodded. He went to stand at the edge of the cave, looking out over the ocean. Inca studied him, still trying to find some familiarity in his personality. He seemed too different from Tommaso. Raffaello turned, saw her smiling, and took a seat beside her. Inca, I. He stopped, and she noticed with surprise that he seemed nervous. He took a deep breath in. Inca, I know I can seem different. I don't make friends easily. I have always preferred my own company. But I hope that is about to change. She returned his smile. I hope so too. Come on, let's go down to the beach. He followed her down to the beach, watching the way her hips swayed gently and the almost childlike exuberance of her gait when they reached the sand. Inside him, he felt a rare emotion, admiration. He liked this woman, he realized, and that disconcerted him. For once in his life, Raffaello Winter considered that his relationship with this particular woman could be different. She could be to him what no other woman had ever been. A friend. Ollie came to see her later. Still no news on the DNA, I'm afraid. He made a fuss of Boomer. That's a nice gift, a great idea. Of course, I'd feel better if you got your firearms license and bought a gun. Inca shook her head. No way. Not going to happen. Ollie studied her. Inca, this is real. Women are dying, young women are being killed. God help me, I won't let that happen to you or anyone else I know. But you have to help me out here. Don't do anything reckless, don't go out on your own at night. Inca gave a hiss of frustration. Ollie. Have you any idea what women have to go through every day because a man might kill us? I'm not curtailing my life. Then let's just hope he doesn't curtail your life. He'd seen her out with her friends, drinking, laughing. Her engagement party. He'd come upon her in her bedroom, trying on her wedding dress. She'd been drinking cheap white wine and twirling in front of the mirror. Princess for the day. Then as he stepped into her eyeline, the fear. She hadn't screamed, just a widening of the eyes. He'd picked up her glass, put the tablet in. The cheap rehypnol from the scrawny dead-eyed dealer in Belltown made her drink it. The liquid spilled over her lips. She had obeyed, shaking, tears pouring down her face. The horror of it all worked quicker than the drug. She'd passed out. He had lain her gently on the bed, waiting. As she stirred, he gripped the knife firmly and plunged it into her abdomen. His hand clamped across her mouth as she screamed at last. Blood had spattered across the intricate lace. Turned pink. Inka was falling asleep in the armchair. She had tried to keep awake for the movie but kept missing huge chunks of it. She hadn't slept well since Ollie's warning and now she was exhausted. She had settled Boomer into her life and now she sat with the dog on her couch, wondering if she should just close her eyes and sleep. The credits were rolling when Boomer started barking. He skittered to the front door and scratched at it. Inca, dopey from sleep, didn't think. She pulled it open, and Boomer ran out. What the hell are you doing? Hunter yelled at her. She was awake then. 
Hunter strode up to her, his face contorted with anger. Boomer had disappeared. She shook herself. Hunter, what? I could have been anybody. You just opened the door? She was shocked. Hunter had never even raised his voice to anyone as far she knew, and for certain not to her, but he was red with anger now. He came up to her and grabbed her shoulders. Inca, I could have been anybody. Someone who'd want to hurt you. You don't just open the door like that. Not on your own. Hunter calmed down. I'm sorry, I didn't think. He drew in a deep breath, and she was shaken to see tears in his eyes. Hunter, I'm sorry. Come in for a minute. He looked behind him, scanning the street. He whistled, and Boomer came bounding out of the darkness, his tail wagging. He waited until the dog was in the house before nodding at Inca and stepping through the door. Inca shut the door and locked it to keep Hunter happy. She followed him back to the kitchen. Hunter, are you okay? She opened the refrigerator and pulled out a beer for him. He took it. I'm sorry, Inca, I didn't mean to scare you like that. Thank you for the beer. He took a long drink. Inca sat down opposite him and waited. He drained the beer and sighed. You need to be more careful, is all. There are bad people around. Pretty girl like you on your own. He shook his head. Inca tried not to smile. You are very sweet, Hunter. But I have Boomer. He looked at her in the eye. Dog ain't no protection against a knife or a bullet. Inca swallowed. He had a point. Hunter, I know everyone on the peninsula. Who'd come over from the mainland just to? There's a lot of other people between me and after all. She smiled and pointed out the window. The next land that way is Japan. I'm okay. I promise. Ollie would want me to look out for you. I know and don't think I don't appreciate you. I do. You're my family, Hunter, don't ever forget that. I'm sorry about earlier. I promise I will be more careful. I'll keep Boomer in the house and keep the door locked. I won't answer the door after dark unless I know the person. Is that okay? Inca got up to get him another beer and poured herself a glass of milk. Not all bad people are strangers, Hunter muttered, and she turned and frowned. Hunter looked away from her, down into his drink. She sat down again. Hunter, who are you talking about? He didn't answer, but Inca had already guessed. Hunter, are you talking about Tommaso? He nodded. She leaned over and grabbed his hand, squeezing it. Hunter, why would Tommaso want to hurt me? I don't trust him, he said. Inca gave a frustrated laugh. Have you been talking to Ali? Ali's a good man. Smart guy. I've seen him watching you. You've seen Ali watching me? No. Him. Tommaso. He watches you. He said things. What things, Hunter? Hunter flushed and shifted in his chair. He didn't look her in the eye. Says he could have you if he wanted you. Inca laughed. Hunter, he and I are seeing each other. He knows it's not serious. Hunter's voice was small. I don't think so. Inca didn't know what to say. I'm sure you're wrong, Hunter. He doesn't mean any harm. He's a nice guy. Boomer started barking again, and Hunter was up. He yanked the door open, keeping Boomer from running out. He passed the dog to Inca and ran out. Keep him in, lock the door. Don't open it again, even for me. Inca did as she was told and went to the window. Hunter's torch bobbed into the darkness and disappeared. She sat at the kitchen table, waiting for some news or for Hunter to call through the door. Just before midnight, she couldn't keep her eyes open and crawled into bed. She glanced at her phone just as she saw Hunter text her to say all was well. Inca smiled, hugged Boomer to her, and fell asleep. At home, Ollie showered quickly and dressed. He'd enjoyed his run that morning with the fresh, cold Washington air in his lungs. His smile soon faded when the familiar scene of police tape and CSI officers filled the screen. Another murder. This time in her home. Jeez. 
He tried to think back over the serial killings in the U.S. over the last few years, the Milwaukee Northside stranglings between 86 and 04, Anthony Kirkland's campaign in Cincinnati in the late O, the California Bride murders in 2014. Something about that last one snagged at something in his memory. He flicked on his laptop and waited for the browser to load. He turned the television up as he waited. Victim was stabbed, reports say. Ollie felt the usual nausea rise in his throat. He tapped Bride Murders in California into the search engine and hit return. A sense of familiarity made the hairs on his neck stand up. How the hell had he not seen this before? Over three days in San Francisco, Bakersfield, and Fresno, the killings had been famous not only for their savagery but for the killer's audaciousness. All three women were killed while trying on wedding dresses in the dressing rooms of the boutiques. No one saw anything. Ollie gave a choked laugh. How is that even possible? But it wasn't even that which made him shake his head and wonder just what the hell kind of monster they were looking for. The women. The dead women. Their pictures would haunt him. The beautiful faces of Kelly Cho, Zion MHA, and Melissa Tang stared out at him from the screen, every one of them reminding him of his tiny brunette ex-girlfriend. How's things going, Missy? Tyler smiled down at her. And how is the boyfriend? Inca saw Tommaso look up, his interest peaked. They were all gathered in Levi's restaurant for his partner's birthday, and the Inca had invited Tommaso as her plus one. So far, she'd introduced him to her father, Tyler, and her friends, and now he was chatting with Scarlett. Ollie joined Tyler and Inca, casting suspicious glances at Tommaso. Inca ignored him and turned to Tyler. It's good. I mean, we're all just getting to know each other. It takes time. Sometimes it can be rocky, but we're getting there. There was a long silence. Inca sighed. Just say what you want to, guys, she said, shooting a glance over to Tommaso at the bar. But keep your voices down. Tyler grimaced slightly. I don't know about that one, he said, his deep soulful voice low. Seems to me you need to watch him. There's something off. Ollie raised his glass slightly. Exactly what I think. Inca looked back and forth between them. Both were people she would trust with her life. Listen, she said softly, I agree he's not like us, how could he be? But I get the feeling, oh, I don't know, that there's more to his story than he's told me. I don't think he had an easy time of it. Inca rolled her shoulders, suddenly tense. People deserve second chances, she said quietly. Her eyes glistened, and she felt suddenly very weary. Tyler put his arm around her shoulders. You always try to see the best in people, Inca honey, and I love that about you. I just hope in the end your faith is served. I would hate to see you disappointed or hurt. She leaned into him gratefully, wishing for the millionth time that Tyler was her real father. He was the nearest thing she'd ever had. Ollie's face was set and thoughtful. He leaned over to her. Inca, not now, but we need to have a talk. Please. For my peace of mind. It's not your job to protect me, she whispered back. As much as I'm grateful for you trying. He grinned. Actually, it is my job. Just a chat. Nothing heavy, I promise. Come by the Sakura next week. Just let me know when. She nodded and he gave her a reassuring smile. She picked up her glass and looked over at Tommaso. He caught her eye and she smiled back, trying to see in his expression any spite, any malice. There was none. Instead, his eyes were full of concern and truth. She rubbed her hand over her eyes. Ollie, Tommaso is not dangerous. You have nothing to be worried about, although I thank you for your concern. I'm a grown woman. I decide what's good for me. She felt bad for her snippiness then. Truly. You cannot imagine how happy I am that you are in my life. So thankful. But Tommaso and I are having fun getting to know each other. Please, find it in your heart to be happy for me. Ollie kissed her cheek. I would never try to stop any happiness of yours, Inc. I meant it when I said you'll always be my best friend. You too, buddy.
Raffaello, had fallen into a routine. He would rise at 5 a.m., take a run along the town's roads and beaches, shower, shave, and dress. At a quarter of noon, he would drive down to Main Street, sliding his rental car into one of the few spots outside the Sakura. Then he would take up his spot at the counter of the tea house and talk with his brother's girl. He liked the routine, it was clean, reassuring, and controlled. Inca didn't seem to mind his regular appearance, and it seemed to him that he made an effort to make him feel welcome. There was that word again, so very alien to him. Welcome. No one screaming at him, no one banishing him. And to his utter astonishment, he liked Inca too. For a woman, she was bright, funny, and a good conversationalist without being chatty or gossipy. When the conversation fell silent, she didn't rush to fill it, at least not anymore, now that she'd become more comfortable in his presence. And he took pleasure in watching her, her slim yet softly rounded body, that glorious honeyed skin. On her sweet face, even now at twenty-eight, vestiges of puppy fat remained, making her look at least five years younger. He kept most of his visits from Tommaso. He didn't want his brother to think he was making a move on his girl. They'd had that particular problem before, back in Italy, with Perdita. Raffaello felt the familiar pain flash through him. Perdita had been his girlfriend, his one true love, before she'd cheated on him with Tommaso. Tommaso had been guilt-ridden, begging Raff for forgiveness, which he had given to him, finally. But Perdita was lost to him, he never saw her again. So now he trod carefully. He never wanted Tommaso to feel that pain, not from him. And Inca was special, Raffaello could tell. She was different. Tommaso had always been the playboy, the Casanova, despite what their respective reputations said, but now Raff saw a real change in his brother. He was falling in love with Inca. Raffaello would do anything to protect that. Anything. Well, why not? Tommaso's question, abrupt, irritated, took her aback. The expression on his face was something else. Anger. Inca swallowed, remembering Hunter's warning. I'm sorry, Tommaso. I need to do some paperwork, and I need some time alone. I did tell you I was busy until tomorrow. She turned away from him, reaching for the coffee pot. When she turned, he was standing right beside her. She started, and the pot smashed to the floor. Geez, Tommaso. He held his hands up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to startle you, I was just coming to help. Lift a coffee pot. She was aware her tone was snippy. She crouched down and started to pick the pieces of glass up. He didn't bend to help, nor did he move. As she stood to put the glass into the trash, she was aware of the closeness of his body and that he was watching her. Her skin prickled and she didn't bother to hide her discomfort. Even in the soft warmth of the tea house, she shivered. Are you okay? She didn't answer him. I've offended you. His tone was amused. Inca wasn't impressed. No, Tommaso, you just startled me. It's fine. Well, clearly not. I'll leave you alone. He stalked out, leaving Inca to gape after him. Had that actually just happened? Where was the fun-loving, good-time man she had spent last night with? It was like he'd been body-swapped with someone else. She was still upset later when Ollie came to see her and asked her to sit down with him. She closed the tea house for a while and braced herself. We have the DNA results, sweetheart. I'm afraid my hunch was correct. The murder victim was your biological mother. Emotions she didn't understand rushed through her, and she gave a little moan of distress. Tears came then and Ollie held her while she cried. I'm so sorry, Inca. I don't know why I'm crying, she said eventually, wiping her eyes. I never knew her. But even so, I hate to think this happened to her. Gosh. Ollie nodded, his eyes serious. And sweetheart, it makes it more likely that the murders are tied to you in some way. Inca, listen, whatever you tell me now is strictly and I mean completely between you and me. I won't tell a soul, but I get the feeling you're hiding something. Inca stared at him for a long moment, then closed her eyes. Ollie took her hand. Inca, is there anyone who might want to cause you harm? Anyone? 
Slowly, Inca nodded. Gosh, she really didn't want to have this conversation. Please God don't let it be him. Yes. There is, Ollie. There's someone who would want to kill me, but I don't know how the hell he found me. I don't know how. Ollie leaned forward, his face almost contorted with fear. Gosh, Inca, who? Who is it? Tears began to pour down her face again. Ollie, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Who? Who is it? Inca took a deep breath in and looked at him, her dark eyes full of misery. My husband. It's my husband who wants to kill me. I stump. Inca had already decided to go into the city when her cell phone rang. She'd gotten up late, rested but distracted, disturbed by vivid dreams. She stood under the shower, trying to unravel the parts she could remember. Ollie. And her husband, the one she'd never told anyone about, Kevin. Then a choking, suffocating terror. Pain. Despite the heat of the shower, she shivered. It's just a dream but her stomach was cramped up with tension. After a few minutes, she gave up and ran a bath, hoping immersing her whole body in the water would help. She kneaded her stomach muscles with her fingers, feeling how knotted and sore they felt. Ever since she'd told Ollie about Kevin, she hadn't been able to shake the fear that ran bone deep. It had been when she was abroad, in England, during her time at college. She'd met Kevin in the student bar of her college, and the attraction had been immediate. Kevin hadn't had the preppy good looks of his cohorts, but he had seemed genuinely besotted by Inca. Even then, though, she had been reticent about telling him everything about her. And when it came to making love, she had refused him. I'm not ready, she had told him. If you need to go elsewhere for that, I'm okay with it. She had never known if he had taken her up on that and slept around. For Inca, that had not been the foundation of their relationship. To her, she had found a good friend. To Kevin, however, it was more. He had appeared to fall in love with her, and when he told her he wanted to relocate to the States, he asked her to marry him so he could get his green card. Inka wasn't keen on the idea, but Kevin had manipulated her into agreeing to it, and they had a five-minute ceremony at a London registrar's office. Then, when they got back to the States and moved into a little apartment in New York, that was when he had turned nasty, and the Inca realized that was why she had held back from fully committing to him. The menace that lurked underneath his outwardly friendly appearance was now all on the surface. He watched her every move, pressured her to be intimate, and got nasty when she backed off. The first time he had hit her, she had known she'd made the biggest mistake of her life. What had she been thinking? She had planned to leave less than a month after the wedding and get the marriage annulled. But Kevin had made sure she knew that he would never allow her to leave. I'll kill you, he had raged, and Inca had barely made it out of the apartment. She'd taken the bus across the country and arrived back in Washington state, relieved she'd never told him where her hometown really was. Getting the marriage annulled would be difficult without Kevin finding her, so she'd stuck her head in the sand and pretended he didn't exist except now, he might have found her. Inca had no doubt that Kevin was capable of killing and that his obsession with her would lead him to try and terrify her into submission. But gosh, she really didn't want to deal with that. She leaned back in the water. She couldn't shake the dream. It was sparks and discordant flashes of memory. Kevin. Was he kissing her? She remembered a feeling of resignation. It wasn't a good feeling. She was resigned to the fact that he was going to hurt her, that she would die. Kevin was killing her, and Ollie walked away. I told you what he was Inca. I told you. She screamed for him, but he didn't look back. Kevin was holding her, and she couldn't move, couldn't escape. All of his limbs turned to blades, freakishly oversized knives and machetes. His grin was a terrifying rictus. It stretched and stretched until his whole mouth was impossibly large, a gaping maw. Then came the pain. Inca shook herself. A freaking child's nightmare. Ridiculous. She pulled herself from the bath and wrapped a towel around herself. 
She wanted out of this town for a day, away from everybody. The realtor had arranged for people to come put up a sold sign today, but she didn't think she could bear to be around them. With everything that was going on, the pain of knowing she was going to have to move out of her safe space was eating at her. She dressed quickly in a plain t-shirt and jeans, pulling her wet hair into a ponytail and sliding her feet into her favorite old sneakers. When the phone rang just as she was going downstairs, she glanced at the display and debated not answering. She hadn't spoken to Tommaso since she'd confessed Kevin's existence to Ollie. Guilt won out. Hi, Tommaso. How are you this morning? Inca opened the door of her car and got in. I'm good. On my way out is all. How are you? Fine, thanks. Going anywhere interesting? Just into the city. Would you like some company? I was intending to go to the city myself at some point. Inca leaned her head against the window and closed her eyes. No, I really, really don't. But she tried to keep her voice neutral. Of course. I'll pick you up on the way. I'll be five minutes. When she pulled up outside the winter mansion, Tommaso was waiting. He smiled and opened her door, leaning to kiss her cheek. I thought I might drive us. Inca opened her mouth to protest, but Tommaso was already walking to his car. She sighed and followed him, sliding into the passenger seat of the sleek Mercedes. He smiled at her. Ready, my darling? Despite herself, the sight of his handsome face and his obvious delight at seeing her made her feel better. She leaned over to kiss him. Ready. He stroked her face. I've missed you, Bella. We should see more of each other. Inca smiled. We have all day today if you'd like, Tommaso. I do like. He grinned. Come. Show me your city. Inca was just getting in when she heard the house phone ring. Grabbing the receiver with one finger, she was surprised when she heard Mindy's voice. The realtor sounded breathless. Honey, are you okay? Mindy's voice was almost frantic. Inca frowned. I'm fine, what's going on, Mindy? Against the tumult of Mindy's greeting, the sudden silence that followed was jarring. And when Mindy spoke, the ice in her voice was a shock. Well, I guess then I had no need to call. Do you even care that you've ruined someone's day and lost them money? Wasted my time? Inca was speechless. Mindy, what the hell are you talking about? I'm talking about the guys who were coming to set up your house sale signs. Those guys that were going out of their way to do that for me. If you had a problem with the dates, you could have just called me and I would have rescheduled. Is this about the apartment? Are you punishing me for losing it? Inca interrupted her. Mindy, I swear I have no idea what you're talking about. The guys were coming today, weren't they? A building panic hammered at her chest. She couldn't recall if she'd seen their sign outside the apartment. Mindy's short bark of laughter held no humor. Well, I thought so until half an hour ago when you called to cancel. Wait what? Inca's head began to pound uncomfortably, and she knew another migraine would follow if she didn't calm down. I've never called them, Mindy, not ever. I wouldn't even know their number. I certainly didn't call to cancel this morning. Mindy's voice was hard as she intoned, I'm calling to cancel the appointment because I don't want you or your workers anywhere near my property. A ribbon of ice trickled down Inca's stomach. Mindy. I swear I never made any calls. I will get you my phone records if you want, but I did not make that call. I was in the city with my boyfriend a half hour ago, or at least in his car on the way back. I would never ever treat someone like that. Come on now, you've known me for months. Do you really think I'm capable of behavior like that? Mindy suddenly sighed. When she spoke, she sounded tired and drained. No, I don't, I guess. I just… The guy was really upset, and the way he said you spoke. What's going on, Inca? The pain in Inca's head was shrieking now. She sat down on the bottom stair and rubbed her free hands over her eyes. I have no idea. Someone must have called and pretended they were me. She shook her head. Who would do that, though? 
I'm really sorry for the sign guy, even if it wasn't me. Jeez. Mindy sighed again. Who would? She didn't even get the rest of the sentence out when Inka realized. Her shoulders slumped, and she gave a low resigned groan. There was only one person petty enough and who hated her enough to do this. Mindy, it's okay. It's someone messing with me, and I think I know who it is. She apologized again, said her goodbyes, and set the phone down. The doorbell rang, and as she went to answer it, she felt anger sweep over her as she contemplated just how she would pay back her tormentor. She opened the door to see Ollie smiling at her, but his smile faded when he saw her face. What's up? Inca sighed. Ollie, would you happen to know if Belinda Clements is back in town? The queen of all evil. Ollie grinned as she stood aside to let him in. I really don't know. Why? Inca told him, and Ollie rolled his eyes. It does sound like something she'd do, but like ten years ago. What's her beef now? Who the hell knows? I really could do without it though, you know? Ollie patted her arm. Listen, we can deal with a spiteful little slimeball like Belinda. I want to talk some more about this ex-husband of yours. Inca sighed. I wish he was an ex-husband, believe me. You have one hour. Tommaso is picking me up in two hours for dinner. Deal. Later, when she was showering and dressing for dinner, she thought about Belinda again. The two of them had been sworn enemies since childhood, Inca had refused to bow down to her queen bee schoolyard antics, and Belinda had instead made Inca the target of all her spite. It hadn't changed when they grew older. Belinda's jealousy of Inca's beauty and popularity, especially with Ollie with whom Belinda was besotted, meant she had criticized and griped at Inca until at last, Belinda found some rich idiot to marry her, and they moved to California. Inca really hoped it wasn't Belinda who had bought her beloved apartment. I'd be tempted to leave a candle burning, she thought darkly, then smiled. Belinda Clements was the least of her problems, and now all she wanted was to enjoy her evening with Tommaso. Despite her reluctance to see him that morning, his company had been just what she had needed. Screw you, Belinda. You won't spoil anything for me. Sixth grade, Willowbrook Junior High. Then. Chink. Inca ignored her, far too busily immersed in Boo Saving Scout and Gem. A drop of purple soda flicked onto the page in front of her. Hey. I called you Chink. Inca pushed her glasses up her nose and glared at the ginger-haired girl in front of her. Belinda Clements was grinning nastily at her, her band of nervous-looking acolytes hanging back. They knew what was coming, and clearly the Inca thought it was going to be bad. As you well know, moron, I'm Indian, Japanese, and American. What do you want, you little jerk? She stood up and faced the girl. Belinda's gang skittered back, jabbering quietly among themselves. Inca Sardi was small, but she could launch herself with all the power of a cannonball on someone who riled her. Belinda grinned. Guess what my papa told me? He said Tyler uses a zucchini with your mommy right in her Volvo. Inca rolled her eyes. This was nothing new. It's vulva. And you're an idiot. The girls behind Belinda giggled, then stepped back as Belinda rounded on them, eyes blazing. Shut up. They shut up. Inca grinned at her. That all you got? She picked up her bag, shoved her book deep inside, and gave Belinda what she hoped was a withering look as she pushed past her. Belinda hooked a finger in the top of her t-shirt and jerked her back. Inca stumbled and the others laughed. Belinda bent down to Inca's ear and whispered, Does Tyler use that zucchini with you too, pig dog? Do you enjoy it? And Inca was on her, yelling, pounding her small fists into the girl's face and body. The entire yard came running then, most of them shouting encouragement at Inca. After a minute or so, Inca felt herself being picked up and carried off by a teacher. She struggled, still incensed, trying to get back to Belinda, who was being helped to her feet amidst snickering from the other kids. Inca Sardi. Quit it. Quit it now. The teacher, Mrs. Lindo, tried to contain the squirming child. Inca gave in, but gave Belinda the finger as she was carted off to the principal's office. 
She heard a bark of low laughter coming from behind her. She looked past the school gates to see a youth, no more than fifteen or so, grinning at her with a cigarette in hand. The look on his face said he was impressed. She gave him the finger, too, which only made him laugh harder. The principal Bill Porter, a squat African-American with a jolly face, said he was disappointed in her. He winced when Inca relayed in a dull voice exactly what Belinda had said to set her off. He sighed, but said that because of the provocation and her history, or the unfortunate incident, he was prepared to overlook the fight this time. Inca was used to people referring to the unfortunate incident. Nancy and Tyler would never tell her what it was, and Inca had stopped asking. All she knew was, it got her out of most trouble. Make no mistake though, Inca, I cannot keep making exceptions for you. Next time it happens, I'll suspend you. Take a good look at your behavior, young lady. Inca thanked him politely and walked out into the secretary's office. The school secretary was shooing a blonde woman in her thirties into the outer office. A girl of about seven, dressed impeccably in a princess costume, came skipping in. Inca returned her friendly smile, then stopped as the boy from earlier rolled around the door jam and grinned at her. Inca flushed, remembering she'd flipped him the bird. As she passed him, he chuckled again, and she shot him a glare. She tried not to smile as his merry eyes twinkled at her, but failed. Behind her, she heard Mr. Porter greet the woman. She introduced herself and then pulled both her children to her side with an exasperated sigh. For God's sake, behave. Mr. Porter, this is my daughter. You'll be seeing her in a few years. Inca turned to leave the office just as Mr. Porter asked the boy his name. The boy winked at her. Hello, he said with a face-splitting grin. I'm Ollie. Nancy was waving the paper at her angrily as Inca entered the tea house the next morning. She'd hoped to get there before anyone and had walked into town wanting the fresh air. Sleep had eluded her for the rest of the night and she'd given up trying after a while. She couldn't get that call from Mindy out of her mind. Mindy had been so sure it had been Inca who had called the guys and mistreated them. Had she done it? No, of course not. But it bugged her why Belinda would want to start their feud up again after all this time. She needed something to distract her. Taking advantage of the apartment's lack of neighbors, Inca cranked Pearl Jam up loud and cleaned the whole place until dawn broke over the town. Now, though, confronted by an obviously annoyed Nancy, she wished she'd stayed home. Have you seen this crap? Nancy shoved the paper at Inca, who glanced at it. She rolled her eyes. It's the bugler. What do you expect? She dropped the paper on the counter without reading the article. Nancy wasn't letting it go, though. The Geisha Murders. Geisha. She followed Inca into the kitchen, huffing to herself. Inca chuckled. It's a rag, Nance. They can't function without giving something a tagline. And they've no more sense or decency than to use a racial stereotype. She stopped and looked at her mom. You're going to stew on this, aren't you? Yep. Inca sighed and went to open the front door. Tomasa was waiting there, smiling at her. He kissed her as he stepped in. Hey you. How are you feeling? She tried to smile, then shrugged. Okay. These things happen. Come on in and I'll get you some coffee. He followed her to the counter. Nancy appeared at the door and squinted at him. He smiled easily at her. Hey Nancy. How are you? Boy, did you pick the wrong time to ask that, Inca muttered at Tommaso, who looked alarmed. Why? He started, but then Nancy waved the paper at him. Look at this. Tommaso took the paper, looking confused. Nancy glared at him. Don't you think it's outrageous? Nancy, leave him alone. Inca nudged her mother, who huffed. If he cares about you, then. Nancy. Inca was red-faced, and Tommaso, poor Tommaso, just looked confused. Nancy stomped out of the room. Tommaso looked at Inca. What did I do? Nothing. It's not you. Inca waved off his question. She's just in a mood. Apparently, the murderers now have a nickname that she objects to. She gave him the newspaper. 
Plus, she's always in a funk. She raised her voice slightly, grinning at Tommaso. She's been in a bad mood for the last 70 years, I think. From the back room, a voice came. I can hear you. Nancy poked her head out of the door, ignoring Tommaso. Inca gave Nancy her best cheesy grin. Nancy scowled at her. We're out of Oolong. I'm going to the market. Inca's grin widened. Okay, Geisha. She added and ducked as Nancy fired a dish towel at her. She disappeared again, and the Inca turned back to Tommaso. He was reading the paper intently. She left him to it while she poured his coffee and wiped down the tables. Hey, oldies. How you doing? Scarlet scooted into the teahouse with Luna behind her, punching Inca's arm. Guess what, Inks? Inca rubbed her arm and scowled at her young friend. What? Luna met someone. Inca raised her eyebrows. You did. It was a little unlike Luna to announce a new boyfriend. The girl usually sneered at relationships or anything lasting longer than one night. Tell me more. Luna chuckled. Nope. Not yet, but maybe if I see more of him. He's attractive. English. Inca went cold but shook herself. No way. So what's he look like? Swoony. That isn't a word. Is too. But yeah, he looks like a male model. Inca relaxed a little. Kevin had most definitely not been male model material. The handsome ones are always trouble, she said, running a hand through Tommaso's dark curls. That's so very, very true. Knox appeared at the door then and grinned at them all. We are such a rare breed. Scarlet made a gagging noise, and Inca laughed at them both. Tommaso looked up, not seeming to take in the newcomers, and instead turned to Inca. Please tell me you don't go into the city alone? His eyes were locked on hers. She smiled and nodded. Sure sometimes. She looked away from his intense gaze, feeling the burn of embarrassment creep onto her face. She moved away, but he caught her hand. I'm serious. Not at night? She nodded again, taken aback by his fierceness. He seemed to realize this and took a deep breath in. His smile was rueful. Sorry, but... He looked at Knox for the first time, and Inca quickly introduced them. Tommaso nodded at the paper. You know about this? Knox's face was resigned. Too much. It's bad. Guy's a maniac. Tommaso nodded and turned to Inca. You have to take this seriously. Please. Inca saw Scarlet's eyebrows rise. She couldn't tell whether her friend was impressed by Tommaso's concern, or... Hey. They all started a little. Ollie was standing behind them, watching. Inca smiled at him. Hey you. She felt relieved that he'd broken the tension, but she noticed that Ollie studiously ignored Tommaso as he pulled up a seat at the counter. Luna hugged her brother from behind. Hello and goodbye, bro. I have to scoot. Hello and goodbye. Loser. Dillhole. Luna grinned at him and waved at Scarlet and Inca before she left the tea house. Ollie sipped his coffee. Tommaso pushed the paper at him. You see this? Ollie glanced at it. Same as most people around here. Most local people anyways. He added, a ribbon of petulance creeping into his tone. Inca shot him a warning glance. Tommaso smirked, shaking his head. All right then. He got up to go. Inca, I'll see you later. Yes. I'll see you later. Eight. My place. Tommaso nodded, smiling, then said his goodbyes. Ollie watched him walk out, then turned back to Inca. She glared at him. What's your problem with Tommaso? Nothing. Just don't like rich guys for whom nothing is a problem. Including laying claim to the people I love. Inca was annoyed now. If I remember rightly, you didn't want this person anymore. And I'm not a possession to be laid claim to. She stomped out into the kitchen, annoyed. Taking a deep breath, she opened the back door and went outside for some air. He watched her from across the street, well hidden back amongst the trees. 
Gosh, she was so beautiful, with that long dark hair caught up in a Bessie bun at the nape of her neck, and her curves in that t-shirt and jeans. The swell of her chest, the strip of golden skin between her t-shirt and her jeans. He closed his eyes. He needed to kill again. The thought of finally killing Inca was becoming all he could think about. But once she was dead, that was it. The end. So he knew he had to keep his distance until the perfect moment. He knew how to sat his bloodlust on other women. But he liked the idea that the Inca knew he was coming for her, and that she was his ultimate goal. The suffering of his other victims was nothing compared to what he would make her endure. He disappeared into the trees and found his car, driving into the city. He would sit for hours waiting for the perfect girl, then he would follow her. He thought about the other girls he had killed. The singer had been a mistake, a risk. What was her name? What was her name? Ida. She was the only one who could lead the police to him. He had been there watching when she sang at Carmel's that day before she died. He had watched her slap that stupid, drunken man who tried to feel her body. Spirit. She had that. Ida. He remembered the look in her eyes when she realized it was really happening, her long dark hair sticking to her face with perspiration. Her fear. Oh, and she'd looked down on him, dismissed him, laughed at him. Told him to get out, disdainfully. Until she could not speak, her mouth moving aimlessly, loosely, open and shut, dying, losing control. No more laughing. Or the girl with the spider's web tattoo on her belly. He'd come across her in a deli on Fifth. She had been arguing with the insolent-looking cashier. He'd helped her out. Followed her home. Arranged to bump into her later. She'd been grateful and invited him in for a drink, looking at him with interest. So easy. An hour later, she had been slumped in her chair, looking at him again, this time in confusion as he removed her shirt. He knew she thought he was going to hurt her, and looked down at her in disgust. He had told her then exactly what he was going to do to her, that she wasn't worthy and he wouldn't sully himself on her. She tried to move or scream as he raised the knife. Then he had seen resignation as the blade plunged into the center of the spider's web again and again. He liked the idea of Inca having that tattoo, he imagined her with it as he stabbed her. He perked up now when he spotted her. Indian. Gorgeous. She looked so much like Inca that his breath was almost taken away. Sweet face, warm smile. He followed her home, almost laughing out loud when she drove back to Willowbrook, so close to Inca, and waited until after dark. After midnight with no moon, the storm's clouds painting the landscape black, the house was hushed. Footfalls, a whisper of movement. He stood over her, watching the knife in his hand. He breathed deeply in through the nose, out through the mouth. She opened her eyes and gazed up at him, still mostly asleep, not really seeing him. He smiled but said nothing. Her eyes closed for a moment and then opened again. She frowned, her face creasing with confusion. Are you going to kill me? The question thrilled him, shocked him, delighted him. He stroked her face and smiled. Yes. And he drove the knife deep into her. Tommaso stroked her cheek. You look unbelievable. He said gently. Inca flushed with pleasure. Her dress was a dark gold, reflecting on her skin, her hair pulled over one shoulder. Tommaso's eyes lingered on her mouth. Inca mio caro, how would you feel about making our relationship more official? His lips were on her throat, and Inca closed her eyes, letting all the tension of the past few days drain from her. They'd had a quiet dinner at a little place in the city, and then Tommaso had driven her back to his mansion. Raffaello is away on business, he told her with a wicked grin. We have the place to ourselves and I. He trailed his fingertips down her belly. I'm going to make you mine in every room in this house, my darling Inca. A moan escaped her as he took her in his arms now, and she nodded. Yes, Tommaso. We can talk about us. Good. He pulled his tie from his neck and grinning, wound it around her eyes. Do you trust me, Inca? She hesitated a little. Should I? Tommaso gave a throaty chuckle. Absolutely not. 
Inca laughed and felt him take her hand and lead her somewhere else. She felt a draft of cold air but said nothing as Tommaso began to remove her clothes. She felt his lips on her skin. She stroked his dark curls as his kiss touched her belly. You taste like honey, he said, his deep voice rumbling through her. She felt him stand and kiss her mouth. I want you to feel me, Inca. Feel how much I want you. She could feel him, and by the time he laid her back on what felt like a table, she was desperate for him, but Tommaso would not let her rest. He pulled her to the carpet and tugged the blindfold off, only to bind her hands behind her. You like this, Bella Ragazza? Breathless and excited, she nodded, and he gave a soft laugh. Good. Now. He rolled her onto her back, her bound hands pressing into the small of her back. She gazed up at him, his green eyes were intense, almost demonic against his swarthy skin and dark hair, gosh he was divine. His body, hard and defined, covered hers. You are mine, yes? She nodded. Yes, Tommaso. I am yours, oh. Tommaso had a satisfied look in his eyes, almost victorious. You like the pain? Astonishing herself, she nodded. From you, yes, she whispered, and he chuckled. Maybe another time we can explore that further. He smoothed her damp hair away from her face and gazed down at her. Te amo, Inca Sardi. Te amo. Inca's eyes filled with tears at the depth of passion in his voice, and in that moment her heart swelled, and she kissed him fiercely. I love you too, Tommaso. Much, much later, she fell asleep in his arms and didn't wake when he slid from the bed. For a few minutes he watched her sleep, her dark hair spread on his pillow, watching her deep, regular breathing, her skin glowing in the low light of the room. Tommaso tugged his pants on and wandered down to the kitchen. Lately he had been plagued by insomnia and nothing, it seemed, not even exhausting himself could help him. Tommaso winter knew darkness. It ate at him constantly, and despite his happiness with the beautiful woman in his bed, he found himself sinking back into the blue funk he knew so well. Only Raph knew how to drag him out of it, only Raph knew the depths of it. He called his brother now. Raffaello was in Rome, checking on his favorite and original club. Tommaso glanced at the clock. Rome was nine hours ahead of Seattle, which made it 11 a.m. He knew Raph would be parked in his favorite cafe right now. Tommaso. Hey. Everything okay? Ink is here. There was a silence. What's going on, brother? I told her I loved her. Another long pause. Oh, damn. Yeah. Raffaello sighed. Look, don't freak out. Did she say it back? Yes, but I don't know. You're freaking out. I'm not. Yet. I need you to talk me down. Stop me from ruining this. Raffaello knew his brother well. Through the damage their father had inflicted on both of them when they were young, and the loss of their mother, Raffaello had been the one to hold his brother up. And ever since then, every time Tommaso went through any heightened emotion, Raff was his rock. His anchor. They both knew what Tommaso was capable of when he felt insecure. Tommaso closed his eyes now. I don't want to hurt her, Raff. You won't. Listen to me. So you've said it. Did you mean it? Tommaso nodded to himself. I did. I do. She is everything. He heard his brother give a hiss of frustration. Tommaso, get yourself together. You barely know her. You're projecting. No. No. It's really not like that. But he knew Raph didn't believe him. He heard his brother curse softly. I'm coming back. No, no. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called you. You know me. Exactly. Let me come home and help you. There's no reason, if you really love her, that this time can't be different. Tommaso went back to the bedroom after ending the call and saw that Inka was now lying on her back, the sheet tangled around her hips. He watched the gentle rise and fall of her breasts, the soft curve of her belly as she slept. He lay down beside her and stroked her soft skin. She murmured in her sleep and turned towards him, half opening her eyes. I love you, Tommaso, she whispered before her eyes closed again, and Tommaso was glad she was asleep again quickly, 
so that she would not see his tears. The news broke the next morning, and the entire town was horrified. Jasmine Khan had been one of their own, a well-loved girl found murdered in her own apartment. Inca felt sick. Jasmine had helped out at the Sakura more than once. Inca had been glad to help her out as she studied for her college degree. Jasmine had only been 17, sweet, intelligent, and now this. Ollie looked shattered when he came into the Sakura that morning. The whole town was buzzing with police. Inca hugged her friend. Oh, Ollie. He relaxed into her embrace. It's bad, Inks. Really bad. Nancy's face was creased with worry as she looked between the two. Come sit down, Ollie, before you fall down. Inca didn't want to ask the question, but Ollie must have seen it in her eyes. Yes, sweetheart. Your name was carved into this victim, too. Inca's hands clenched into fists and her temper broke through. Then why doesn't he come after me? Why kill an innocent woman? All those girls? Just kill me. Ollie took her shoulders and his face looked fierce. I never want to hear you say that again, Inca Sardi. You are not to blame for this. Don't ever, ever say that to me again. He tried to smile to soften his words. Tyler came in then, accompanied by Tommaso, who was talking at him rather than to him. Tommaso's face was serious, and he appeared to be pressing his point with some fervor. Tyler looked rather taken aback. Hey. Inca smiled at them both, hoping to break the tension. Tyler smiled back rather wanly. Tommaso kissed her cheek. Bella. He said warmly and sat down, nodding to Ali, patting his shoulder. Chief. Guess you've had a rough morning. Ali nodded. You have no idea. Inca offered Tommaso some coffee. No thanks. Look, Tommaso began, but Tyler shook his head. Tommaso, this can wait. Tommaso frowned. Forgive me, Tyler, but I don't think it can. Nancy? He called out, and Nancy poked her head out of the kitchen. Nancy, would you join us, please? Tyler sighed and sat down. Nancy looked confused but joined them, pulling out the chair next to her husband. He took her hand and squeezed it. Thank you. Tommaso was being oddly formal, Inca thought. She had no idea what was going on and waited for Tommaso to begin. Tyler and I are concerned. He held up his hand as Tyler started to object. No, Tyler. I know you think I'm being overly cautious. But the fact is, a young Indian woman was killed here last night. We all know what's been going on in the city, and I don't think it's hysterical to suggest that in the meantime, we take precautions. Inca, please, don't go anywhere alone, especially at night. Do you understand? Nancy looked annoyed at his tone. Yeah, Ollie beat you to the punch, albeit less patronizingly. Inca coughed, interrupting her. I think what Nancy means is, thank you for your concern. She tapped her mom's arm as she was about to protest. I'll take care, I promise. I do think you can be overcautious, but, hey, it's not like we don't have people around us all the time. Tommaso shook his head. Until you are in that apartment, isolated from everyone. Inca glanced at Tyler, but he nodded. He's right. I'd feel better if... You'll move into the mansion, Tommaso announced, suddenly. It's the best solution. Inca started to protest, but he held his hand up to stop her. I won't take any arguments. Do any of you feel that this isn't the best arrangement? Do you realize how much security we have access to? No one would get near Inca. No one had any answer to that, and so Inca found herself agreeing. She would move in with the winter twins until the killer was found. Tommaso left soon after to arrange things, Ollie following him to rejoin the investigation across the street. Inca blinked at Tyler and Nancy, grinning slightly. Well, I guess I have roommates. That happened fast. Tyler reached out to pat her arm. If you're uncomfortable, you can always stay with us. Nancy nodded, gesturing towards the door. Tommaso was eager, wasn't he? A bit too eager, if you ask me. She gave Inca a meaningful look, and Inca flushed. He's just being a good friend, Nance, and he's right, he's got security out the wazoo. 
and you two really don't want me hanging around like a moody teenager, do you? Tyler and Nancy laughed, and Nancy tugged gently on Inca's ponytail. Kiddo, you know you always have a home with us. Just watch that Tommaso doesn't get the wrong idea. Raffaello was tired when he arrived back at the mansion, but he listened to what Tommaso told him in silence, then nodded. You're right. She should stay here. Tommaso was vaguely surprised. I thought you'd object. That you want to protect the woman you love? Don't be ridiculous. I don't want anything to happen to Inca either. Thank you. Tommaso turned to leave his brother's room, knowing he was exhausted, but Raffaello called him back. Tommaso. I hope that by Inca being here, you won't. He trailed off but gave his brother a meaningful look. Tommaso cocked an eyebrow. Won't what? Raffaello sighed. You know what I mean. Inca is an independent woman. She's under our protection, yes, but we have no right to dictate what she does or where she goes. Tommaso's smile faded. You think I would try to control her? Wouldn't you? Tommaso looked annoyed now. Inca is different. I know. I'm just saying. Don't get too entrenched with her that you can't see anything else. She'll feel suffocated. You think I'm suffocating? You can be. Even with your good heart, you know what has happened in the past. If Inca really means that much to you, give her space. Tommaso gave his brother a tight nod and left the room. Raffaello pulled off his shoes and lay back on the bed. It would be strange having Inca living here. Neither of the twins had ever lived with one of their girlfriends before, but then again, they'd always had each other. Raffaello had known this was coming for a couple of years now, and he was glad. It was time. They were 35, too old to be sharing with a sibling. They needed to move on, but he'd been reticent about how to broach the subject with Tommaso. Tommaso had always been the insecure one of the two. Again, Raffaello thought darkly more fall out from their father's shitty parenting. But Raffaello liked Inca and didn't want her hurt because Tommaso hadn't worked out all of his issues. For himself, he had no intention of getting involved with anyone. The emptiness within him was something he clung to, it stopped him from feeling. It had been an age since he had been attracted to anyone enough to make a move. His looks meant he could have anyone, and yet he found he wanted no one. Yes. He told himself that he wanted no one. There was no woman who could break his walls. No one. Except that when he dreamed at night, he dreamed of café au lait skin and a warm sweet smile. Inca packed everything she owned, and Tyler helped her load her boxes into his garage. She didn't want to take all of her stuff to Tommaso's mansion, despite his protests, but Inca felt she needed to have something rooted back in her old life. It was weird enough to be moving in with Tommaso. He'd cleared space in his closet, or rather his maid had, and now her clothes were hanging next to his expensive, handmade suits. The fact that she would be sharing his bed, his room, hadn't even been discussed, just assumed. Tyler saw her face as they tidied the garage up. You okay, Bubba? You can always change your mind, you know. Our offer will remain open. She smiled at him gratefully. Thank you, Popsicle, but I think this is the right move. I love Tommaso. I really do. Tyler studied his adoptive daughter. You do. Inca was surprised. Yes, of course. Why do you ask that? Tyler shook his head. It's just, you don't seem excited about him. When I fell in love with your mother, I was like a horse with ginger up its butt for the first few years. Inca giggled at the image. Lovely, Pa. I guess it just feels more relaxed than that. More. Sedate. Inca thought about it. Yeah. Like it just is, you know. Each to their own. That's what I think. Tyler nodded. He'll keep you safe. Inca stopped and then let the fear show in her face. He will. Pa. I don't understand what is happening. Why, if someone wants to kill me, why not just do it? Tyler paled but nodded. Before he'd retired, before all of this, he had been the island's police chief, 
privy to investigations and resources that he wished desperately to have access to now. The thought of Inca being a target was agony to him. I can't answer you, Bubba. But nothing is going to happen to you. I promise. Later, in the split-level duplex on Hewlett Avenue, Tyler poured himself a finger of scotch and slumped into the armchair. He heard Nancy moving around in the kitchen, the smell of roast chicken and thyme drifting through the house. She poked her head in the room. Hungry. Tyler tried to smile and nodded. Smells great, Nance. She hesitated for a moment, then walked over and sat down on the arm of his chair. He patted her leg as she kissed the top of his head. The TV flickered quietly in the corner, the familiar scenery of the town invaded by reporters from the city. They watched it in silence. Eventually, Tyler sighed. I'm worried about Inca. He felt Nancy nod. I know, honey. The reassurance he expected from her didn't come, and he felt the knot in his stomach tighten. Nancy's eyes were concerned. She sat down in the chair opposite him and took his hands. But honey, she's an adult. She's stronger than you think she really is. She's come so far and grown so independent. All we can do is support her decisions and hope whoever this maniac is that he doesn't get to her. Tyler studied her face, her dark eyes just starting to crinkle at the edges, her brown hair just starting to show fine strands of gray. Nancy Hama had come into his life at a time when he'd come to terms with being alone. After his initial adoption of Inca had been turned down, I am sorry, Mr. Sardi. The child is damaged and you are on your own, he'd slumped into despondency. Nancy had been one of the nurses at the children's unit in Seattle, where they'd taken Inca after the horror of what had happened with her birth parents. Nancy and Tyler had talked long into the night over Inca's sleeping form, her tiny body bandaged, the little crease between her brows starting to relax. Nancy was forthright, opinionated, and had the biggest heart of anyone he'd ever known. When the Inca had left the hospital, Nancy went home with Tyler and never left. Their adoption of the Inca was successful this time. He sighed. Can you believe she was married and never told us? No. And believe me, I let her know how dumb that was. Nancy's expression was fierce and Tyler smiled before sighing. I don't know if I trust Tommaso Winter. Nancy was silent for a moment. We can't interfere. It's up to Inca now. I'm not about to tell her she can't be with the man she loves. Are you? She knows the risks. He stroked her face and she leaned into his touch. What would I do without you, Pooks? She smiled, then mock grimaced. Yuck schmaltzy. Come eat this chicken before I throw up. Tyler laughed and took the hand she offered. Inca and Tommaso ate with Raffaello that night, and Inca was surprised that Raffaello was making an effort to chat with them. She hadn't thought he had it in him to make polite conversation. He even smiled at one point, and Inca was surprised how happy it made her to see him laugh. He had the same devastating smile as his brother, but somehow, because it was a rare sight, it made Inca want to cry. She decided she would try and make friends with the man, and by coincidence, that night, Tommaso apologized to her. I have to go to Paris for a meeting, he told them both, and looked at Inca regretfully. And normally, I would see this as an opportunity to take you with me, but you've already told me that you have to work. Inca nodded. I do. And believe me, I wouldn't normally turn down a trip to Paris, but I promised Scarlet the time off. Next time. She smiled at him. You're on. Tommaso looked at his brother. So? Raffaello smiled. I will be around. Inca and I can bond over making fun of you. Tommaso and Inca laughed. Enjoy, brother. Inca looked shyly at Raffaello. I have to go into the city on Friday to sign some paperwork for my mortgage application. I'll be happy to accompany you. Perhaps you can show me around the city. Have dinner too. Tommaso grinned at his brother. Raph, stop trying to steal my girlfriend. Inca winked at Raph. It's working though. Raffaello, heap it up. Raffaello smiled but looked a little uncomfortable, and Inca regretted the joke. She coughed, 
to cover her embarrassment. There's a lot of touristy things we can do in the city, and some great places to eat. Raffaello nodded. Sounds good to me. Later, when they went to bed, Inca asked Tommaso if he minded her spending time with Raffaello. Of course not, you are family. He was a little distracted, given that he was pulling the straps of her dress down her shoulders and deftly unclasping her bra. His mouth found her, his teeth grazing her and sending waves of desire through her. Inca closed her eyes and sighed happily. His lips against her belly. And in one swift motion, he had her on the bed. You are mine now, Inca, you know that? Yes. Tell me. I'm yours, Tommaso. He smiled down at her, obviously enjoying the command he had over her body. Il mio prezioso, do you remember when we talked about what we could try when we were together? Tommaso smiled, his eyes drinking in the way her body trembled and quivered under him, her belly undulating against his stomach. Gosh, you are beautiful. Well, I took the liberty of purchasing a few items we might have some fun with. Are you willing to try them with me, Principessa? His lips were on her throat when he heard her say yes, and he grinned. When they had recovered, he lifted her from the bed and sat her in a chair, before going to the closet and bringing out a beautifully carved wooden box. He smiled at her as he set it down. Before we begin, we need to set some ground rules. You need to feel safe. Inca smiled a little nervously. Just what do you intend to do to me? He obviously heard the doubt in her voice and took her face in his hands, his green eyes fixed on hers. Nothing you will not permit. Everything you will allow. He covered her mouth with his, kissing her tenderly until her head swam. Anything, she whispered to him, I'll do anything. Tommaso chuckled, then drew out a long piece of supple brown leather. You know what this is? She shook her head, and he grinned. Let me show you. Gently, he wound the leather around her body. He bound her hands behind her, and stood back to admire his work. Inca felt wildly turned on. She was helpless in front of him, but the way he was looking at her made her feel like the most beautiful woman in the world. Tommaso stalked around her, not touching her until he stopped and knelt. Her hips burning. Inca felt the pain and the pleasure as he smiled at her, before dipping his head and burying his face in her belly. Tommaso freed one of her hands. Inca slid her hand, never taking her eyes from him. Tommaso freed her from the binds and pulled her down on top of him. That was only the beginning, Inca, mio caro. He reached into the wooden casket and drew out a paddle. Inca's breath quickened as she saw it, and she nodded, yelping as he brought it down on her buttocks. You like? Gosh yes, Inca, didn't know who she was at that moment, but all she knew was that she wanted this man to do anything to her he wanted. She wriggled impatiently, and Tommaso laughed. Bad girl. The paddle slammed into her skin. Tommaso slid his hand and stroked her as he flipped her onto her back. Just a teaser tonight. When I get back from Paris, I'm going to punish you hard, Mio Caro, so hard you'll beg me to stop. The first nightmare came that night. She was walking through the mansion, the room was dark, lit only by the moonlight through the vast windows. Inca padded slowly, dressed only in Tommaso's expensive white shirt, searching for something. She opened the front door to see a world painted white by snow. She walked out into the deep powder covering the garden, into a maze of lethal-looking icicles. He was waiting for her in the center of the maze. He being who? She couldn't see his face, it was shrouded by a black hood. All she knew was, she loved him. He took her hand and led her to a mausoleum made of ice, laying her down on a long bed of ice. He raised his weapon above his head. Inca smiled as the long shard of glass in his hand was driven into her again and again. Inca woke shivering, cold, wet, and terrified. She was outside. How the hell was she outside? She was naked, curled up in the snow of the winter mansion garden, utterly frozen. Inca. Rafaela's voice was shocked, astonished, and scared. She looked up to see him running toward her. She covered herself, humiliated, but Raffaello tugged his shirt off and wrapped it around her, 
lifting her out of the snow and carrying her into the house to the kitchen, where a fire still burned in the grate. Inca felt completely out of it as Raffaello disappeared. She saw the table next to the chair, along with an open book and a glass of scotch, and realized he had been awake all night. She blinked, hearing voices, then Tommaso and Raffaello were back, Tommaso looking half asleep but concerned. Raffaello, carrying a heavy wool blanket, wrapped it around her, then moved to heat a kettle. Tommaso knelt down in front of her. Mio caro, what were you doing outside? She shook her head, feeling that if she opened her mouth, nothing would come out. I only saw her when I went to have a smoke. Raffaello's voice was soft. And only then because I thought I saw someone in the woods. I went to look and found her in the snow, completely curled up. Inca had started to shiver now as the warmth of the fire got to her. She looked between the brothers. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I was dreaming. Gosh, no, a nightmare. I must have sleepwalked. Maybe we should call a doctor. Tommaso, his green eyes full of worry, stroked her face. He picked her up then and sat, cradling her in his arms. Inca leaned against his strong frame. What were you dreaming of? Raffaello's voice sounded even more accented tonight, she thought, then pushed that thought away. She felt as if her brain were spinning, she could remember pain and love and ice end. Have you ever sleepwalked before? Tommaso this time, and she shrugged. I don't know. His arms tightened around her, and his lips pressed against her temple. Are you warming up? She nodded, but then, to her surprise, she felt Raffaello gently take her feet. They are blue, Piccolo. He smiled at her and, to her surprise, lifted them and put them under his arms. He winced a little at the cold. Our mother taught us this is the best way, human body warmth. He is right, Tommaso said. Inca leaned into him and felt a rush of love for both of the brothers. You never talk about your mother, she said softly. I would have liked to know her. Raffaello smiled. She would have liked you, I think. She was soft and sweet like you. Inca felt Tommaso nod. I agree. She passed a few months ago. I know we both miss her terribly. Mama's boys. They both laughed. Unashamedly, Raffaello said. Her feet were getting warmer now and less painful, but he made no move to release them. They must have looked strange, the three of them, but Inca didn't care. Weirdly, this was the closest she had felt to them both. Eventually, though, Raffaello let her go, and Tommaso led her back to bed, as she felt exhaustion take over. She fell into a dreamless sleep then, wrapped in the safety of Tommaso's arms. Raffaello went to his own room, but this time it was he who was haunted by dreams, dreams of Inca's body, her soft belly, her dusky skin, and her warm smile. In the dream, he found her in the snow again, but this time, she held out her arms to him, and he went into them as she wrapped her long legs around his waist. In the morning, Raffaello got up, showered, dressed, and left the house before Tommaso and Inca woke. He honestly did not know what he would do if he saw her. Merida, he thought as he steered his car towards the city. He really did not want to fall for his brother's girlfriend. Anything but that. Anything. Scarlet left Nancy in charge of the Sakura and walked down to the ferry terminal. She decided earlier that day just to go, get off the peninsula, go to the city and have fun. Things at home were too heavy right now. She was worried about Inca and the murders. As she walked, she noticed Raffaello in his car driving towards the city road. She waved but he seemed to look straight through her as he drove past. She shrugged and continued on. She liked Tommaso. He was charming, he was fun, and he was obviously crazy about Inca. But his brother was a mystery. A hot mystery, Scarlet smirked to herself and wondered if he was as enchanted with Inca as his brother. She suspected he might be. Her best friend had no idea of the effect she had on men. None, she thought, utterly clueless. Scarlet was still grinning when she got to the ticket booth. Harve, the ticket master, took her money. How you doing, young man? Still single? Scarlet winked at him, saving myself for you, Harve. 
Harv's son, Sal, a slinky-hipped blonde sitting with his father in the booth, his long legs stretched out, feet on Harv's desk, called out. Hey, what about me? Scarlet cocked her head to look past Harv, and raised her eyebrows at the young man. When I grow one, I'll let you know. Harv choked on his coffee and guffawed. Sal grinned and shook his head. You don't know what you're missing, girl, he called as she said goodbye to Harv. She turned and saluted him. I've seen unhung hero Sal, I do know, she shot back, which made Harv laugh even harder and clap his crestfallen son on the back. Scarlet waved at them both and walked up the gangway to the ferry. She headed straight for the front deck and leaned over the side. As it pulled away, she felt her spirits lift. An afternoon in the city's best fashion shops, Nordstrom's, she thought with a happy sigh, and an evening of music. Gosh, I try and escape you for one day. She turned to see Knox walking towards her and smiled in delighted surprise. Hey you. He was dressed in a dark green t-shirt, blue jeans and sneakers, casual, but she noticed the dark circles under his eyes and the slightly strained smile. Impulsively, she hugged him. He tensed for a moment, then returned the hug. Releasing him, she studied him. You look like you needed that. Rough few days, huh? He nodded and gestured towards the mainland. That's why I'm here. Going to camp out in bookshops, have some coffee, maybe catch a band later. You. She smiled. The same. Hey, there's a great covers band at the Paramount on Ninth and Pine. Suddenly, she felt shy. I mean, I'm going, and I don't know if you're sick of the sight of me, but... Knox laughed. Would never happen, Scarlet Rose. I'd like to come. I've heard good things about that place. Maybe we can grab some dinner before? She grinned. You bet. The way he said her name made her stomach flip excitedly. They sat on the deck and talked for the rest of the journey about music, books, and art, carefully avoiding any mention of the murders or what had been going on. It was late morning by the time they got to Seattle, and as they walked off the gangway onto Alaskan Way, Knox took her hand. Inca told Nancy about the night she'd had, well, the sleepwalking part, not the good part that had come before. She grinned to herself. Her thighs ached. Tomaso's marks were still on her belly. Gosh, what a night. On her break, she surreptitiously took her laptop into the back room and looked up some dark websites. She had never indulged before, but last night had awoken something inside her. She wanted to know more, try more. What's that? Inca started and slammed the laptop shut. Luna Rosenbaum grinned at her. Too late, she said and flopped down onto the couch next to Inca. Inca bright red grinned. You are a pain in the butt. And where the hell have you been? I've barely seen you since you got back. I know. I'm sorry, honey. The English boyfriend? Luna grinned. Inca studied her. So, are you over whatever I did to upset you? Inca sighed. When you came back, it seemed like you were angry at me. Luna looked guilty. I wasn't. I promise. Not really. It was just that I thought I would have to keep my distance because of you and Ollie splitting, and it broke my heart. I love you like a sister, Inks, and it killed me that you weren't together anymore. I didn't do the dumping, Inka reminded her gently, and Luna nodded. I know, and I am sorry. But seeing how you and Ollie are still good friends, I came around. I hate that you're not together, but as long as we can all get along, I'm good. He doesn't like your boyfriend, though. Inca was stung. I knew he wasn't sure about him, but I didn't think he actively disliked Tommaso. Luna looked askance at her. No. Because why would he hate his ex-girlfriend's drop-dead gorgeous billionaire boyfriend? Inca conceded that, laughing. That does sound good when you say it. But, I couldn't give two hoots about Tommaso's money, you know. I know that. The brother's gorgeous too. Luna grinned wickedly. That's a threesome I could get on board with. Luna! Inca gave a shout of shocked laughter. Don't tell me you haven't thought about it. And they're Italian too. I bet you all the money in their bank accounts they've shared a woman before. Not me, they won't. Inca felt very uncomfortable and was glad when Luna changed the subject. 
It was later when Inca was alone in the Sakura, Nancy having ducked out for a moment, that the thought came back to her, and she couldn't shake it. Raffaello. She closed her eyes and imagined him being the one making love to her, tying her up, his quiet, brooding nature at odds with the sensations he was engendering inside her. Hello, Inca. Ice flooded through her veins. She knew that voice. She opened her eyes and felt the blood drain from her face. Kevin. He blocked the doorway of the tea house. Oh gosh, no. Kevin smiled nastily and reached behind him to lock the door. Tomaso stopped at a florist's in Willowbrook to order some flowers for Inca. He hated that he was going to have to leave her to go to Paris, but at the same time, he knew Raf would make sure she was safe. There was something he liked in the thought of his brother and his girlfriend being alone together. A twisted part of him wondered if his brother would make a move on her. He had seen it in Raf's eyes last night and knew that look of old. Desire. And who could blame him, confronted by Inca's lush body like that? Of course, Raf would never take advantage, not like Tommaso. Gosh, would he ever stop feeling guilty about Perdita? Maybe he would feel better if Raf was with Inca. What the hell are you thinking? This is the woman you love. He shook himself. Still, it would be a thought that would fester. He thanked the florist for the blooms, hibiscus, peonies, gerberas and the brilliant jewel tones that Inca loved, and got back in his car. As he drove to the Sakura, he saw Nancy pounding at the door of the tea house, screaming and crying. People were running towards it as he brought the car to a halt with a screech and leapt out. Nancy. What's wrong? Nancy was beside herself. He's in there with her, he's hurting her, I know it, oh gosh. Tommaso pounded on the door and could hear shouting from inside, an Englishman's voice, Inca's screams of pain, and he went cold. He threw himself against the door twice before it caved in, and he tumbled in. Kevin had Inca by the throat, his free hand curled into a fist and driving into her stomach. Inca choked, unable to fight the huge man off. Blood poured from a cut above her eye. Tommaso, with a roar, threw himself at the man, dragging him away from Inca. Tommaso launched a fearsome attack on Kevin. The other man was completely blindsided, still staring at Inca, who was on the floor, gasping as Nancy rushed to help her. Get off me. Kevin tried to free himself from Tommaso's grip. Ollie and his deputy burst into the teahouse then, brought by the screams and shouts. Tommaso, drop him, Ollie ordered, and although half crazed with rage, Tommaso did, breathing heavily. Kevin's face was a mess of blood, his nose broken. But Ollie took one look at Inca's stricken face, and he merely put a hand on Tommaso's back. Step back now, Tommaso. We got this. His tone was gentle and broke through Tommaso's rage. He blinked then and darted to Inca's side. Nancy relinquished her daughter into his arms, a grateful look on her face. Tommaso could feel Inca's entire body trembling. Nancy gave a squeak of distress as she moved around the counter, and he looked at her. Nancy looked over at Ollie. Ollie, would you come here, please? As Ollie's deputy wrestled Kevin out of the tea house, Ollie came over. He looked at what Nancy had seen, and his face paled. Tommaso shook his head. What? What is it? He felt Inca shiver, and when the answer came, it was from her. He had a knife, she said simply. He had a knife. I'm going to cancel Paris. Inca shook her head as the doctor made a face at her for moving. He was pressing butterfly stitches to the cut above her eye. She apologized to him, but looked back at Tommaso. No, don't. I am fine, even better now that Kevin's in jail. Ollie says that, at the very least, they'll charge him with attempted murder. There you go, see? The best thing is not to let him dictate our lives anymore. Tommaso sighed. Since he had brought her to the medical center, Inca had rallied and seemed to be too okay for his liking. The doctor told her the shock would probably come later, but she shrugged. It's over, he's caught. Lay back for me, Inca. I want to check your other wounds. Tommaso closed his eyes briefly, not wanting to see the cuts and scratches on her lovely body. Kevin had tried to stab her, had come close, the tip of the knife making contact with her skin a few times, but she'd managed to disarm him before he could stab her. 
but then he'd started to choke her. Tommaso opened his eyes and took in the damage. Blood oozed from the scratches on her belly, her stomach, her arms, and her hands where she'd fought him. There was an inch-long graze on her throat and a deeper slash on her left shoulder. Gosh. The doctor was cleaning them, Inca wincing as the alcohol hit her skin. None of them are deep, thank God, he said. But perhaps a course of antibiotics wouldn't go amiss to fend off any bacteria from the knife. Tommaso waited until the doctor left them alone to get Inca's prescription. Maybe you should stay overnight. Inca shook her head. No way. I'm fine, honey. I promise. I want to be with you. Tommaso kissed her. I wish I had been there. You can't be there every minute, and it's my own damn fault for not locking the door when Nancy went out. He could have killed you. Yes. But he didn't. She gazed up at him, and he saw something strange in her eyes. Freedom. I feel released, she said, reading his mind. Like a weight has been lifted. Now I can annul the marriage and get Kevin deported if he doesn't go to jail. Oh, he'll go to jail all right. Tommaso looked fierce. As long as I'm free of him. Gosh, I feel so relieved. He stroked her face. I'm glad. Look, Ollie asked us to come by if you're up to it to answer some questions. Of course. I'm fine. Let's get it done. He pressed his lips to hers. Warrior woman. She chuckled. Hardly. You saved my life, Tommaso. I love you, Inca Sardi. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. She wrapped her arms around him. Then let's go do this thing and then go home. How you doing, kid? Ollie looked up, startled. Tyler stood at the door to the office, smiling sympathetically at him. Ollie grinned and offered him a coffee. When they were seated, Tyler pulled his cap off and scratched at his head as Ollie indicated the paperwork on his desk. Paperwork out the wazoo, and yet no one's telling me anything. It's kind of frustrating. Tyler nodded. Well, you made your bed. Yup. They sat in silence for a while, then Tyler sighed. Indulge an old man. Tell me what you got so far. Ollie hesitated, then shrugged. All we can charge Kevin Harnett with is attempted murder at the moment. I say all, though attempted murder will put him away for a good long time. But we've still got to try and tie him to the other murders. You? City Homicide has it. They came and got him this morning. He admitted to coming here to kill Inca. Sorry, he added when Tyler winced. From what I understand, Kevin Hartnett has a record for beating his women. Inca told me that this isn't the first time he's tried to kill her. Tyler put his head in his hands. She never told me any of that. Ollie leaned forward, his expression intense. She never told any of us, Tyler. Which concerns me. What if she finds herself in the same situation with? Tyler shook his head. No. Winter saved her life. You didn't see him, Tyler. He was in a frenzy. He almost killed Harnett. I would have done the same thing, Oliver. Tyler's voice was firm now. Don't let your dislike of Winter get in the way of the facts. He saved my daughter's life, and I will be forever grateful to him. He studied the younger man's expression, and Ollie looked away from his penetrating gaze. You still love her. A statement. Ollie cleared his throat. Let's get back to Harnett. We found the knife he intended to use. Look familiar? He tossed over a photo, and Tyler blanched when he saw it. That looks like the one that was stolen from me last year. Yep. Tyler shook his head. I don't understand. You think it could be your one? He sighed. I don't know. I hope it is just a coincidence. Is it the murder weapon in the other killings? Forgive me, but I'm not up on the forensics on all of them. When I talked to Homicide, they hadn't identified it. All they know is that it's not your everyday kitchen knife. The wounds are jagged but don't match a serrated or hunting knife. He gave a frustrated hiss. Man. 
Tyler was watching him carefully. Oliver, take it easy. You did your job. Inca is safe now. We can all move on. Getting his subtext, Ali nodded. Tyler, I am moving on. You've met Molly. Tyler smiled then. She's a good girl, that one. You're a lucky man. Ollie returned his grin. I know. Tyler got up. Well, kid, if you need someone to blow off steam to, you know where I am. Try to remember why you left homicide, though. Ollie looked bleak. Hard to do when it seems to be following you around. He watched Tyler walk across to the Sakura to chat with Nancy and Scarlett. The thought crossed his mind that he would have enjoyed working with Tyler as chief. Curiosity peaked, he grabbed Tyler's robbery report from the file. He read down the inventory of stolen items, cash, passport, war memorabilia, jewelry. Petty larceny at best. He shoved the folder back in the drawer, frustrated again. He wondered again if he should ask if he could question Harnett again. Gosh, when he'd stepped into the Sakura that day and had seen Inca all bloody and in pain, then watched Tommaso beat the crap out of her attacker, all Ollie could think was, that should have been me saving the woman I love, wailing on her would-be killer. He'd realized then that he was still in love with Inca. Gosh you fool Rosenbaum. You utter fool. You should never have let her go. Inca finally persuaded Tommaso not to cancel his trip to Paris. It's four days, my love. If we can't make it four days apart, then we have bigger problems. After a night of passionate and definitely kinky intimacy, she drove him to SeaTac herself and kissed him goodbye. Tommaso stroked her hair back from her face. Tiamo, Inca Sardi. She felt strange leaving him at the airport. She drove into the city and went to see Mindy, her realtor. Luckily, the tension between them had dissipated. Mindy believed her when Inca told her she hadn't been the one who was rude to the signage guys. Did you ever confront the witch? Mindy asked her now, passing Inca a mug of hot coffee. I haven't even seen her, which is why it was so weird. Ollie tells me he's seen her in town but not to talk to. If it wasn't her, then I have no idea. Still, Inca sipped the hot coffee. That's all in the past. So, I'm in the market for a new place. Mindy gave her a sly smile. From what I hear, you already have the best place in town. Inca almost spit her drink out. Holy hell. Does everyone know about me and Tommaso Winter? Mindy laughed. What do you expect? I'm surprised the Nationals haven't got a hold of it. The billionaire and the girl next door. Headlines write themselves. Inca sighed. Whatever. Look, I'm still in the market for an apartment somewhere in Willowbrook, so. Mindy patted her hand. Of course, sweetie. I've got a bunch of prospects for you. Raffaello Winter felt edgy. Two phone meetings with his investors had not gone well, but that was mostly because he hadn't been engaged in them. Snapping that he'd call them back, he hung up, then changed into his running gear and went out into the cold Washington morning. The roads were clear of snow now, most of it piled at the roadside, and he found his rhythm as he ran towards the town. He wanted his head clear to think, to try and gain some clarity on what he was feeling. But almost automatically, he found himself outside the Sakura, cursing himself for being so weak. However, when he went inside, Inka was nowhere to be seen. Hey. Scarlet smiled at him as she appeared from the kitchen. Haven't seen you here much. Raffaello, never one for socializing, thought about turning around, but he didn't want to be rude to Inca's friend. He half smiled at her. I have heard good things about your tea. Scarlet grinned, obviously his ruse hadn't worked. She's not here. She decided to go to the city after dropping Tommaso off at the airport. Raffaello had a denial on his tongue, but then shrugged. Okay. But stay anyway. I'll make you some tea or house blend. Okay. Say something more than okay, idiot. Thank you. The tea was light and refreshing. Scarlet was studying him. You are very different from your brother. Raffaello shrugged. He heard that a lot. 
Tomaso is better at talking to people than I, I find myself. How do you say it? Tongue twisted. Scarlet hid a grin. Tongue tied. Yes. Tongue tied. I feel I haven't anything to say that other people will want to hear. Scarlet nodded slowly. I'm sure they will. Inca likes you a lot, you know. She does. Of course. Scarlet lowered her voice. She told me about the night she sleepwalked, you know. Thank you for finding her in time. Raffaello felt a little awkward. Just a coincidence. He didn't know what else to say to the young woman. She went to serve a customer, and he finished his tea. He thanked Scarlet before leaving. He wondered when Inca would be back from the city. Maybe he should ask Diane to cook something for their dinner that night. Or maybe he should eat alone and stay away from temptation. He ran back home and showered, and as he was dressing, he heard a light knock on his door. Inca was outside, and she smiled at him. Just wanted to tell you I'm back. She was adorably flushed from the cold outside. Raffaello tucked his t-shirt in for the need of something to do with his hands. Good. Listen. I have to go into the city again tomorrow to go to my lawyers. They called today and asked me to go in. So I wondered if you were free to go have our day out. Gosh, she was lovely, that hair tumbling over her shoulders, the flush of pink on her honey-colored skin. Stop it. She's not yours. Of course. I look forward to it. She smiled, and Raffaello wanted to take her in his arms so badly that it hurt. Listen, he said. I already ate today, so you'll be alone for supper. I hope that's okay. No problem. I ate in the city. I'll see you in the morning. Good night, Inca. Night, Raph. He closed his bedroom door. It was the first time she had called him Raph, and he loved the sound of his name in her mouth. You're obsessing. No. Stop it. She belongs to Tommaso. She wants Tommaso. It can never be. Tomorrow they will have a good day as friends. Yes. Friends. But the next day there seemed to be a tension between them all morning that neither could understand, and when they arrived at her lawyer's office, things came to a head. Inca stared at the secretary. So you're telling me the paperwork isn't ready? The secretary looked between Inca and Raffaello, a bemused look belying the polite smile. Miss Sardi, it's not that we haven't got it ready. It's that, as I explained, you called here yourself and cancelled the paperwork some weeks ago. The implication was clear, hey nutso, don't bring your crazy around here. Inca flushed and turned away from the woman's gaze. Raffaello put a hand on her back and smiled kindly at the receptionist. Miss Sardi hasn't been well. Do you think you could reschedule the paperwork? Inca opened her mouth to speak, but Raffaello shook his head at her. It's okay, Inca. I'll sort this out. Irritation spiked in her chest, and she turned away and walked out of the office. On the street, a freezing air blew up from Elliott Bay, a faint spattering of drizzle hanging on it. Inca squinted out to Alki Point, the outline of it muzzy and undefined. The adrenaline was starting to fade now, and she felt foolish. So what if Raffaello had taken charge? He was trying to be a friend, trying to protect her. Deny all you want, the small voice in her head said. You know it's more than that. Inca shook the thought away, but her irritation remained. She felt a hand on her back and turned to look at Raffaello. He was frowning. Why did you leave? We were just dealing with. Raffaello. I'm a grown woman and I can speak for myself. Why did you think it was appropriate for you to say that to that woman? You made me look like a total idiot. Her tone was snippier than she'd intended, but she couldn't shake the annoyance she felt. Raffaello went very still, and when he spoke, his own voice was hard. That wasn't my intention, I can assure you. I was merely trying to help. Hey. She turned away from him and started walking away. He grabbed her wrist, twisting it around as he stopped her. His fingers bit into her skin and she winced. Raffaello, you're hurting me. 
His grip didn't lessen. Then don't turn your back on me when I'm talking to you. She turned back to him and nearly recoiled at the anger in his eyes, eyes that had darkened from his usual green to a dark hazel. Anger that turned to desire. They bored into hers and she felt her stomach flip, her breath catching in her throat. She froze. He dropped her wrist and took a deep breath. When he spoke again, his voice was softer. I apologize. I was just trying to help. He touched her face. What is going on today? Why is there this tension between us? She flushed, not wanting this conversation now, here, out on the street. He dropped his hand. Inca, we need to talk about what is happening between us. She said nothing but looked away, down the busy street. She felt an overwhelming need to be alone, to shake off everything and everyone in her life. An idea occurred to her, and she turned towards the city, not looking at Raffaello. I'm going to see my realtor. She didn't elaborate and Raffaello said nothing, just walked beside her. He slid a hand up her back and rested his hand on the back of her neck. It felt good, a comfort, and so she didn't pull away. A couple of blocks later, she pushed open the door to Mindy's realty office and smiled thinly at her friend. Mindy greeted her warmly. Inca rather stiffly introduced Raffaello to her. They shook hands and the small blonde woman frowned slightly. Have we met? Raffaello smiled back at her. I'm afraid not, but I am pleased to meet you now. Mindy was still frowning when she offered them a seat. What can I do for you, Inca? Not looking at Raffaello, Inca got straight to the point. I would like to see some more apartments. In the city, rather than Willowbrook. She felt Raffaello look at her in surprise, an expression that was mirrored on Mindy's face. Really? Well, that's why the change of heart. Inca's irritation suddenly went, and she felt her whole body slump. She shook her head, trying not to cry. I need a new start, a new life. And I can't do it in that town. Mindy nodded. Okay then, sweetheart. She peered closely at Inca, who felt her eyes fill with tears. She looked away from the realtor's inquiring gaze. Mindy leaned over the desk and squeezed her hand. I'll email you some details and we'll arrange some viewings next week. Inca nodded, managing to get a muttered, thanks, out before she stood and almost ran back out onto the street in tears, filled with crushing grief. What the hell was the matter with her? She dragged deep breaths into her lungs, trying to fend off the panic attack. She felt Raffaello standing next to her, but he didn't touch her. Eventually, the tension in her chest eased, and she sighed, giving Raffaello a sheepish smile. I'm sorry. I just had to get out. She sighed. Raffaello gathered her into a hug, his arms tight around her. After a second, she returned his hold. He kissed her temple. I think this is the shock from the attack hitting you, he said gently. Tommaso said the doctor said this might happen. Inca realized he was right, and her body slumped against him. His arms around her felt good. I think that's why I feel on edge. Shall we go find somewhere quiet and private to eat? We can talk or not entirely your choice. But let me take care of you please, Inca. For Tommaso. For me. For you. She closed her eyes and nodded, feeling his arms tighten around her. She breathed in his scent, clean linen and fresh air, and felt the heat from his body warm her. Why was she feeling like this? She looked up at him then, and their gazes locked. She felt a jolt run through her. I want you. Oh gosh, no. She pulled away, looking down. Yes, let's go find somewhere. She couldn't shake the feeling though. Desire curled in her stomach as he took her hand and they made their way to the nearest restaurant. Raffaello watched her as they sat at their table, drinks in hand. Inca, he said softly. I think I know what you are feeling. I feel it too. Inca shook her head. Raffaello, I love Tommaso. I do. I know. As do I. I don't want to feel like this. Raff, maybe we shouldn't spend time with each other. Not until Tommaso comes back. Perhaps. They finished their meal in silence. Afterwards, they walked along the waterfront. 
At Pier 59, Inca stopped. This is my favorite place in the city. Especially at night. The globe lamps were just coming on, lighting the lilac dusk. She leaned over the rail and looked down at the navy water, breathing in the salty smell of the bay. Raffaello moved closer to her, sliding an arm around her waist. She looked up and smiled at him. He frowned slightly. Come on. The fara is waiting. As the ferry pulled away from the pier, Inca shivered as the breeze picked up. Raffaello put his jacket around her. She smiled her thanks and looked back towards the city. I'm biased, I know, but that's the best skyline in the world. What about Manhattan, Hong Kong, Sydney? He was amused. She grinned and pointed over to the horizon. Out of the violet night, Mount Rainier rose above the city. Volcano. Big volcano, Inca said. Big volcano trumps everything. Fair point. Beautiful, isn't it? He smiled but said nothing, kissing the top of her head. There was a new possibility opening to him that he hadn't figured into his plans. Raffaello tightened his grip on her and stared out at the ocean, contemplating a future of something completely alien to him. Love. When Tommaso returned, after the initial joy at seeing her, he noticed the tension between his partner and his sibling. Inca saw him weighing up the two of them and their relationship. So, did you have a good time in the city? Yes, thank you. Raffaello gave him a rundown of their day, but Tommaso still seemed on edge. And when he and Inca were alone, he asked her about it. What's going on with you and Raff? What do you mean? Tommaso looked annoyed. I'm not blind, Inca. There's tension. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was between partners. Inca sighed. I would never cheat on you, Tommaso. But you're attracted to Raffaello. Inca hesitated. Yes. A little. I don't know why. A schoolgirl crush. But I love you. Tommaso sat in silence for a while, studying her. Inca went to him. I meant it. I love you, Tommaso. There is no one else. It's just a little blip. Thank you for being honest, Mio Caro. I'm sorry, Tommaso. He pulled her onto his lap and began to kiss her neck. Perhaps we should invite him to share our bed. Horrified, Inca pushed away from him. Tommaso. He shrugged, something dark in his eyes. Why not? It wouldn't be the first time we have shared a woman. Inca almost slapped him. She felt sick. Gosh, Tommaso, is this how you repay my honesty? You Americans are so uptight. It's not a big deal. Come on. Tell me you haven't thought about sleeping with my brother. Jeez. Inca gathered her purse and her things. I'm leaving, Tommaso. His hand snaked out and gripped her arm. Don't be silly. I was just joking. Inca ripped her arm away. Not funny. She stormed out of the mansion, down to her car, and got in. Still fuming, she drove into town and went to the Sakura. Tish was just closing up and Ollie was talking to her. He greeted Inca with a smile, which faded when he saw her strained face. Tish made her excuses and left. Spill it, Ollie said, but Inca shook her head. It's just a row. All relationships have them. Don't I know it, he said wryly. Molly and I split. Inca sighed. Oh, Ollie, I am sorry. She was lovely. Ollie cleared his throat and met her gaze. Not lovely enough. Inca looked away from his gaze and dropped her head in her hands. Please, Ollie, don't start that now. I can't do this. I'm sorry, Inca, but I have to say it. No. Inca was fierce then. You made your choice months ago. His eyes were sad. I know. I will do anything, anything, to prove to you how much I love you, how much I've always loved you. He wrapped his arms around her. She looked deep into his eyes, then pulled away and stood, her face in her hands. When she dropped them, there were tears. He went to her immediately. The thing I don't get, she stepped away from his arms, is why. There was no sign. No warning. One day we were fine, the next you were done. 
Finished. Ollie's shoulders slumped. You don't trust me. He sat back on the couch and leaned forward, his head in his hands. She waited, not speaking. Eventually, he looked up and sighed. I guess I don't blame you for that. Tyler said I'd have to prove myself. I messed up. I started to believe what my dad had always said about me. I wasn't good enough. Not enough for you. She shook her head, bewildered. But none of that came from me, did it? Did I make you feel like that? Ollie looked startled. No. No, of course not. Damn Inca. I don't know what I was thinking. The second the words came out of my mouth, I wanted to take them back. But I knew that if I caved if I let myself feel that loss, I couldn't do it. I needed to let you go. There was a long silence. Inca wiped the tears from her face. You have to understand, Ollie, my heart won't take it again. Not from you. Not again. I'd rather it ended now, today, than relive that pain ever again. He was staring at her now, the horror of understanding in his eyes. I broke you. Inca took a deep breath in and returned his gaze steadily. Yes, Ollie. You did. Ollie flinched, then nodded slowly, his face etched with pain. Tell me. Tell me how to make it better. She touched his face. You can't. I can't be any more than a friend to you now, she said simply. I'm sorry, Ollie. He nodded. It's okay. Really? I made my bed. Inca sighed and looked away, thinking of Tommaso and Raffaello. And I made mine. Tommaso watched them from outside the Sakura, and his eyes hardened. That damn cop, he had known Ali still had feelings for Inca, and now it looked like he was declaring himself to her. Would she think it was easier to go back to her old life? Tommaso knew he would rather die than let her go, but he couldn't help feeling that his ill-timed joke earlier had exacerbated this latest bump in the road. Except it wasn't a joke, was it? The thought of your woman and your brother turns you on. Tommaso pushed the thought away. For right now, he couldn't take his eyes off the cop with Inca, he obviously still had feelings for her. Tommaso smiled grimly and turned away from the view. He suddenly saw Nancy across the street watching him, and he saluted sarcastically before getting back into his car. He regretted the rude gesture almost immediately, but his mind was filled with a plan. Ollie Rosenbaum had missed his chance with Inca. Now it was time he realized it. Raffaello was alone when Inca came home that evening. Where's Tommaso? Inca asked him as she took off her coat. No idea. There was an awkward silence before Raffaello sighed. Look, Inca, I've decided to go back to Italy. Pain ripped through Inca then, and she sat down heavily. Why? Raffaello sat with her and took her hands. You know why. We cannot go on like this. I think we both need some distance from each other. It's not fair on Tommaso that I... We... Feel the way we do. Inca's eyes filled with tears, and he cradled her face in his palm. You need space to figure out how you feel. Inca nodded but closed her eyes, leaning into his touch. The thought of not seeing Raffaello every day made her feel sick. I'll miss you, she whispered and then felt his lips against hers just briefly, sweet and soft. She opened her eyes and gazed at him. His light green eyes, so like Tommaso's, were soft, full of love and not thinking, she went into his arms, her mouth seeking his hungrily. It was inevitable then. As they tumbled to the floor, Raffaello's hand was under her dress. Inca's hands were taking his underwear. They made love slowly as if drinking each other in, knowing they would soon be parted, clinging to each other, eyes locked. I love you, she whispered, knowing the absolute truth of her words, and he nodded, his eyes filled with love and pain. Anke, io ti amo, la mia bella Inca. I love you too, my beautiful Inca. Inca's tears fell then, and she wrapped her legs and arms around him, never wanting to let him go. Oh gosh, Raph. What are we going to do? Raffaello buried his face in her neck, and she felt his tears too. I don't know, mio caro. I don't know. Outside of the room, Tommaso watched them kissing. 
He couldn't distinguish his rage from his desire, nor his betrayal from a sense of inevitability. He knew without doubt that Inca loved him, Tommaso, but now it was clear that she had the same feelings for Raffaello. He wanted both to kill them and to join them. He debated going into the room, telling them he'd seen them, but no. He had a plan now, and this could wait. If Raff was going away, it would give him and Inca time to renew their relationship. He could forgive her this misstep, couldn't he? He walked silently away from the room where his partner and his brother were, and out of the house. He needed to get away, just for the evening. Needed to sat his rage somewhere else. And he knew just where. Ali Rosenbaum felt bad. He should never have said what he had to Inca, he no longer had the right. So when, the next morning, he found himself in the Sakura again, he made the point of apologizing. It's okay, Inca said, her lovely face tired. We all do stupid things we shouldn't have. He studied her the dark circles under her eyes, the wan skin. Hey, are you okay? She shook her head. No. No, I'm not, but there's nothing you can do about it. So please, let's not talk about it. He was silent for a while. Inks? I made a mistake. The words came out of her in a rush. But as soon as they were out, Tommaso Winter appeared at the door. Hello. Inca stared at him as if she'd seen a ghost. Ali nodded stiffly. There was a long silence, and then Ali coughed. Well, I better get to work. Later, Inks. Winter. Inca mumbled a goodbye, and Ali left, not looking again at Tommaso. Why did the guy get to him so much? He was Inca's boyfriend now, he should really try and get along with him. Except he stole a look back over his shoulder. Inca looked wary, maybe even scared. Was Winter taking advantage of her? I made a mistake. What the hell had she meant by that? Ollie didn't know, but he was sure as shit going to find out. But a couple of hours later, Ollie Rosenbaum was to discover that Tommaso Winter was not a man to be crossed. Not a man to be crossed at all. Later, when Tommaso had excused himself for a few minutes and Inca had had time to collect herself, she looked up to see Scarlet coming into the teahouse. Hey numnuts. How goes it? Scarlet stuck her tongue out at her friend. She indicated behind her, and Inca saw Knox and Tommaso standing outside talking. Rather, Tommaso was talking at Knox, Inca observed with narrowed eyes. She sighed to herself. A second later, the two men walked in, and Tommaso immediately walked behind the counter to kiss Inca. She moved her head to avoid his mouth on hers, his lips brushing her cheek. She smiled at him to lessen the slight, but Tommaso's eyes were cold as he pulled an envelope from his pocket. He pulled a sheet of paper from it and handed it to her. What's this? Inca took the paperwork Tommaso offered her and read it through. She looked up, startled. A restraining order? Scarlet gasped. Against whom? Tommaso smiled at them, a cool, calm smile. Rosenbaum, of course. He's been harassing us. Harassing Inca. Scarlet glanced at Inca, who looked as shocked as she felt. A couple of customers had left when the men walked in, and now the tea house was quiet and empty except for the four of them. Inca got up and handed the paperwork back to Tommaso. Tommaso, this isn't appropriate. Ali is a friend. Tommaso put a finger on her mouth. Inca, it's been more than that, and you know it. He turned to the others. I'm scared that his obsession with Inca is dangerous. Now that Kevin Harnett is behind bars, I think we have been too complacent about Inca's safety. I truly believe Oliver Rosenbaum is the greatest threat to her. Scarlet put a hand on Inca's back. Tommaso, you're overreacting. Yes. Inca was starting to get annoyed. What was he playing at? Tommaso smiled at her, but his eyes were cold. I don't think so. After all, he said, his gaze locking with Inca's. Inca is a very beautiful woman. I think a lot of men are interested in her. Inca felt a hot flood of shame. He knows. Oh gosh. I'm sorry, Tommaso. Still, I don't think this is really necessary in Ollie's case. 
He's just being a friend. Tomasa was silent for a moment, then reached into his pocket. Okay. I understand why you're reluctant to think badly of your friend. If it was just in isolation. But take a look at these. I took these over the past four nights. The photographs were dark and grainy. It was clearly Ollie in his car parked outside the winter mansion, hidden in the woods, standing at the windows. At night. Alone. Inca was speechless. Scarlet's eyes filled with tears. Tomaso looked at Inca sympathetically. He clearly has a preoccupation with you, I could tell that from the first day. What concerns me is how deep it goes. I'm worried for you. Tomaso took Inca's hand. I just want you safe. Hell. Scarlet started to cry openly now, and Tomaso squeezed her shoulder. I'm so sorry to all of you. Please understand this comes from a place of love, not control. I think he may be having some sort of breakdown. He's not thinking straight. Knox. And he turned to the police deputy. You must have noticed at work? Anything? Knox hesitated. Look, I still think a restraining order is unnecessary. Ollie obviously has a lot going on dealing with these murders. Anyone would be unstable. Tommaso nodded. Anyway, the restraining order remains. It's to stay away from me too, you've all witnessed his antagonism towards me. He bent and kissed Inca's cheek. I need to meet some contractors, darling. I'll pick up some takeout for us later. Scarlet Knox. He nuzzled Inca's ear again. Anke io ti amo, la mia bella Inca. Exactly what Raffaello had said to her. Oh gosh. She closed her eyes. When Tomasa was gone, the three of them remaining sat in an uncomfortable silence. Eventually, Knox stood. Look, I need to get to work. Inca, you want me to do anything? She smiled a strange half-smile. No thanks. Seems Tomaso's got it all covered. Scarlet and Inca looked at each other when they were alone. What's this all about, Inks? What the hell is going on? Inca shook her head. I don't know, Scarlet. But somehow, I don't think it has to do with Ollie. Look, I need to talk to Tomaso. Could you look after the tea house for the rest of the afternoon? Scarlet hugged her friend. Of course. Go talk to your man. Ollie stared at Knox. You're kidding me. Knox shook his head. Nope. From now, you are not permitted to go within 500 yards of Inca Sardi or Tommaso Winter. But, Ollie stood, obviously riled up. I'm the damn police chief. Knox sighed. I know. I know, buddy, it's utterly ridiculous. But you can't break it, or it could cost you your job. Let things simmer down. Ollie stood and thought for a long moment. She must have told him. Told him what? Ollie hesitated and shook his head. No, nothing. Look, I'll honor the restraining order, but in the meantime. He flicked his computer on and began to type. Kyle had a growing sense of unease. What are you doing? Ollie looked at him, his eyes angry but determined. Proving once and for all that I'm not the one Inca should be afraid of. Inca was sitting on the stairs, phone in hand when Tommaso got back to the house. She waved at him. He held up the bag with the takeout. She gave him a thumbs up. Sorry, Nancy. Go on. Nancy sighed down the phone. Try and listen. I'm inviting you and Tommaso to dinner tonight. It's not difficult, is it? I'm not speaking German, am I? Inca snickered. Calm down, Grandma. There was silence at the end of the phone. You are the spawn of the devil. Do you want to come to dinner, or not? Inka was still giggling when she joined Tommaso in the kitchen. He was arranging the Chinese food on plates and smiled at her. Hungry? She hesitated. Um. Um. Thing is, Nancy invited us for dinner tonight. Can we put this, and by the way, thanks for picking it up, but can we save this for tomorrow? Her apologetic smile faded as she took in the expression on his face. Irritation. Tommaso, I. 
He picked up the takeout boxes and started dumping them in the trash. She darted forward to stop him, placing a hand on his arm. Hey, hey, we can put it in the refrigerator. He pulled his arm away without looking at her. It won't be fresh. I don't like to eat food that's gone bad. His tone was clipped and remonstrative. Inka was taken aback at the petulance in his tone. She watched helplessly as he emptied the still steaming food into the trash can. His movements were jerky and annoyed, his shoulders stiff with anger. Tomaso. I don't want to talk about it, Inka. Not yet. Not now. We have a dinner party to go to. Look at me. Tomaso hesitated, then met her gaze. Inka felt desolate at the pain in his eyes. Oh, Tomaso. I'm so sorry. He held up his hands. Please, Inka, not now. Inka moved silently out of the kitchen and went upstairs to dress. She could still hear him banging around downstairs. She sat on the edge of the bed, realizing that she was shaking with shock at Tommaso's overreaction to the dinner and sadness at his obvious pain. Finally, the banging around stopped, and she heard him on the stairs. She got up and pulled the closet door open, pretending to look for something. She felt him watching her as he leaned against the doorframe. You should wear the pink dress. The one you wore on our first date. His voice was softer now, seductive. He was so changeable from one moment to the next. Inca stayed silent for a while, irritated herself now. She pulled out some fresh blue jeans and a t-shirt. She glanced at him then, her expression cool. I have to change. A small smile. Of course. She closed the door behind her and stripped off, pulling on the fresh jeans and then pulling her long hair through the top of the t-shirt. There was a soft knock on the door. She sighed. I'm coming, Tomaso. She glanced over at him as he drove them across the peninsula. His expression was normal and friendly. It was as if his little temper tantrum hadn't happened. He reached for her hand and she let him take it, feeling his large fingers squeeze hers gently. Tyler opened the door to them with a warm smile. Welcome, welcome. He hugged Inca and shook Tommaso's hand. I hope our invitation wasn't too last minute. Not at all. It was our pleasure. In fact, I insisted, didn't I, Inca? Tommaso clapped the older man on the back. Inca gaped at him as the two men moved through to the living room, chatting. Nancy poked her head out of the kitchen. Hey, small fry. Come give an old lady a hand, huh? Inca could feel Nancy watching her. She avoided the older woman's eye, but knew what she was thinking. She could feel the question hanging in the air. Tommaso's hand was on her thigh. Openly. Possessively. It was an overtly sensual move that was completely inappropriate in front of her parents. She tried to shift her leg away from him, but as they sat around the dining table, any movement would have been an obvious slight. Tyler and Tommaso were talking about. What were they talking about? Inca realized she had tuned them out a while back. Her irritation at Tommaso hadn't subsided. What was he up to? He'd been all charm, none of his early mood on display, talking to Tyler about his police career and about the property market. She meanwhile had been distracted, answering Nancy's questions in monosyllables. That's a beautiful ruby. Nancy was talking to her now. Inca touched the jewel at her throat and tried to smile. It had been a gift from Tommaso a few weeks ago, back when she hadn't slept with his twin brother. Gosh. Inca felt sick. A gift. From my mother, indirectly. Tommaso interrupted as Inca was about to answer her. He stroked Inca's cheek with the back of his hand. Made for her, isn't it? Nancy nodded, but her eyebrows knitted together slightly. You okay? Inca looked at her blankly for a second, then nodded. Sorry, yes. I. She's had a pretty rough few days. Tommaso stopped her with a hand on the back of her neck. She looked at him sharply, but he ignored her, telling them about the situation with Ollie. He's unstable. Tommaso continued. And I'm concerned for her. Tyler shook his head, but it was Inca who spoke finally, weariness in her voice. 
I can speak for myself. Ollie would never hurt me. Tommaso gave a sharp bark of laughter. Because he's displayed such appropriate behavior so far. He leaned over and nuzzled at her neck, but she pulled away from him and stood, gathering up the empty plates, not looking at him. As she walked into the kitchen, she heard him speak in a low tone. It's okay, she's just stressed. Inca banged the plates down on the counter. Who's acting like a child now? She sighed, rubbing her hands over her eyes. She felt someone come in behind her and turned. With relief, she saw Nancy balancing serving plates and narrowing her eyes at her. What's up with you? Nancy put the plates down. Inca sighed and hesitated for a long moment. Nothing. It's complicated. It's between me and Tommaso. Nancy searched her face. You need some time alone. Inca nodded. Maybe I do. They went back into the living room. Tyler and Tommaso were seated at the table. Photo albums spread across the table. Inca could see they were pictures of her childhood, age six in the children's home, at the beach with Tyler and Nancy at nine, hanging by the knees from the branch of the tree in the backyard, laughing wildly at Ollie swinging beside her. Inca's heart thudded with sadness. Tommaso smiled up at her. You were such a beautiful child. He got up and hugged her, whispering in her ear. And our children will be just as beautiful. You misheard. Tommaso's tone was light. He smiled at her before turning his eyes back to the road. Inca gritted her teeth. So now I'm deaf too. I know what you said, Tommaso. He was silent for a moment. Is it such a terrible idea? His voice was apologetic, and she heard something else in his words. Hurt. She looked away and out of the window, not answering him. The cold front had brought heavier freezing rain, and it pounded against the car now, with the headlights barely cutting through the maelstrom. For a few minutes, Inca was disoriented, not recognizing which road they were on, then realized they were on the East Coast Road. For some reason, she had automatically expected they would go back through Main Street. This road was poorly lit, and she saw only sporadic flashes of light as they passed the few houses that were visible in the trees that lined the road. Soon, she saw the lights from the high school as the road curved around the top of the peninsula. She drew in a long breath, trying to ease the ball of tension in her chest. She risked a look over to Tommaso. He sensed her glance and turned to smile at her. She could read no malice and no anger in his face. He patted her knee, but immediately drew his hand away. Tommaso, we need to talk. About us, about Raffaello. Tommaso steered the car to the side of the road and stopped it. For a moment he just stared out of the window, then he turned to her. I know. I'm so sorry Tommaso, I have no excuse. It just happened. Yes. He sighed and rubbed his eyes. But perhaps it was inevitable. Why do you say that? He touched her face. Quid pro quo mio caro. I once did the same to Raffaello. That stung. No, she thought it wasn't revenge. That's not why Raffaello, but she felt sick. How could she have been so stupid? Tommaso was watching her. You are not to blame, Bella. Neither is Raff. I got what I deserved. Inca felt the guilt weighing her down. Tommaso, I want you to know. I love you. I'm so confused about both of you. Tommaso gave her a strange smile. Do you think it is impossible to love two people at once? Inca stared at him. I guess not. No. It is entirely possible, which is why we must wait for Raffaello to come home before we decide what to do. And that is your choice entirely, my darling. Me, Raff, or both of us. It is for you to decide. He leaned over and kissed her. Now shall we go home? Later, after they had made love and Inca was asleep, Tommaso slid out of bed and went downstairs to call Raffaello. When his brother picked up, all Tommaso said was, I know. Raffaello sighed. Tommaso. Don't apologize. It's okay. I could see it coming. The only thing now is that we have to decide what happens next. I want you to think about that before you come home. He hung up, feeling wretched. 
Whatever he had said to Inca, the hurt from her betrayal was beginning to hit him now, and he felt like he was losing her. He could not bear that, and even if it meant sharing her love with his brother, that would be okay with him. But if Inca chose Raffaello over him? Tommaso didn't yet know what his reaction would be, but he knew, none of them would come out of it unscathed. Ollie ignored the terms of the restraining order without hesitation. He marched over to the Sakura as soon as they opened, and got Inca on her own. She looked tired and stressed out, and all the fight went out of him. Are you okay? She shook her head and started to cry. Ollie went to her and pulled her into a bear hug. Nancy watched them from outside the Sakura, her face set and hard. Geez, would they ever learn? Last night, after seeing Winter acting so bizarrely at dinner, she'd confessed her fears to a concerned Tyler. They had both tried calling Inca only to get her voicemail and were about to go get in the car when she called them. She told them she had discussed things with Tommaso but wouldn't say any more. Her voice had been tired, almost flat, and she had turned down their offer to come over. But they both had stayed up until the early hours, racked with concern. We can't interfere, she told Tyler. The last thing she needs is babying. We need to give her space. But Tyler had lain awake all night next to her, Nancy knew because she had to. Now, watching Inca hug Ollie, she felt an irrational anger towards her de facto daughter. She stalked into the coffee house, slamming her bag onto the counter. Inca and Ali leapt apart, both flushing guiltily. Well, isn't this nice? Nancy's voice was like ice. Ali coughed. I better, he turned to leave, but Nancy stopped him. No, you both need to hear what I have to say. What the hell are you doing? You, she nodded at Ali, are still under a restraining order. And you, she broke off, her anger too much for her. She shook her head at Inca, who quailed under her gaze. Are you trying to drive yourself crazy again? Ollie, just go, Inca said softly. I need to talk to Nancy. When they were alone, Inca held up her hands. Look, we're just trying to find our way back to friendship is all. I was feeling down and he hugged me. Like a friend. Nancy scoffed. You are hell-bent on self-destruction. Inca smiled, and Nancy was taken aback by the steel in her voice when she spoke next. Quite the opposite, she said. I'm finally realizing something. I'm not looking for Ali or Tommaso or anyone else to rescue me. I realized I had to be my own white knight. And that means taking control of my life without, and I say this with love, without anyone telling me what I'm supposed to do or who I'm supposed to see. That goes for you, Tyler, Tommaso, and anyone else. Nancy watched Inca with narrowed eyes as she moved around the teahouse wiping down tables and turning on the lamps. Outside it had started to rain, the heady gray sky packed with dark clouds, an ice storm was coming. Inca's face was drawn and she looked older, changed and broken. When the Inca had finished cleaning the tables, Nancy stopped her with a hand on her back, making her look at her. Inca's eyes were haunted, and Nancy felt a twist of terror in her stomach. She smoothed a hand down her daughter's hair. Inca, what did he do to you? He didn't do anything to me, Mom, she said, her voice breaking. I did something to him, and it's unforgivable. Nancy tried, but Inca would not tell her more. She went home to Tyler and told him what she'd said. I think she's reaching a breaking point. I really do. Knox was waiting for Ollie when he came back from patrol. The evening had settled over the island, and the ice had started to stick to everyone and everything. Ollie walked into the office, casting a glance over to his friend, who was seated and waiting patiently for him to hang his coat up. Ollie sat at his desk, knowing something bad was coming. Knox cleared his throat. Ollie, I need to talk to you about something. Earlier, I got a call from the powers that be. You were seen going into the Sakura this morning and talking to Inca, in violation of the restraining order. Ollie nodded, resigned. Yeah. So, his mind was still on Nancy's words from that morning. Knox drew in a deep breath. Ollie, they have temporarily promoted me to chief. An investigation will be pending. Ollie blinked, his mind shocked back into the present. What? 
Knox felt his shoulders tense. I'm saying, Ollie. I'm suspending you. Go home, get your shit together. I'll need your badge and gun. Tommaso called Inca as she worked the late shift. Darling, I might be a few minutes late picking you up. Inca tried to smile at the love in his voice. I can drive myself, Tommaso. My car is right here. He hesitated. You will come home, though? It made her chest hurt. Of course, my love. Of course, I'm coming home to you. She thought about the call, frowning. Why had he seemed so strange? She shrugged and went to serve a customer. Ollie slumped back onto his sister's couch and raised a beer bottle to her. Here's to some time off. Luna sighed, shaking her head. This is ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. Ollie shrugged. Honestly, sis, I'm past caring now. Tommaso Winter is in jerk, who thinks Inca is his property. Luna made a noise. Seriously, what is it with you people? She's just a normal woman. Why do you all go gaga over her? Ollie looked surprised at the venom in his sister's voice. Calm down, it's not Inca's fault. Isn't it? Don't you think she loves that attention, Ollie? You know she's not like that. Luna looked away from him, her face red with anger. She didn't used to be. Ollie patted his sister's shoulder. Sis, don't you think everyone's life would be easier if she wasn't around? Take her out of the equation and problem solved. Don't talk like that, he reprimanded his sister. Kevin Harnett nearly killed her. Do you think she deserved that? But Luna did not answer him. At 10 o'clock, Inca went to lock the front door of the Sakura. Before she could, Scarlet came racing in, startling Inca. Inca pulled her in, out of the rain. What are you doing here this late? I was with Knox and he got called out. That explains the lack of a coat. Look, why don't I give you a ride home? I'll just be a minute. Scarlet shook her wet hair. Can I help? I just have to finish in here and take the trash out. Scarlet headed to the kitchen. I'll do the trash, I'm already wet. Inca called after her. Put my red mac on, it's behind the door. Scarlet tugged the raincoat on. Inca was a lot smaller than she was, and it didn't reach around Scarlet's large chest. She shrugged, grinning. Better than nothing. Outside, ice and rain were falling in a torrent, and the road was slick with a thick coat of ice. It was bitterly cold as Scarlet dashed outside to the garbage bins and threw in the sack of trash from the kitchen. The rain soaked through her light shirt, and she tugged Inca's coat further around her. The damp material stuck to her body as she went back to the door, only to find it had closed behind her and locked. Damn it. Scarlet wiggled the handle, but it was stuck tight. Inca. Let me in. She banged on the door. She heard a step behind her and spun around. She squinted through the rain, was there someone there? There was a muffled bang, and the first bullet smashed through the center of her belly. She gasped, shock and adrenaline flooding her system. All the air seemed pushed out of her lungs. Oh gosh no. Her attacker shot her again, the bullet slamming into her chest, and Scarlet dropped to the ground, gasping for air and for life, as her killer stood over and aimed the gun at her head. The pain was overwhelming, the hot lead burning a path through her soft flesh. She put out a hand, desperate now. Please please no, don't. Please. Then, there was only darkness. Inca, hearing Scarlet bang on the door, put down her broom and went to let her friend in. As she entered the kitchen, she stopped, her heart beating hard. Under the outside door, the rainwater was flooding in at the bottom. With the water. Blood. Inca darted to the back door and pulled it open to see her friend prone on the floor. Inca Sardi took the murdered form of her best friend, and all of her systems shut down. She saw her friend, saw she was dead, but she did not understand. She fell to her knees and began to scream. Watch out. Sparks. 
If she unfocused her eyes and pretended they were sparks of light from Christmas twinkle lights, or something more calming than the endless red-blue flash of the emergency service vehicles, then maybe she would be able to bear this. No. This could never be bearable. Inca slid her eyes over to the sheet covering the body of her friend. How can you be gone? She kept hearing Scarlet's laughter in her head, feeling the way her arms felt when she hugged Inca. The smell of her perfume. Kept seeing the blood. Scarlet's eyes open and staring. Inca whirled around and threw up. She had refused to go inside out of the ice storm, and now she was soaked through and shivering. She closed her eyes and felt a blanket being wrapped around her, someone pulling her close. I'm so sorry, honey. Nancy. Knox, poor shock Knox must have called her. When Inca had found Scarlet shot to death, her screams had brought people running, and now her throat felt raw and desiccated. Inca leaned against her mother and let her guide her inside. I don't want to leave her alone, she whispered in a voice cracked with grief. Nancy kissed her head. They're taking her away now, sweetheart. They'll look after her. Inca nodded. Gosh, why was she so tired? Was it the shock? Where's dad? He went to get Tommaso. He thought it would be better for Tommaso to hear it from him, rather than let him find out via the police. Inca felt a rush of gratitude. That's good. Thank you. He'll be here soon. Mom? Yes, baby? Why is all this happening? All of it, the other murders, the weird stuff that's been going on. And now this, who would kill Scarlet? Why? Nancy hugged her daughter harder. I don't know, my darling. I wish I could tell you why. Bad stuff happens, it just seems we're on a run of it. Gosh, that doesn't even cover it, does it? But I don't have the answers you want. I'm sorry. Inca nodded, sighing. Her eyes felt like they had sand in them. Mom, about Tommaso and me. Nancy smoothed the hair away from her face. What is it? It had been on the tip of Inca's tongue to tell her about Raffaello and how she felt about Tommaso's brother, but then she faltered. Even she didn't understand what was going on between them or how she now felt about Tommaso. She did love him, she had no doubt, but could you really love two people with this much ferocity? She was saved by the arrival of her father and Tommaso, whose stricken face told her everything she needed to know about how he felt about her. She went into his arms. He kissed the top of her head. Thank God you're okay, mio Dio, razi a Dio, stai bene. Inca sank into his embrace, breathing in his comforting scent. Someone killed Scarlet Tommaso. I'm so sorry, mio caro, so very sorry. Inca saw Tyler and Nancy exchange worried looks, but she couldn't process what they meant. Just then Knox, pale, sickened, and grief-stricken, came in. Hey. Man, sit down before you fall down. Tyler steered him into a chair, and Nancy put some coffee on it. Knox shook his head. I don't believe this is happening. Inca pulled away from Tommaso and went to sit by the shaken cop. She took his hands in hers. I'm so sorry, Knox. Where's Ollie? He should be handling this, not you. Knox shook his head. Look, I need to tell you something, all of you. He looked meaningfully at Inca. Ollie's been suspended. For breaking the terms of the restraining order. Inca gasped, covering her mouth with her hands. Tommaso looked grim-faced and cursed softly in Italian. Inca looked at him, an unspoken communication passed between them, and Tommaso pulled out his phone. I'll rescind the order, he said shortly and stepped away from them to speak to his lawyer. Knox nodded gratefully. It still might take some time to get him back, but thank you. I just cannot believe this, I was just with Scarlet. Inca hugged him tightly. I know, she came over to the Sakura after you got called out, I was just finishing up. Knox nodded, his gaze fixed unseeing on a distant point for a moment. Then he looked at Inca. Why was she wearing your coat? Inca blinked. She was taking the trash out for me. Okay. Knox looked like he was about to say something else, but then a bunch of the crime scene investigators came in. 
The medical examiner shook hands with them, and Nancy fixed hot drinks for everyone. Outside, the ice storm was worsening. The medical examiner, Dr. Fielden, gave them the news. She was shot three times. I'm afraid she didn't stand a chance, poor girl, but death would have been quick. I'll obviously know more after the post-mortem. Inca could feel nausea rising in her chest again. The doctor looked at her. I believe you found her, Miss Sardi. Are you hurt? She shook her head. No. I just keep seeing her face. The doctor nodded sympathetically. Understandable. Look, I'm sure the police will have plenty of questions for all of you, but for tonight, I suggest you go home and get some rest. He glanced out of the window. I hope we all get home safe in this. It's bad out there, said Knox in a dead flat voice and the doctor studied him. I think you shouldn't be alone, Officer Westerwick. Not tonight. Come home with us, Knox, Nancy said kindly, and he nodded. Thank you, Nancy and Tyler. God. What the hell happened here tonight? How can she be gone? And he broke down. Tommaso took Inca home and ran her a hot bath. She couldn't stop shivering and clung to him. Come in with me. She lay back against him in the hot water, feeling the warmth seep into her bones. Tommaso's big, muscled arms wrapped around her, his fingers tracing a pattern on her belly. Inca closed her eyes, trying to scrape the image of Scarlet's broken body out of her mind. Her shirt had the telltale bullet holes in it, but it was the head wound that really got to her. So small, so insignificant, that tiny hole just above Scarlet's left eyebrow. So small, and yet it made everything so final. Gosh. Tears began to pour down Inca's face then, and Tommaso let her cry softly, his hands stroking her skin to comfort her. After the tears stopped, he lifted her out of the bath and dried her, carrying her to bed. They needed no words, knowing that they would be intimate, as a way of trying to ease some of the pain. Tommaso held her, kissing her gently, watching her eyes, waiting for her to start talking. She stroked his face, feeling guilty for what they had all been through. I'm sorry about. Raffaello, she whispered, but he shook his head. It's okay. It really is, Mio Caro. We don't have to talk about that now. She pressed her lips to his. I do love you, Tommaso. And I love you. But Bella, let's be honest. You love Raf too. She nodded, feeling her eyes fill with tears. I know it's incredibly selfish, but I don't know how to give either of you up. He drew his hand down her body. I think tonight has shown us that if there is no need to give something up, then maybe we shouldn't. Inca was confused. What do you mean? Tommaso gave her a strange smile. It doesn't matter tonight, Inca. Sleep now. Inca didn't think she could sleep, but with Tommaso's gentle caresses, she soon fell into a nightmare-plagued slumber. Tommaso slid from the bed and called Raffaello in Italy. He told his brother what had happened, and Raf was horrified. Is Inca okay? Tommaso sighed. No, Raf, she's not. Come home. She needs you. Raffaello hesitated. I don't know if I can. You can. Tommaso's voice hardened. You can and you must. We have done this to our girl. We made her fall in love with us. We must be there for her now. Both of us. Both. Yes. There was a long pause before Tommaso heard Raffaello's sigh. I'm on my way. Ollie Rosenbaum was woken by a telephone call from his boss and told he was reinstated, effective immediately. He didn't find out about Scarlett's murder, though, until he flicked on the television as he ate his breakfast. He lost his appetite immediately. Rushing down to the Sakura, he found it surrounded by crime scene tape and deserted by everyone except journalists. At the rear, he saw blood frozen to the ground and felt sick. He felt confused, sickened, and lost. Not knowing what to do, he went to the police station where he saw Knox. He hugged his friend tight. I'm so sorry, man. Knox gave a tight nod. I just want to find who did this. What have we got so far? He filled Ali in. The thing I keep coming back to is. Scarlet was wearing Inca's raincoat. 
What if the killer was targeting Inca and not Scarlet? Ollie felt sick. A possibility, but you and I both know that killers rarely change methods. The guy threatening Inca, if it wasn't Kevin Harnett, always stabbed his victims. So, if Inca was the intended target, then it was probably someone different, and more worryingly, it was someone who knew her well enough to know that it was her coat. It's just a plain raincoat, right? Knox considered. You might be right. He's not. They both turned to see Inca, flanked by Tommaso Winner, at the door of their office. Inca was pale as she stepped into the room, her phone in her hand. She looked down at it as she read out what was obviously a text message. I thought she was you. That's why I ended her pain. If it had been you, like it was supposed to be, you would have gotten all six in your belly, so that you would have suffered what you deserve. You're going to die soon, Inca, and no one can save you. She handed the phone to Ollie, who read it back and shook his head. Inca looked at Knox, her eyes full of pain. It should have been me, Knox. I'm so sorry. I wish it had been me instead of Scarlet, I would give anything to change places with her. Tommaso gave a choked, distressed sound, and she turned to him, putting a hand on his chest. Knox got up and put his hands on her shoulders. It shouldn't have been either of you, Inks. We'll catch the man who did this. I promise. Ollie nodded, but Inca noticed he didn't look at Tommaso once. It was as if he didn't exist. We'll get him, Inca. Can you stay a while? We'd like to ask you some questions. Of course. Tommaso, who ignored Ali too, kissed her cheek. Darling, Raf is flying in from Italy this morning, I'll go pick him up. Stay here until we come for you, okay? To be safe? He looked at Knox, who nodded. Don't worry, Tommaso. She'll be safe with me. Ollie waited until Tommaso had left before speaking again. So, why would he drop the restraining order? Knox gave him a warning look, but Inca sighed. He realized he'd overreacted, and given the situation last night, he thought you being suspended was not helpful. Ollie rolled his eyes, and Inca half smiled at him. He backed down, Ollie. Now you have to do your bit. Ollie held his hands up. Fine. Now let's get some coffee and talk. Raffaello hadn't slept on the flight back to Seattle. All he could think of was Inca lying dead on the freezing ground, riddled with bullets. What was it about her that made men's bloodlust flow so vehemently? Lust. Desire. Jealousy. Speaking of which, what had Tommaso meant? She needs both of us. Was he really suggesting they share Inca? That's exactly what I mean, Tommaso said an hour later as he turned the car towards the city and pulled away from the airport. Obviously it's up to Inca, but if she wants both of us, I want to make sure she is given every chance of happiness. Raffaello studied his brother. Tommaso, have you been taking your medication? Tommaso half smiled. This is not that, Raff, I promise. Nor is it some kind of masochistic act of self-sabotage. We just need to think differently, and not care about what society thinks. We are both in love with Inca, she is in love with both of us. Should she choose one of us over the other, we'll deal with that later. Until then? Are you talking about sleeping with her? Both of us. Tommaso nodded, looking faintly surprised. Of course. It wouldn't be the first time, would it? Raf turned away from his brother's intense gaze. So this is about Perdita? No. Tommaso's voice softened. It's not. Come on, Raf. How many times have we taken women back to our bed? Once or twice. And those women meant nothing. Inca is everything. And Raffaello could not argue with his brother. Inca looked over to the Sakura. She could not imagine ever going back to the place she had spent the last few years trying to make a success. Not now. She felt desolate and empty. Suddenly, she was grateful that someone else had bought the apartment under her, knowing she was sleeping above the place where Scarlet was murdered. No. I couldn't. Thank God Tommaso insisted she move in with him and Raffaello. 
She couldn't help feeling a little excited that Raph was coming back from Italy. She felt like she was tumbling from a tightrope all the time now, and only Raph and Tommaso could hold her up. Someone hated her enough to want to kill her, and if it hadn't been for Tommaso and Raffaello, she might have been tempted to give herself to her would-be killer to stop others from dying. A part of her still wanted that. Inca looked around the quiet police office. Ollie had gone to speak to the cops working the homicide, and now she sat alone with Knox. Her friend looked shattered, and she realized he could not have slept at all. I'm sorry, Knox, she said in a soft voice, and he half smiled at her. Stop saying that, Inks. It's not your fault. He reached over and took her hand. We've gotten in touch with Scarlet's parents, they're coming down from Everett now. Inca shook her head. Gosh. I can't imagine. Yes, you can. We can all imagine what they're going through. Yeah. Knox was studying her. Did you get checked out at the hospital, Inks? I wasn't hurt. Not physically, but... He was interrupted by the arrival of Tommaso and Raffaello. Inca felt her face burn when she saw Raff, and his eyes fixed on her soft, concerned. Tommaso had heard what Knox said. We'll ask our doctor to take a look at her. Inca felt irritated. I am here, you know. Tommaso half smiled. Sorry? Look, are you free to go? We need to talk to you. Both of us. Knox nodded. Inca's been very helpful. Inca hugged him. Knox, go to Nancy's and get some rest. I will. Thanks, Inks. The fires were lit when they reached the winter mansion, and Inca was glad of the warmth. Outside, the snow had begun to fall heavily, with blizzards predicted, so the house had been preparing for possible isolation. All the staff had been sent home to their families. Raph poured them all a glass of warming scotch, and Inca pulled her legs up under her as she watched the two brothers silently move around the room. You said you wanted to talk to me. Tommaso glanced at Raph, who gave the smallest nod. We do. After everything that has happened, this may not seem the time to talk about the three of us, but I think we need to. Inca looked at Raph, her heart pounding a little. You think so, too? I do. She sat forward, still nursing the glass of scotch, feeling her skin burning. She hesitated a moment before saying in a quiet voice, Don't ask me to choose between you. Please. Anything but that. We're not. We're both saying it could be the three of us. No one need know. Personally, I don't care what anyone else thinks, but I know you might. But this thing could stay between us. Inca looked at Tommaso, trying to tell if this was a test or not. Somehow, she didn't think so. Her heart was banging hard against her ribs. She looked at Raffaello. How would this even work? Raff hesitated, then gently placed his glass down on the table and held out his hand. Why don't we show you? Inca felt as if she were in a dream as the brothers both moved toward her. Was she really going to do this? The fire crackled in the grate as Raffaello bent his head to kiss her mouth, and she felt Tommaso's fingers at the zipper of her dress. Then as he pulled it down, his lips against her spine. She closed her eyes, breathless, tangling one hand in Raffaello's chair. Raffaello took off her dress. Oh my, she whispered as they took her over, losing herself in the sensations shivering through her body. Raffaello buried his face in her belly. Tommaso reached around and caressed her, his thumbs strumming a relentless beat across her body. His mouth was on Inca's neck. Hours passed, and when finally they all collapsed, utterly spent but still wrapped around her, Inca knew she would do anything with and for these two men. How on earth could it hurt anyone when it felt this good? I don't believe it. Luna Rosenbaum's voice was little more than a whisper as Ollie told her the news. Her entire body was trembling, and she had to sit down. Her ice-blue eyes were red, and she wouldn't look at her brother. Ollie reached over to hug her, but she moved away and slumped into her sofa. Gosh. He sat down next to her. I know. Homicide is going to be all over this, but Knox and I will be working on it too. We'll get the creep. Luna dropped her head into her hands for a long moment. 
It's her again, she said in a muffled voice, getting people killed. Ollie frowned. Who? Inca. Who else? Ollie let his sister rant on for a little while before putting his hand on her arm. Enough now. You know as well as me that none of this is Inca's fault. I don't want to hear it anymore, Luna. I'm serious. Right now you're hurting, we all are, Inca included. And that girl loves you, Luna, don't forget that. Luna stopped and looked at him with an unreadable expression. Then she sighed. I know. Sorry. It's okay just don't lash out. Inca's got enough going on. And I don't need to remind you that she's saved your life on more than one occasion. Okay, okay. Luna waved her hands in the air to stop him talking. I'm sorry. I'm just... Gosh, poor Scarlet. I know. Look, I'm bushed so I'm going home. Can I trust you enough that you won't go looking for Inca to start a fight? Luna gave her brother an annoyed look. Of course not. Look, it's a blizzard out there. Why don't you stay? Ollie shook his head. I'll be fine. Luna lay down on the couch and closed her eyes. Sleep evaded her, the pain in her chest overwhelming. Luna Rosenbaum rarely cried and rarely let her guard down, but tonight she let the tears come, sobbing quietly into the pillow until she was exhausted. She got up and walking into her little galley kitchen, splashed water on her face. She glanced out of the window over to the police station. She knew Knox was working tonight. Luna grabbed her phone and tapped out a text. Seconds later, her phone beeped. Come on over. She smiled, tossed a coat over her pajamas, pulled rubber boots on, and scooted down the stairs out into the storm. As she pushed open the door of the police station, she could feel the tears start again. Inside, Knox took one look at her face and held out his arms. In the morning, the snow was five feet deep. Raffaello and Tommaso lit fires to keep the big house warm, and they sat in the kitchen, the three of them cooking and eating and talking. Inca felt as if she should be. She didn't know, embarrassed, ashamed, but she didn't feel that at all. It was so natural to be with the two of them, laughing and talking. It was as if the storm had come at just the right time, and looking out of the window now at the whiteout, she imagined the rest of the world had gone away. Maybe in this world Scarlet is still alive, she thought, and tears sprang into her eyes. What is it, Mio Carl? Raffaello had seen her tears, and as they spilled down her cheek, he swept them away with his warm fingers. They were alone. Tommaso had gone to take a shower after breakfast. Raffaello pulled her into his arms, and she tilted her head back for his kiss. I love you, she whispered to him, and he smiled, his gaze intense on her face. Te amo, Inca. Tommaso came back in with his wooden box of treats. He smiled when he saw them. Good. He drew the supple leather strips from the box. Here's what we'll do. Inca, I'm going to tie you to the chair. Raph, you will do to her what I tell you, if I decide you both need punishing. Raph laughed. I'm game. Inca. She nodded, sighing happily as Tommaso crisscrossed her body with the leather strap and tied her hands behind her back. Inca felt her hips burn. Tommaso stopped and stared at her. Gosh, look how beautiful you are. Tommaso walked behind her, pulled Inca's head back, and kissed her roughly. Inca mio caro, do you trust us? She nodded, hungrily kissing him as Raph continued his ministrations to her. Tommaso smiled. You know the safe word. He whispered. If you want us to stop, just say it. I'm going to try a few things. If you don't like any of it, say so immediately. I will. Exhausted, Tommaso freed her from her bonds, and the brothers stroked her as she caught her breath. Afterward, she started to laugh, and they looked at her curiously. I'm sorry, she said, but this is like some kind of weird fantasy palace. Raffaello grinned. But very real, my love. She put a hand on both of their faces. I love you, both of you. You have changed my life. I'm just scared that when the snow outside melts and the world is able to get in, our little bubble will burst. I'll have to go back to work, wherever that will be, go back to see my parents, my friends, and try and keep this, us, a secret. 
Tommaso shared a glance with Raf. In Italy, it would not be such a big deal. No one knows you there. He drew his fingertips down her belly. Isn't that right, Raf? Right. Inca looked between them. Why do I feel like a conversation has been had that I wasn't part of? Raf grinned sheepishly. I was just saying to Tommaso last night, we cannot reasonably expect no one here to find out what we have been doing. It's like you said, once people are able to see us again, they'll know. Inca felt sadness. I don't want this to end. Neither do we, which is why we thought up a plan. You said you didn't know if you could work in the Sakura again. Here's our plan. Sell the business. Come to Italy with us for a year. There, we have a home in Sorrento, set high on the hillside. Completely secluded but with views of Naples and, of course, Vesuvius. Inca's heart began to thud in excitement. She propped herself up on her elbows. The fact that she had two beautiful men naked on either side of her didn't escape her attention, but something else was bothering her. You would be our guest, Inca. Our friend and our guest. Anything else is nobody else's business. You would be able to regroup there and decide on your next move. Inca smiled at him. It is tempting. Tommaso chuckled. Then it is decided. And anyway, he glanced out at the snow still battering the huge windows. I am so sick of seeing this white stuff. I need the sun. He had no idea where Inca had gone, but he assumed wherever she was, she would be sleeping with somebody. Stuck in Willowbrook, it irked him that he could not kill when he needed to. As soon as he was able, he risked driving into the city. Luckily, although the roads were still treacherous, the snowplows had cleared the main highway into the city, and he immediately drove to the only place he could think of where there would be plenty of people and plenty of opportunities. The hospital. He chose the biggest in the city, he knew the layout, knew the dark places. Knew where the staff and patients came out to grab an illicit smoke. He had to wait a couple of hours before he saw her, and when he did, he almost laughed out loud. She was the most similar yet. She had Inca's soft features, a sweet smile, and long dark hair. He took her as she passed the alleyway where he was hidden, and he smothered her until she lost consciousness. He ripped her uniform open, and because she was already unconscious, he started by carving Inca's name on her stomach, gouging the words deep into his victim's lovely skin. He had already decided that he couldn't wait much longer. Inca would die soon. Very soon. She would bleed to death slowly from the damage his knife would inflict on her glorious body. He would make sure she suffered every moment and felt every inch of the knife that would tear through her tender flesh over and over. Her name carved, he waited for this girl to come around, and when she did, her eyes widened in terror. The pain hit and she opened her mouth to scream as he plunged his knife into her abdomen. When she was dead, and she died disappointingly quickly, he sucked in a few deep breaths. Inca. I'm coming for you. He closed his eyes and thought about her body the honey skin. She would beg for her life, but he would not listen. Soon Inca soon. Inca was right of course. The bubble did burst, and spectacularly so. A week later, the snow had almost completely disappeared, and the mansion staff came back to work. They would find no trace of the debauchery that had preoccupied its three occupants for the last week. Tommaso had business in the city one day, and try as they might, Inca and Raffaello could not find a moment to themselves as the house filled with tradespeople and staff. Raff looked at her regretfully as yet another almost tryst was foiled by the chef asking him when they would like dinner served. Raff stole a kiss as the chef turned her back and Inca grinned. Raff nuzzled her nose. Wait until we are in Italy. We need not pretend there, Mio Caro. Two days after the snow melted, Tommaso drove Inca to her parents' house, and Nancy hugged her daughter tightly, smiling at Tommaso. Thank you for looking after her. Have you been okay? Inca looked at her mother's wan face, but Nancy nodded. It's just a cold. Don't worry, your father's been caring for me. Look, have you been into town? Seen Ollie? Inca looked surprised. No, why? Nancy sighed. 
You'd better come and sit, and I'll call him. He should be the one to tell you. He has some questions. She looked at Tommaso. Dear, would you mind leaving Inca with us? Tommaso nodded, his eyes curious. Of course. Inca saw him to the door. I'll tell you what's going on later, she said in a low voice, kissing him goodbye. When he'd gone, they waited for Ollie. Inca tried to quiz Nancy, but her mother wouldn't tell her what was going on. Inca realized Nancy's wan face must have something to do with what Ollie had to tell her. Somehow Inca knew she wouldn't like whatever he had to say. She suddenly felt anxious. Mind if I do some baking? It always relaxes me, and I have a feeling I'll need it. Nancy nodded, her eyes sympathetic. Go ahead. Inka went into the kitchen and began to pull together the ingredients for muffins. She had the feeling her bubble of happiness was about to be pricked and burst. Ollie opened the door to the kitchen and walked in, closing it behind him. Inka came out from the pantry and stopped when she saw him. A flash of distress crossed her face when she saw his grim expression. Hi. She looked away from him, grabbing a mixing bowl and dumping some flour into it. Ollie leaned back against the door. I've got to talk to you. Okay. About Tommaso Winter. She stiffened. What about him? He's not a good person, Inca. I don't want you around him. She slammed the bowl down. Geez. Really? It's getting really old, Ollie, really very old. He saw tears in her eyes. Please, Ollie, just go. He took a deep breath in. Just listen to me, there was a murder in Seattle last night. The victim was stabbed to death, no motive, no robbery. Her body was found on the grounds of the hospital. She. Inca, she looked just like you. I did some digging. He put a piece of paper down on the counter. Seventeen women of Asian descent murdered over the last few years, and guess who was in the cities when the women died? That's right, Tommaso Dario Winter. All of the women were repeatedly stabbed in the stomach, some of them disemboweled. Like your birth mother. Like Jasmine Khan. All the women look like you. Inca was staring at him, her mouth open. I don't believe this. I don't believe you. Have you actually gone insane? Inca. No. No. Shut up. Just shut your mouth. Tommaso's harmless. He's been a good friend to me. Both of them have. And you come in here and accuse him of, are you actually insane? Do you have any proof he has committed any crime at all, let alone slicing and dicing some women who, gosh, happen to look like me? Do you know how many Asian people there are? Lots of them look like me, and some of them get murdered. But somehow, this translates into Tommaso Winter is going to kill me. Ollie winced. I'm just trying to protect you. She threw the mixing bowl against the wall, shocking him with the depth of her distress. You don't get to do that anymore, do you understand me? You don't have the right. Ollie ached at the anguish in her voice. He reached for her, but she backed away from him, hurt in her eyes. Just stop it. This isn't fair, Ollie. I can't. She put her face in her hands, and he heard her sob. Just once. Please, Ollie, you have to stop. I can't just stop caring about you. I can't stop it. I love you. No. You don't get to say that to me again. Ever. She was angry now. More than that. Furious. Gosh, I was so stupid to think, to let myself hope we could still be friends, but you're making it impossible. She was sobbing now, and Ollie managed to get his arms around her. Inca struggled with him, but he wouldn't let go. She went limp, burying her face in her hands. You can't just hold me and think that it's going to make everything okay. I won't let you do this to me again. You've broken me, Ollie, and you can't fix me this time. He let her go then, her words cutting into him, fracturing what was left of his heart. Please go. She turned away from him. Ollie's throat was closed, his shoulders slumped. I'm sorry. 
She looked at him then, and he saw the heartbreak and the endless loss in her eyes. It's not good enough. After he left, Nancy quietly slid back into the kitchen. Inka was still crying, albeit silently, and her mother wrapped her arms around her. It's okay, darling. There was a knock at the back door then, and Nancy opened it to see Luna outside. Hi, she said uncertainly. Nancy pulled her out of the cold. See if you can cheer Inka up. Your brother's just upset her. Luna's mouth formed a line, but she rolled her eyes. That's what he's good at. I'm okay, Inka said shortly, wiping her eyes. She didn't look at Luna. There was an awkward silence, then Luna looked at Nancy. Look, Inks, why don't you stay with me tonight? I bet you could do with a girl's night in for a change. Although I know it must have been hell trapped in the luxurious mansion with those two gorgeous billionaires. Inka looked sharply at her old friend, then realized she was grinning at her. She smiled and rolled her eyes. Utter hell. Luna shifted her weight to her other foot. Well, what do you say? Chili and a friend's marathon like the old days. Inka smiled. That sounds good to me, Loons. Don't call me that. Is that okay with you? She looked at Nancy, who shrugged. Fine with me. I'm not Inka's keeper. Will Tomaso be okay with it? Inka bridled a little. Of course. He's not my keeper, either. Just kidding. Geez, you do need to chill out. Sorry. Inka tried to relax, and tried to forget about the scene with Ollie. Luna let her off the hook for a while, distracting her. They chatted about work as Luna flitted around the tiny kitchen of her apartment, throwing together the makings of a red-hot chili. They balanced their plates on their laps as they ate, watching reruns of Friends. Inka felt the tension of the day leave her. She helped Luna do the dishes after, and then they collapsed back on the couch. Okay. Luna grinned slightly as Inka rolled her eyes, then reached over to squeeze her hand as she saw the exhaustion in her friend's eyes. Inks, I'm sorry, but you need to talk to me. I feel like you've been withdrawing from me since Tommaso, and I think Tyler and Nancy feel the same way. The only person you seem to have time for is Tommaso or his brother. You really at the living with stage with him already? Inka pulled her legs up to her chest. I'm not living with him if that's what you're asking. It was just a matter of safety, then we got snowed in. Seems like it. Sure he doesn't think you are officially living together? Inka rubbed her eyes. I don't know. She winced at the fake sentiment of her reply. You know what Tommaso wants. What Raffaello wants. What you want. She got up and paced around the living room. I just want to get on with my life, sell the business, move. And she turned away from Luna then, move away. I can't move on here with Scarlet's murder, and how things are with your brother. She heard Luna's distressed gasp, but when she turned back to her friend, Luna's face was hard. So, running away. Inca sat back down next to her. No. Well, not exactly. I'm going to Italy with Tommaso and Raffaello for a while, she added, seeing Luna's expression. Just getting my shit together is all. Mentioning her trip, she thought about what Ollie had said earlier. Luna, you've met Tommaso and seen us together. Do you honestly think Tommaso would try to kill me? Or be capable of murdering all those women? I don't know. But I don't think a little distance is the worst idea. And for some reason, Inca felt a wave of terror at her friend's reply. She shook her head, staring at her friend's pale face. I don't believe you. She got up from the couch and paced around, trying to keep calm. Luna watched her in silence, gnawing on her bottom lip. I know, Inca. I know he's my brother and I have to side with him, but there's something about those twins. Both of them. Both of them seem like they're obsessed with you. Inca felt her face grow hot, and she looked away from Luna's penetrating stare. Oh my. Luna breathed out a long, shocked breath. You're sleeping with both of them. Shut up, Inca hissed as if anyone could hear them. It's not like that. Except it was. It was exactly like that. She sat down and put her head in her hands. 
What have I become? I have to say, I'm impressed. And Luna really did sound it, to Inca's amazement. Of everyone I've known, you are the last person I would expect to do that. Can we please not talk about my private life? Inca was trembling now, and Luna put a hand on her arm. Inca, it's okay. But maybe we shouldn't tell anyone. Especially not Ollie. Inca listened to her in silence, staring out of the window over to Ollie's house. The light from a TV flickered at the window. Otherwise, the house was still. Luna watched her. Finally, Inca looked at her, and her eyes were cold. Tommaso would never hurt me. Ever. Luna hesitated. Ollie's been watching your house. We know this. He's crazy jealous of Tommaso. Would he have seen anything? Her voice trailed off as Inca flushed bright red and dropped her gaze. Luna gave a little gasp of distress. Inca. I don't see how Ollie could have seen us, but you never know. I still don't believe Tommaso would hurt me. I never will believe that. I'd rather believe Ollie would be the one who. Luna looked as if she would be sick at any moment. Inca went to her and put her arms around her. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. You have to stop worrying about me. It's not your responsibility. I can look after myself. Your brother is a mess, yes, but he's not violent. Luna pulled away from her. I think you're blinkered when it comes to Tommaso. Ollie wouldn't have said anything if he didn't have reason to believe what he said. Inca went very still. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Inca slowly reached down to grab her purse. I think I should go. Luna turned away from her. Well, that's your thing, isn't it? Like I said, running away. When Inca, still upset over the row, got back home, Nancy and Tyler were out, and she breathed a sigh of relief. On the drive home, she tried to make sense of the row with Luna. Inca felt bad, her friend was obviously conflicted and she hadn't helped any. She parked the truck and pulled out her cell to call Luna. No answer. She considered leaving a message, then ended the call. She'd apologize in person tomorrow. Alone in the house for once, Inca reveled in the solitude, stripping the linen from the bed, gathering together dirty clothes and towels, loading up the washer, breathing in the scent of the detergent. She cleaned her bedroom, noting while she did the things that had changed without her noticing. A photo frame missing, books, records taken from the shelves in her room. She scanned the collection of vinyl that she had collected over the years, trying to see if they were just out of place. She frowned, trying to remember if she'd loaned them to anyone or if Nancy had been donating stuff to Goodwill without telling her. It seemed unlikely. Sighing, she sat down on the bed. Should she call Tommaso or Raffaello and tell them to come get her? No, she needed a night away for her body to recover, if nothing else. And besides, if she was going to go to Italy soon, then she wanted to spend some time with her parents. And her friends. Ollie. She shouldn't have lost her temper with him. She would go see him in the morning and apologize, but warn him off Tommaso. She knew in her bones that he would never hurt her, or anyone else. What about himself? Inca pushed that unbidden thought away, not knowing where it came from. When Nancy and Tyler came home, she spent the evening with them before turning in. When she went to bed, she fell asleep almost immediately. Raffaello knocked on Tommaso's door. His brother was sitting up in bed, reading something on his laptop. He pushed his headphones from his head as Raff waved at him. Just wanted to say good night, brother. Tommaso smiled. Good night, Raff. It seems strange without Inca here, doesn't it? Raffaello nodded. It does. Well, good night. Raffaello went back to his own bedroom and stripped. It did feel strange without Inca in his arms, or at least in his bed. Verbed. He had to admit, their three-way. Arrangement seemed to fit them so naturally. What pleased him even more was that Tommaso seemed more stable than ever, despite the weirdness of the situation. Raffaello lay back and closed his eyes. Straight away he saw her lovely face and imagined her skin next to his. 
I love you, Raffaello. He heard her voice as clear as if she were here now. He couldn't wait until they were in Italy and free to love each other without the fear of stigma. Raffaello had never felt as wiped out by love as he had felt for this woman. He was still smiling when he fell asleep. Down the hall, Tommaso sat up and re-watched the same piece of video over and over again. It was the day they had indulged in tying Inca up, but the few seconds he was watching were of Raffaello making love to her. Tommaso couldn't figure out why watching his brother sleeping with the woman they both wanted turned him on so much, but it did. The complete domination over her body. Tommaso watched the scene over and over. He went to the bathroom to clean up, and when he caught sight of his disheveled sight in the mirror, he almost crumpled. His green eyes were heavily circled with dark shadows, his complexion that of a heavy drinker, which he wasn't. Puffy and seedy. The face of an addict. What the heck is wrong that you get turned on to videos of your brother and your girlfriend? Mio Dio. Tommaso Winter sank to the floor and put his head in his hands. What is wrong with me? What the hell is wrong with me? The next morning, Inca knocked at the door to Ali's apartment. No answer. She knocked again and pressed her ear against the door to try and hear if the shower was running. It was early, she realized, maybe he was still asleep. She was about to knock again when the door opened. She jumped back a little and gave a nervous giggle. He had a towel wrapped around his waist. Ollie blinked, then smiled. Hey, what are you doing here? He laughed and shook his head. I'm sorry. I mean, hi, come on in. Inca smiled, a little taken aback. She'd expected him to be withdrawn, maybe a little cold. He waved her in, shoving a pile of dark clothes off the bed for her to sit. I'm sorry to interrupt you. She glanced down at his towel, then reddened. Hey, no, look, you're not. But do you mind if I just hop in the shower? I just worked out. I'm all sweaty and gross. She waved him away. You go ahead. He grinned and went into the bathroom. Anyway, this is a nice surprise. How are you? Inca blew out her cheeks, relieved the awkward atmosphere she'd feared was nowhere in sight. I'm good. Look, I wanted to apologize for last night. There was a small silence, and then Ali stuck his head out of the door and smiled at her. Let's forget it. We were both, well, emotional. Friends? Of course. He grinned and disappeared again. It's me who should be apologizing. She heard the shower crank on. I was a jerk. Forgive me? Of course. She heard him chuckle, then the door closed. She shifted on the bed, looking around the room. It was untidy. Clothes were strewn everywhere. Inca realized she had always thought of Ali as so organized. The mess surprised her. The window was open, a cold breeze blowing the curtain. She walked over to the window. The room on the first floor had a view out to the forest, the trails marked. She saw a couple walking their dog and a jogger or two. On the other side of the woods was the beach, and she stood on her tiptoes, trying to see if she could see the water from there. Nope. She moved away from the window, and her foot kicked against some papers. She bent to pick them up. It was a manila envelope, addressed to Ollie. With a start, Inca saw her realtor Mindy's return address in the left-hand corner. She frowned, she had had no idea that the two knew each other. In fact, when they'd met a few weeks ago, then she saw the date. December 6. December 6. The day before Mindy called her to tell her the apartment above the Sakura was gone. Her heart was thudding. She looked up and listened. The shower was still running, and the scent of apple shampoo drifted underneath the door. Ollie was humming to himself. Quickly, Inca prized open the envelope and pulled out the papers inside. Then all the breath left her body, her heart slamming against her ribs. The deeds to the Sakura apartment. She sat down on the bed hard, only just acknowledging its rumbling creak. She read the papers quickly. The letter was signed by a partner of Mindy's, Jeb Verdona, a fawning sycophant who was full of cliched platitudes and realtor speak. 
He expressed surprise at the large amount Ali was prepared to pay at such short notice to secure the property. Ali had bought the Sakura apartment. Ali. Inka couldn't get her head around it. She rechecked the dates again. Definitely, the day before, Mindy had called her. Inka gritted her teeth, the next moment she heard the shower shut off. She pushed the papers back into the envelope and shoved it back under the bed. She got up and went to the window again, hearing him open the door to the bathroom. She needed a moment to arrange her expression, to erase the shock she felt. Ollie had bought the apartment from under her. Creep. You can turn around. I'm decent. Ollie chuckled, then saw her pale face. You okay? She turned, nodded, and tried to smile. You have a great view from here. Gosh so trite, she cursed herself. Ollie didn't notice. He nodded. It's a great location. Not as good as your abode, of course. Or the Sakura apartment, she thought with a grim smile. Ollie pulled on his sweater and stood staring at her. Are you sure you're okay? Inka pulled in a deep breath. I'm fine. Look, Ollie, like I said, I came over to apologize for last night. I should never have taken it out on you. SSH. He was suddenly beside her, his hand brushing away the hair that fell over her face, his mouth against her cheek. I said, no need to apologize. She was about to protest, but something in his eyes made her stop. A blankness. She changed the subject. I hope I'm not interfering with your day. Quite the opposite. He stood, reached for his sweater, and put it on, looking at her reflection in the mirror. I was going to call you. How about hanging out with me for the day? She swallowed. He bought the apartment, he bought the apartment. Anger and confusion were starting to replace the shock. Her eyes narrowed but she kept her voice steady. I can't today, Ollie. I have to work. Maybe some other time. I have to go. She moved toward the door but he stopped her, his face confused. What's wrong? She made her smile neutral. Nothing. I'll see you later. The tightness in her chest didn't ease as she drove to work. She parked the car outside of the Sakura and sat for a while, trying to digest what she'd found. Ollie had bought the apartment. An investment. She rubbed at her eyes, a headache starting to pound at the back of her head. She slid out of the car and went to work. This early, the Sakura was silent and dark. She stood for a while in the quiet, trying not see the bloodstains in the back room or the police tape littered everywhere. For a moment, her chest felt tight and she struggled to compose herself. Don't cry. Don't cry. She went to the sink and grabbed a bucket, filling it with soapy water. She cleaned the floor, a few tears escaping as she cleaned her friend's blood from the floor. Oh Scarlet, I'm sorry. After a couple of hours, Inca finished cleaning, went to pull the shades up and unlock the front door, moving around on autopilot. She flicked the coffee machines on, listening to their rhythmic hum, staring into the gloom of the teahouse. To distract herself, she thought again about the apartment above her head. Why the hell had Ollie not told her he bought the place, and why hadn't he moved in? The date of the letter threw her. Hadn't she told him then that she wanted to buy it? An idea started to form in her mind, and she smiled grimly to herself. Hey. The sound of Luna's stilted greeting made her turn. Her friend looked at her warily as she emerged from the back room. Inca's eyes filled with tears and she went to her friend. I'm sorry about yesterday, truly. Luna's body slumped in relief. Me too. I'm just worried about you and about Ollie. My head's a mess. Inca laughed through her tears. Right back at you. She held on to Luna for a few moments. Don't let's lose each other, okay? She felt Luna nod and pulled back to smile at her. And I promise I will be more accepting. She hated lying to Luna, but there was no reason to drag her into this thing with Ollie. Luna wiped her own wet eyes with the back of her hand. Sounds good to me. Look, I came to offer my services because, you know. Inca smiled at her gratefully. Thank you, babe. I appreciate it. 
There was a knock at the tea house door, customers waiting for their morning dose of caffeine. Inca went to let them in while Luna put her apron on. They dealt with the customers and got on with their day, but the tension between them was gone. As she worked, Inca again went through every reason why Ali would have bought the apartment. He certainly didn't have the money, she knew, to offer the outrageous price that had knocked her out of the running. So how? Why? The idea came to her later in the morning, and she pulled Luna aside. My head is about to split open. Mind if I step out for a half hour? Inca went to the kitchen, pulling out the drawers until she found the flattest knife she could. Upstairs, she pressed her ear to the door to the apartment, listening for any movement inside. She knocked quietly, then, when there was no answer, she slid the knife into the gap between the door and the jam, wiggling it to ease the lock open. She grinned to herself, wondering if Raf and Tommaso would be impressed by her lock-picking skills. You can take the girl out of the trailer park. Inca smiled as the door popped open. She closed it behind her and padded slightly around the dark apartment. The drapes were closed, and she flicked the overhead light on. The apartment was dusty but tidy, almost too still. There was no furniture, no personal touches. Not lived in. She breathed in the smell of the place, there was a tang of abandonment in the air. She shook her head. If Ali had bought the apartment, why was he still living at his old place? Anger was starting to build in her. She moved about the apartment looking for anything she could use, anything that would tell her more about the man she thought she had known all her life, that would explain why he would have done this to her. Later, after a decent interval, she made her way back down to the coffee house. As she went out to the counter, she heard Tyler and Luna laughing. She smiled as she saw them, but as she moved close, Tyler moved to hug her, and she saw seated behind him, watching her with careful, intense eyes, Ollie. His eyes bored into hers, the slight smile on his face mocking. He knows you saw the papers. The thrill of adrenaline that coursed through her body and made her stomach drop was almost painful. She looked away from his gaze. What are you kids joking around for? She asked lightly, forcing herself to smile. Tyler nodded to Ollie. Ollie's been telling us about the surprise he's got planned for you. Well, I say telling us, but he won't let on what it is, and Luna's been trying to get it out of him. Inca kept her face neutral as she looked at Ollie. Oh. He nodded. Good news. My lovely sister, he nodded at a still smiling Luna, has offered to cover your shift this afternoon, so you are free after all. Isn't that great? Inca's heart sank. Tyler and Luna were looking at her expectantly. She tried to smile. I suppose. I'll get my stuff. In the back room, she took her time gathering her coat and purse. Luna followed her in a second later, frowning slightly. Hey, it was all right to say yes to him, wasn't it? Inca laughed softly. It's fine. Luna stared at her. What's wrong? Inca hesitated, then shook her head. Nothing. Look, I need to call Tommaso. Can you give me a minute? Of course. She called Tommaso and told him that she was spending time with Ollie. Tommaso, to his credit, told her to have a great time. I can't be selfish with you now that I know we'll be together in Italy soon. Inca smiled. I love you, Tommaso. And I love you. Call me later, Principessa. Inca followed Ali out to his car and waited. He slid into the driver's side and started the car. He turned the car towards the harbor and drove straight to the ferry terminal. So where are we going? She swallowed as her voice cracked. Ollie didn't notice. Oh no. I'm kidnapping you. Ollie grinned. It's a surprise. She stared at him for a long moment, then tried to smile. As all good kidnappings should be. He laughed. Exactly. You're a very cooperative abductee. He held out his hand and reluctantly she took it. He smiled widely. Inca, I promise you, this will take your mind off everything. On the mainland, Inca stared out of the window as Ollie drove south of the city. Ollie had chatted enthusiastically for a while, but sensing her mood, he had lapsed into silence. 
She felt him glance over at her every few minutes, curious, wondering. She gazed out at the rain which was making everything hazy, the road was slick and the sky was dark. Are you okay? His voice broke through her reverie. I'm fine. Ollie abruptly pulled the car onto the off-ramp and onto a road Inca didn't recognize. On the side of the road, she started to see a few kids from one of the reservations. Ollie put his hand on hers. We're almost there. I'll let you in on the secret soon. He laughed, his face open and friendly. He turned onto a small mud road. The car wound up a hill, the pines became denser and thicker as they climbed. The forest blocked out the light, the trees curving over the road. After a mile or so, Ali pointed. Inca, look there. There was a clearing in the trees to the left of them. Ali brought the car to a stop and they got out. Surrounded on three sides by the forest, the clearing fell away at a cliff at the far side. The view stretched for miles over lush, verdant pine forest. At the horizon, Inca could see the cobalt of Puget Sound, dark patches of the island scattered across it. The low winter sun cast golden glints off the water. The Olympic mountain range rose out of the west. Inca turned to Ali, smiling but confused. Ali, it's beautiful. But I don't understand. He smiled and nodded behind them. Look there. He pointed into the trees and she turned to look. A house, a large Richardsonian Romanesque-style building, stood out against the dark green of the forest. No, not a house, a mansion, Inca thought. A behemoth. I thought you might appreciate the architecture. Have you ever seen something like this here? She shook her head, staying silent. The windows of the house were blank and dark, and she shivered. It wasn't a welcoming home, it was a statement. Incongruous in this landscape, it simply didn't fit in this beautiful natural place. She looked at Ollie's face and read the pride and excitement in his expression, and something else. Triumph. Inca frowned, confused. Ollie, I. So, do you like it? No. But she nodded, smiling slightly, and he beamed. Good. Because I bought it. She turned and looked at him, studying his face. After a moment, teeth gritted, her voice hard, she asked him the question she'd been holding back. So you didn't want to buy anything in Willowbrook? Nothing there that caught your eye. What do you think? She felt a ball of tension lodge in her chest as he stared at her, his eyes searching but a mocking smile on his face. You're right. She made her tone soothing. Keep him sweet. She had no idea where that idea had come from, but suddenly, she knew it was the right thing to do. He pulled her into his arms, surprising her. She resisted for a moment, and his grip tightened. His gaze was intense as he gazed down at her. It's a new start, Inca. A new start for you and me. It's our new home. Inca stared at him, her heart thumping unpleasantly against her chest. Ali. I don't understand. She pulled away from his embrace and moved away from him, putting distance between them. She studied his face. He was smiling, and his expression was victorious. Inca felt irritation flood through her. What do you mean for us? Ollie, we're not. I live in Willowbrook, Ollie. I have a home. I know that. He reached for her hand. But it's time we plan for our future. Come on. I'll show you around. He started towards the house, his hand gripping hers so that she was forced to follow him. I got it for a steal as well. For some reason, it had been on the market for over a year. She pulled her hand away from his. Ollie, stop. What do you think you're doing? He turned, and the expression on his face made her heart stop. Anger. Inca, don't spoil this. He stepped towards her, and she felt her breath quicken. He towered over her, his hand on her arm, fingers biting into her skin. Inca stared up at him, searching his expression. She was alone with this man and no one, no one, knew where they were. She could feel her skin start to prickle, her legs like cotton wool. His grip was too tight, fingers pressing deep into her skin, bruising and constricting the blood flow. Her hand started to numb. She tried to pull away but Ollie's hold was unyielding. Trapped. 
Ali, please. Her voice broke. He put his finger over her mouth and smiled, but his eyes were that flat gray steel again. Just listen. You need somewhere to go, away from the town, away from winter. Ollie spat his name. Being around him is destroying you, I can see that. Everyone can see that. He cupped her chin with his fingers. This is what's best for you, Inca. Somewhere you can get away from him. Where I can look after you. She could feel icy needles of fear creeping up her spine. Ollie, I'd like you to take me home, please. Her voice broke and faded. He stepped toward her, seeming to grow bigger and stronger. His eyes were locked on hers. Even if you run, you won't stand a chance. Inca swallowed, not taking her eyes from him. Ollie, please. I want to go. He laughed and took her hand. Later. We've only just arrived. He unlocked the front door and pulled her into the house. You know, for what it's worth, Nancy and Tyler agree with me. They think you should get some distance from winter, too. Clear your head. Isn't that what you wanted? He didn't wait for an answer, and heart thudding, Inca stepped into the house after him. The entire inside was painted white. Everything. Inca swallowed. For some reason, the starkness of the decor scared her and made her uneasy. The outside walls were dark, stone and wood, giving no clue to this blankness inside. Ollie was talking, leading her around the place. There was very little furniture, the few pieces there were, were covered in white sheets. Inca started to feel disconnected to the world outside. She walked to one of the windows and looked out at the view. The windows felt thick and unbreakable. The view seemed a long way away as if she were looking at it through a telescope, even though the perspective was all wrong. Inca, I thought you wanted to get away. After all, that's what you told Luna, isn't it? That's why you were looking at apartments in the city. You remember when you were attacked? Reminds me, did Tommaso ever explain himself about that? She gaped at him. What has Tommaso got anything to do with that? It happened before I even met him. Ollie rolled his eyes. You really are blinkered when it comes to that waste of space, you know? Anyway, he interrupted whatever she was about to say. Let's go upstairs. I want to show you the master bedroom. He made her walk up the stairs in front of him, motioning to a door to the left of the staircase. The master bedroom was huge, with a dressing room and walk-in closet, an ensuite bathroom and a bed. A huge bed made up of white sheets and white pillows. And on the nightstand, a picture frame. Inka walked over and picked it up. A photo of her, smiling, looking away from the camera. She recognized the photo. It had been taken by Nancy on her last birthday. You took this from my home? She held up the frame, her eyes filling with tears. Ollie smiled, seeming oblivious to her distress. Just to help make it homey. Hey, look at this. He walked out of the room to another down the long hallway. He threw open the door, another white blank room. He wrapped his arms around her, tightening his hold as she tried to pull away. And next door, Inca, don't you think it's the perfect space for a nursery? For when we have kids. Inca wriggled violently out of his embrace, trembling so badly that she stumbled a little as she pushed her way out into the hallway. Ollie caught her up, grabbing her arm and turning her to face him. His expression was confused. Inca, what's wrong? Inca felt anger roil up inside her. Ollie, are you kidding me? You're talking as if we're together. I'm not moving here, Ollie. I'm not moving in with you. She started down the stairs, but Ollie grabbed her arm. Why do you always have to do this? I try to do something nice for us, and... Ollie, you're hurting me. I don't care. I want to know what your problem is. She twisted her arm from his grip and turned to face him. My problem is you, Ollie, telling me how to live my life, buying a freaking house for us to live in. We are not a couple anymore, Ollie. Do you understand that? His face twisted in anger. I understand that you can't make up your mind, but I won't wait forever, Inca. Either you want this or you don't. She shook her head. Screw you, Ollie. You were the one who ended things between us. You. 
and now I am grateful for it because this is crazy. You are out of your mind. I'm out of my mind? Me. I'm not the one sleeping with two brothers, Inca. His voice was granite. She swallowed the shame, flushing. Luna had told him, was that the reason for this insanity? It's none of your business who I sleep with. Her voice was bitter now. I'm just glad it's no longer you. Her voice shook at the word, and she clenched her fists up to calm herself. Gosh, is this why you bought the soccer apartment out from under me? To leave me homeless, so I would have no choice but to move in with you. He smiled. You found out. She wanted to slap the grin off his smug face. Who are you, Ollie? You are not the man I've known my whole life. Ollie moved so quickly that she didn't have time to react. He pulled her into his arms, holding her as she struggled, grinding his mouth onto hers. Inka was breathless and terrified. Ollie scooped her into his arms and carried her back to the master bedroom. He dropped her onto the vast bed, and as she struggled against him, he put his whole weight on top of her, kissing her with a ferocity she found terrifying. It was only when he stood and started to unbuckle his belt that she could move. Inca rolled to the other side of the bed, kicking his hand away when he reached for her leg. She managed to get off the bed and tried to sprint for the door, but he caught her. Petrified, she waited for his next assault. To her shock, he dropped to his knees, pressing his face into her belly briefly, and then drew away tears in his eyes. I'm sorry. It's just. I love you, Inca. I'm in love with you. And I want to make you happy. Inca couldn't speak. Ollie got to his feet and smiled down at her. You don't have to say anything back. Just know I'm yours. For all time. The change in his manner threw her. Guilt, fear, confusion. She pulled away from his grip. Ollie. I would like to go home now. He looked sad. Are you sure? I've so much more to show you. She didn't react, and he gave a martyred sigh. I'll take you home. Back in Willowbrook, Inca didn't hesitate. She called Tommaso and Raffaello, then went straight to the police station and lodged a formal complaint with Knox. Knox was shocked. Inca held her head up high, but her voice shook. I can show you the bruises, Knox. Soon, the police were looking for Ollie, and a raging Raffaello and Tommaso were having to be held back from helping them. The sooner we get to Italy, the better, Tommaso raged, but Raffaello just put his arm around Inca. I think Inca's probably had enough of men telling her what to do, he chided his brother gently, and Tommaso nodded. He stroked Inca's cheek. I'm sorry, Bella. Inca leaned into his touch. It's okay. She was hyper aware of the other deputies, trying not to stare at the three of them, at their obvious dynamic. I feel the same. I don't want to be here anymore. It was after midnight before Luna let herself into Knox's apartment. Since Scarlet's murder they had become close, just friends, Knox was still grieving, and Knox had given her a key so that she would have a safe space to come to. She greeted him with a grin, waving a bottle of scotch. I saw all the activity at the station, Inca causing trouble again. A bribe. Spill it. Knox slumped onto the couch, patting the seat beside him. You know it's private police business. I could get into a lot of trouble. He laughed as she kissed his cheek. You're going to have to try harder than that. He tried to make his face disapproving, and she snickered. How about I show you a boob? No. She feigned hurt, and he tugged on a lock of her hair. Seriously, look, I do have something to tell you, and it's not going to be easy to hear. She studied his face, her own expression troubled now. Okay. Knox took a deep breath. Ollie attacked Inca. He tried to take advantage of her, I'm sorry. Don't cry. Gosh. I knew he was cracking up but this, tell me everything. So, in a halting voice, he told her everything Inca had told him. Knox. Luna was up now, hands at her mouth. Tell me really, is she okay? Knox grabbed her hand and pulled her down into his arms. She really, really is. She said to tell you she's fine, just a bit shaken up. 
Winter seems to be taking care of her. Taking over was what he'd been about to say, but he didn't want to worry Luna. Knox had studied the man closely for the first time since they'd met, his huge physical presence, his intense manner. His brother seemed even more intense than Tommaso. Knox made a note to talk to Inker about that next time she was alone. Hey, you still here? Luna waved a hand in front of his eyes. Her own eyes were still troubled. So where's Ollie? We don't know. He never went home. Gosh, Luna. I'm so sorry. What did he want? Ollie, I mean. He knows it's over between them, so. What the hell was he thinking? Knox had no answer for her. Inko went to see Nancy and Tyler, and then went home with Tommaso and Raffaello. She needed to be with them tonight, and they seemed more than delighted to have her there. They sat up talking, sipping warming scotch, making plans for Italy. They would leave in a few weeks, they decided. I want to find a job there, though, Inka told them determinedly. I don't want to be a kept woman. There will be plenty of opportunities open to you, Tommaso said smoothly, sliding his hand onto the back of her neck and kneading the sore muscles there. In the meantime, they took her to bed in Raffaello's room, this time falling asleep in each other's arms. He had crept past the security guards, almost smirking at their lax vigilance. He'd nearly been seen by one of the other staff, though, and he ducked behind a column as the man pulled a cigarette out and lit it. The smoker wandered off, and the watcher took his chance and stole in the open door. He padded quietly through the silent mansion, up the grand staircase, checking each room. They were all empty except the last one. Inca lay naked and beautiful between both brothers. They were turned towards her, Raffaello was facing her, his lips almost on hers, Tommaso was behind her, his lips on her shoulder. All three looked to be asleep. The watcher was entranced by the vision. All three were so beautiful that they looked like a painting. He fingered the knife in his pocket. He had come here to kill her, but now, seeing this, he'd never get near her. Even if he killed one of the brothers first, their ripped athletic bodies meant the other would wake, and he'd be a dead man before the knife touched Inca. She opened her eyes and stared at Raffaello Winter before closing the distance between them and kissing him. His eyes opened and he smiled as her lips met his. Ti amo. He heard him whisper. Inca moved then, pushing Raffaello onto his back and straddling him. Tommaso awoke then and he saw him smile at them. Starting without me. Inca held out her hand to him and he sat up, his mouth finding hers. It was hypnotic, watching the three of them. He snuck away regretfully while they were still making love, and was able to get back down to his car parked along the road. Really, their security was laughable, but he supposed, with the three of them being inseparable, literally, he guessed they thought they were safe. How wrong they were. In the morning, Inca opened up the Sakura. It was still painful to be there, and she felt nothing but relief that soon she would be in Italy. Last night had been the clincher. After making love with Tommaso and Raffaello, she knew she couldn't be anywhere they were not. She had called Mindy first thing that morning and asked her to list the business for sale. She would sell, give Nancy and Tyler back their investment plus some major interest, and then live on the rest while she was in Italy. Despite her protestations, she didn't really want to work in Italy. She wanted to explore, learn Italian, discover more about her loves, and spend every waking moment with them. My loves. How wildly different her life had become since she'd met the two brothers, how wildly different she herself had become. A wanton woman, she said to herself and grinned. You're cheerful. Luna didn't look happy as she came into the Sakura, and Inca's smile faded. Luna, look, I'm sorry that I had to tell Knox about what Ollie. Luna held up her hand. Please don't. It's okay. What he did is unforgivable, even if he is my brother. Though I would like to know from you what exactly happened. Inca told her about the house, how Ollie had behaved, about her things being stolen. By the end, Luna had to sit down, and Inca felt bad for telling her. I don't know why he's suddenly behaving like this. I'm so sorry, Inca. Inca was uncomfortable. Let's not talk about it. Even though I am so pissed at him, 
I hope he's okay. Maybe he's just. She stopped talking, but Luna half smiled. Say it. Maybe he's having a psychotic break. Just like his little sister. No, I. Inca, it's okay. Sometimes these things are genetic, and in a way, I hope that's what he is having. Let's be real honest here. Do you recognize this Ollie? Is he the same man you grew up with and had a relationship with? Inca shook her head and Luna nodded. Remember when I had my breakdown? Did I seem different to you? You did. I remember thinking Luna had disappeared. It was scary, obviously not as much as for you and Ollie, but I felt like you died in some way. Inca felt tears prick her eyes. Luna sighed. That's how I felt. I was no longer me. And maybe I think Ollie is going through the same thing. I think it's been going on for a while. I think it's the reason he broke up with you. I really do. He's unstable. Gosh. Inka was choked up, but she got up and made some tea to cover it. What a mess. Indeed. Look. Luna got up. I don't think Ollie meant any harm. I really don't. I know he scared you. He lied to me as well, Luna. I know. He lied to me too. Look, shall we open up and distract ourselves? Knox will tell us if they find anything. Luna had been trying to call Knox all day. At seven o'clock, frustrated, she shoved her cell phone in her pocket and strode over to the police station. Fred, one of the deputies, greeted her. Hey, Knox here. I've been trying to get hold of him all day. Fred shook his head. Got called into the city. They've got some big break in the murders and wanted to know what Knox knew. Luna frowned. Surely they have records? Fred shrugged. Can't say I know too much. Knox went har and out of here this morning. I haven't heard a thing since. Looked pretty tense. Okay, thanks. I'll be across the road if he comes back. Sure thing. She returned to the Sakura and shook her head. Inca sighed. We'll just have to wait some more. A few minutes later, Tyler came in, breathless and frantic. Either of you seen Nancy? She didn't come home, and I can't get hold of her. She was meant to be home an hour ago. Luna gave a short laugh. Maybe she's with Knox. He's been AWOL all day, too. Tyler didn't smile, his face creased with worry, and the Inca went to him. Look, I'm sure she's just gone to get groceries or something. Come have some coffee and we'll wait for her. Tyler hesitated, glancing over to the police station across the street. Finally he sighed, still antsy and sat on one of the bar stools. Okay. Maybe you could try her from your landline? Inca nodded, casting a concerned look at Luna. She poured him some coffee and went out the back to try to call Nancy. Luna rubbed Tyler's back, trying to comfort him. I'm sure her cell just ran out of power or something. When did you see her last? Tyler rubbed his head. This morning. We had plans for the evening, you see. It's not like her, he fretted, getting up and going to the window. Luna went with him in time to see a police cruiser pull up. Knox got out, followed by some men she didn't know. She banged on the window, but Knox ignored her, just walking with the men over to the station. She frowned and was about to leave when Inca came back into the room. She shook her head at them. Sorry, no luck. Look, we'll leave it for a half hour. Luna interrupted her, darting to the door. Be right back. Knox was emerging from the station, his face stern and set. She ran over to him, and he excused himself to the men with him, one of whom she now recognized as his old boss in the city, Trey Ford. She nodded to him, then turned back to Knox. What's going on? Are you looking for Ali? He indicated for her to wait, spoke to the rest of the group in low tones. Returning, he took her arm. Come on. He led her back to the tea house, where Inca and Tyler were watching them, confusion in their faces. He asked them to sit down while he explained. Trey went back over cold cases in the city. He found a woman who was murdered with the same weapon, but didn't fit the victim profile. She was an African-American mother of five. 
Luna looked confused. And? Her name was Justine Sardi. Inca blanched. Oh gosh. Knox nodded. She was killed on March 1st. That date means anything to you? Luna looked bleak, and her voice was barely above a whisper. Ollie's birthday. Knox took her hand. It's all too coincidental. He's been going into the city at night, too. We need to talk to him as soon as possible. Inca shook her head. This is ridiculous. Ollie would never hurt anyone. Knox's eyes were kind. Inca, didn't you come to me and tell me the exact opposite thing yesterday? The facts are that the murders all took place at times Ollie was either unaccounted for or in the city. Then there's the murder weapon itself. He looked at Tyler. You know what I'm going to say. Tyler nodded, his whole body slumped in defeat. My knife. The women both looked back at Knox in confusion. Tyler was issued a bayonet knife when he served in the military, he explained. It was part of the inventory stolen last year, only Ollie never listed it in the police file. It was the only thing that wasn't accounted for. Then there are the ballistics of Scarlet's murder. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you before. They're the same issue bullets we use. We just need Ollie's gun to prove it. Inca couldn't hold out the small cry of distress. What the hell are you talking about? Are you accusing Ollie of murdering Scarlet now? Luna looked as if she would throw up. Tyler reached for Inca's hand. She pulled it away and stared at Knox. He was pale, obviously uncomfortable. They all looked at Luna now. She shook her head. No. No. He's being set up. She stood up now, angry. Inca, tears flooding down her face, grabbed her hand. Luna, I don't want to believe it either, but... Luna walked out of the room. Tyler started to get up, but Inca stopped him. Tyler, leave her. Knox, Nancy is missing. She's been missing all day. Knox looked startled and stood. Why the hell didn't you tell me that first? Tyler, come with me. Inca watched helplessly as the two men stalked out. Luna pulled the back door shut behind her, pressing the speed dial on her cell phone. She waited until the voicemail kicked in. Hey, it's me. Look, I don't know where you are, but they're going to arrest you. I want you to know that I know you didn't do anything wrong. I know it. Her voice cracked and she hung up the phone. Her body gave out then and she sank to the ground, sobbing. No. No. Ollie was being set up, she knew it. Her sobs juddered to a halt, and she dragged oxygen into her lungs in gasps, trying to regain control. One thought dominated her mind now. How the hell was she going to save her brother? It was 4 a.m. before Knox came back to the tea shop. Tyler had returned earlier, and they had been joined by the Winter Brothers, who had immediately sent their own security teams out to help with the hunt. Tyler, hollow-eyed and stricken, got up to greet him, but Knox, grasping the older man's arm, shook his head. Nothing yet, buddy. Trust me, we're looking. The Coast Guard is sending up a helicopter at first light. Same with the police, the FBI. He took a deep breath. Considering Nancy's age and link to Inca, the feds are considering her disappearance as part of the case. They're giving us all the resources we need. He winced at the agony in Tyler's face. Man, we'll find her. I promise. Tyler nodded, speechless with terror. Knox looked over to the two women, their eyes filled with the same horror as their friends. Luna hugged Knox and he sank into the embrace, exhausted, drained. I can't stay long, he murmured into her neck, his face buried in her hair. He was reluctant to let go. Luna cleared her throat and he looked up. Can I have a word, Knox? In private. She looked embarrassed to ask. In the kitchen, she looked at him squarely. I need to tell you something. It's going to sound crazy, and you're going to think I'm saying it just to help Ollie, but... Just go for it, Luna. She nodded. All right. I think Ollie's being set up by Tommaso. I think he's dangerous and unstable. Everything started to go bad when he showed up. Knox considered her words carefully. 
Just one problem with that, Luna. Tommaso didn't show up until a couple of months back. The murders started a year ago. Her shoulders slumped. I know, she hissed with frustration. Knox relented. Hey, I'm not taking his side, but I'm just telling you how the court will see it. For what it's worth, I think there's something hinky about him too. But just at the moment, I've got bigger things to worry about. She nodded. Of course. I'm sorry. They walked back out to the coffee house, and Knox nodded to Tyler. I'll be back and keep you updated. He walked towards the door, then turned on his heel and went back to Luna, searching her face. Don't go taking the law into your own hands now, will you? If what you say is true, I don't want you getting hurt. Ollie woke in his car. It took him a moment to orient himself to his surroundings. Desolation point. He sat up and wondered how the hell he'd gotten there. An empty bottle of vodka lay next to him, but he frowned at it. Vodka wasn't his drink. He opened the car door and the fresh air hit him. Gosh. He stumbled from the car and rubbed his eyes, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. He saw the trunk of his car was lifted up and frowned. What the hell? As he stared at it, he felt his phone buzz. Voicemail. He listened to his sister's words, and a sickening dread came over him. Slowly, he walked to the back of the car. The flies were buzzing maniacally, and Ollie could only stare in horror at the dead body of his ex-girlfriend's mother. Ollie whirled and threw up and up, until he could no longer do anything but dry heave. He staggered further away from the car, wondering what to do. He heard the sirens getting closer. Luna's voice came back to him. They're going to arrest you. He pulled his cell from out of his pocket and called her. She answered on the first ring. Ollie, she was whispering, but as soon as he heard her voice, he crumpled. Luna, Luna. He started to sob. They're gonna say I did it. No. No. Ollie, listen to me. I know you are innocent. I know it with every cell in my body. I believe you. Her voice was stronger now. Are you listening? Ollie's sobs juddered to a halt, and he panted, trying to catch his breath. Yes. She lowered her voice again. I believe in you. Ollie shook his head. You're the only one who will, he said bleakly. He pushed his way through the woods towards the sound of the sirens. A couple of cruisers were parked at the side of the road. As he approached, the cop driving the closest one got out of his car. Ollie went up to him, his whole body slumped in defeat. I think, he said, and his voice broke, I think I'm the one you're looking for. Inca saw Knox's face before Tyler did, and his expression said everything. An involuntary moan escaped her lips, and Tyler looked up sharply. He followed her gaze, turning to the somber cop. Knox shook his head, his eyes sorrowful. Tyler. No. Don't say it. No. Tyler began to shake, and Inca, tears coursing down her face, darted around the counter and caught him as his knees gave way. She and Knox managed to maneuver him into a chair, and he leaned over, a gut-wrenching howl of grief echoing around the room. Inca leaned her head against his. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, she whispered again and again, and he put his arms around her, holding onto her, muscles clenched. He drew in deep breaths, trying to get control of himself. Knox, his hand on the older man's shoulder, waited, his own face wan. After what seemed an impossible time, Tyler looked up. Where? In the woods near Desolation Point. Tyler and Inca exchanged a long look. He saw his own confusion reflected in her eyes. Was she stabbed? Knox nodded. Yeah. It's the same killer. The implication of what he had said hit him then, as Tyler stood and darted into the back room. They heard him throwing up, and Inca gave a little sob. With his knife. With Tyler's knife. Knox nodded and put his arm around her. Look, I need you to stay with Tommaso. Take Tyler, if that's okay. I don't know why, but I think from everything we've found out, it has to have something to do with you. You shouldn't be alone. She gazed up at him. What about Ollie? He hesitated. Inca, he's in custody. 
He was found with Nancy's body in the trunk of his car. No, no, no. She started to sob, and Tommaso held her as she cried. Raffaello cursed softly under his breath. He turned himself in, Inca. Whatever the truth is, we'll get it, don't worry. If Ollie's innocent, we'll find out. She gathered herself, rubbing her eyes. Sorry. He looked at her kindly. He's asking for Luna. I need to find her. Inca nodded. She's upstairs. Knox. I know Ollie. He wouldn't do this. He wouldn't. He's messed up, yes, but he's not a killer. Should I come? Knox's face softened. Sweetheart, you need to look after Tyler now. Ollie's cooperating. Funny, he knew to come in almost as soon as the arrest warrant was issued, almost as if someone had warned him. Look, we need a positive ID on Nancy's body. I'll do it, she interrupted. Tyler doesn't need to see her like that. Tyler had emerged from the bathroom, wiping his mouth. Sorry. Tyler, I'm so sorry for your loss. Knox was all business again now, his manner sympathetic but practical. Inca's going to come with me tomorrow and make the official identification. He looked between them. Tyler opened his mouth to object, but Inca went to him. Let me do this for you. I owe you. You don't need to see her like that. Please. She hugged Tyler and he exhaled a long, almost relieved sigh, holding her close. Thanks, Bubba, he said softly, then turned back to Knox. Knox, I heard what you said about Inca not being alone. I agree, Bubs, no argument. Tommaso cleared his throat. You shouldn't be alone either, Tyler. Our home is your home. Knox, will you let me know when Inca should be there tomorrow? Of course. They're going to take her beau, Nancy, to the city morgue. I'll go with you, so you won't be alone, Inca. He turned to Tyler. Tyler, man, I'm so sorry. You need anything, you just holler, okay? Inca hugged Tyler. Just know, I will always be here for you, whatever you need. I'm so sorry. Tyler let out a long breath. Thank you. He searched Inca's face. You okay? She shook her head. No. No, I'm not. Tyler, Ollie didn't do this. He hesitated, then sighed. For whatever reason, I believe you about that. I can't imagine he would do this. Nancy's gone. Gosh, Inca. His voice was so full of desolation that it made her cry. What the hell am I going to do without her? FBI. Agent Trent Burke leaned back in his seat and studied the young man in front of him. Ollie Rosenbaum had refused a lawyer and just asked his sister to be with him during questioning. There was something so guileless about the kid, and he had answered every question, Trent felt, with honesty and frankness. No, he had no idea how Nancy's body had gotten in his car, nor indeed how he had ended up where he did. No, he had no motive to kill her. No, he wouldn't describe his relationship with Inca Sardi as obsessive. Trent glanced in the two-way mirror, knowing the cop from the island Knox was watching. He'd banned him from the interview even before he found out he was close to the main suspect's sister. Geez. Trent shook his head. What a damn mess. There was a knock at the door. Trey Ford walked in, a tray of coffee in his hands, a folder tucked under his arm. Ollie and Luna thanked him for the drink. Trent took the folder and opened it, reading through the contents. Ford watched him carefully, and eventually Trent nodded and turned back to Ollie. The younger man looked exhausted, his sister was tense but protective. So, Ollie. Trent kept his manner relaxed. You want to tell me where you've been going nights? Ollie sighed. The city. I've been moonlighting, I guess you'd call it, working construction. He leaned forward and dropped his head in his hands for a moment. Luna, paler than ever under the strip light, rubbed his back. He took a deep breath. The thing is, I got myself into bad debt by buying two new places. So, I got in touch with an old friend and asked him if he could hook me up with some work. And I guess I just wanted one thing in my life that was just mine. So I didn't tell anyone. Not Inca, he smiled at Luna. 
Not even you, sis. Trent nodded. I get it. We're going to have to check with your friend, you realize, and whether you've broken any conditions of your employment, well, I'll leave that up to your boss. He glanced over to Ford, who shrugged. Well, we've got a long way to go here, so take a break for five minutes and we'll be back. Ford? Outside, Knox was waiting. Thoughts? Trent shook his head. Something's not sitting right. We're gonna need more time, and I think we need to take him back to the city. He's too close to everything here, he added, throwing Knox a meaningful look. Ford nodded. I think that's a good idea. Look, I'm not trying to interfere, but it seems to me, Knox, you already got a lot on your plate without this. Let Trent deal with Ollie. Keep out of it and handle what's been going on with the murder scene. I know the victim was a friend. Take some time. The door behind them opened and Luna stepped out. She looked as if she'd been crying, but she gave them a weak smile. Knox put a hand on her shoulder. I think my brother should have a lawyer now, she said quietly. Ford nodded and reached for the phone. They're going to take him to the city for questioning, honey. She nodded, sighing. Okay, well, I should go with him. Trent made a face. Honestly, I think you're better off here, Miss Rosenbaum. We could be a long time. Luna looked at Knox, who nodded. Sweetheart, it's for the best. Inca and Tyler are going to need you too. Luna's face crumpled, and she hurriedly dabbed her eyes. I don't want him to be alone. He won't be. Ford was back. He squeezed her hand. I'll look out for him as best I can. I promise. Knox drove Luna to the Winta's house. I want you to stay with them and be with people when I'm working. He glanced over, his face apologetic. Sorry, I don't mean to dictate. I get it, she said with a small smile. Thank you. God, what a mess. He pulled the car up to the curb outside Tommaso's place, and they sat there for a moment. Knox reached over and took her hand. I'm sorry for all this crap, Luna. For what it's worth. I don't think Ollie's a killer. I had my suspicions, my doubts early on, but... It's your job to be suspicious of his kind of behavior. Her voice was soft and trembling. It's my job as his sister to believe in him. And I didn't. And she started to cry. Knox came to pick Inca and Tyler up the next morning. He nodded at the suitcase in the hallway. What's that? Tyler's going to Connecticut. Nancy's brothers are in a residential home. He doesn't want them finding out from anyone else. Inca lowered her voice. They have Alzheimer's. I don't know how much they'll understand about this, but he has to try. I'm going to take him to the airport after you've dropped us off. Inca was pale, there were dark circles under her eyes. Tyler came out to greet Knox, his own face drawn, his body sunken with grief. I'll take you to the airport, Knox offered. No point in you getting a cab when I have a perfectly good car. Okay, thanks. At the morgue, Tyler stayed in Knox's car, not even looking at the building. Knox led Inca to the viewing suite. The postmortem was done this morning, Knox told her, and she nodded, drawing in a deep breath as they stepped into the room. The medical examiner smiled sympathetically at her. Knox put his hand on her back as the doctor lifted the sheet. Inca could not help the little cry of distress. Nancy's face was peaceful now, her eyes closed, but the shock was not lessened at seeing her so brutalized. Inca nodded at the medical examiner's question, Is this the body of Nancy Sardi? Knox leaned in. You need to say it out loud, honey. Inca swallowed back the bile in her throat. Yes. This is my mother, Nancy Sardi. She looked at them both. Can I have a few moments alone with her? The doctor nodded and Knox smiled softly at her. I'll wait outside for you, sweetheart. Inca waited until the door had closed before she stepped closer to the table, placing a hand gently on Nancy's head. I'm so sorry, she whispered and fat tears dropped down her face. This isn't fair. Not you, Mom. How could you be gone? She thought of all the times Nancy had gone on a rant about some perceived injustice, how she would accuse Tyler and Inca of ganging up on her when they would tease her, 
the way she would give Scarlet the stink eye when Scarlet was too rowdy. All that energy snuffed out. Inca shook her head. She glanced behind her at the door. It had a window, but the blinds were drawn. She wanted to know what her killer had done to her. Sucking in a breath, she gently lifted the sheet covering Nancy's body, and immediately wished she hadn't. Although the medical examiner had done his best, he could not have concealed the brutal slashes, the deep stab wounds, and the unthinkable violence inflicted on her. The horror. Inka was about to pull the sheet back when she noticed, almost hidden amongst the blood-stained skin and stab wounds, bruises on Nancy's stomach. Someone had beaten her mother before he killed her. Inka dropped the sheet and stepped back, fumbling for the door handle behind her. She staggered out of the room, hyperventilating. Knox, sitting outside, darted to her side and held her while she tried to get her breathing under control. Hey, 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 it's okay. Come on. Let's get you out of here. Outside, she found she couldn't look Tyler in the eye. She just nodded when he asked her in a broken voice if they'd made a positive identification. I'm sorry, Pops. It's Mom. She expected him to crumble then, but to her surprise, he merely nodded, his expression blank. Better get me to the airport then. At the airport, Knox said goodbye, then gave them privacy as Inca hugged Tyler tightly. He held onto her for a few long minutes. You take good care of yourself, Bubba. Will you change your mind about coming with me? She shook her head, trying to smile. There's things I have to do here, Pops. He frowned. Just be safe then. Call me later. I should be in no later than seven. I'll make sure my cell is on. She studied him for a few minutes. I love you, Pops. I wanted to tell you that. And I want you to know that I will be forever grateful for the life you've given me. He kissed her forehead. I love you too. You'll always be my girl. No one could be more like a daughter to me, not even if you were my flesh and blood. She waved him off with tears in her eyes. Knox came to collect her, and she looked at him gratefully. In the car, they sat in companionable silence. At the outskirts of the city, Knox glanced at her. I'll drop you off at home, okay? Thank you. He nodded. Look, Inca, we're gonna catch the guy, whoever it is. She looked at him. Sounds like someone believes a certain someone else is innocent. He laughed at her convoluted sentence. I have questions. Like, if Ollie killed Nancy, why the hell was he spotless? There was no blood on his clothing. Nancy had defense wounds, why isn't Ollie covered in bruises? And why would he kill Mom anyway? Her voice was gruff but determined. He looked over. Quite. She sighed. Do you think they'll let him go? Knox shrugged. If common sense prevails, I hope so. He has alibis for about half the murders in the city. Just wish he'd let someone else know what he was up to earlier. I have to admit, his behavior when he broke up with you colored my vision of him, along with his attitude towards Tommaso and what you told me about the other day. Inca looked away from his gaze. And probably the things you had seen made you hypersensitive to everything, I'll bet. Yup. I saw monsters everywhere. Inca turned away from him then, not wanting him to see the fear in her eyes. I know what you mean. At the mansion, she turned and hugged him goodbye. He smiled at her. I'll see you back at home. I don't want you alone until we get this jerk. I'll be home as soon as I can, hopefully with Ollie. Thanks, Knox, for everything. Inside the mansion, Inca deliberately went straight to her room, wanting to be alone to grieve. She lay on her bed, and the sense of loneliness, of hopelessness she'd been trying to bury, threatened to overwhelm her, and she pulled up the comforter to hide the tears. Exhausted, she leaned her head on her hand and closed her eyes. Before long, images and half-clouded dreams began to run through her mind. Kissing Raffaello, standing with him at the edge of the cliff. Now they were at the bottom, Raffaello lying motionless on the rocks. She was screaming for him to wake, but he was gone. There was a laugh, a movement behind her. She turned. She expected to see Ollie, but no, it was Tommaso driving the knife into her, grinning, giggling. 
pain, blood, death. Luna had refused to stay at the winter mansion, and neither of the brothers seemed keen on her staying with them. She could tell from their hostile eyes that she wasn't welcome. They clearly thought Ali was guilty. As soon as Knox had taken Inca and Tyler into the city, she had slipped from the house and walked back home, letting herself into Ollie's place, tidying it up, looking for any clue. The detectives had clearly already been there, and she ignored the keep-out crime scene tape. There had been enough secrets around her. And yours is one of the biggest, isn't it, Luna? She closed her eyes. She could never take back what she had done. Never. And yet. It felt unfinished, what she felt she had to do. It's time. She left Ollie's place and went to Knox's apartment, sliding under his bed to ease up the floorboard she had removed a few weeks ago. From underneath, she took up the small bag, then crawled out again. She left a note on Knox's desk, and then, with tears streaming down her face, she walked into the inky black night. Well, kid. Trent pushed open the door to the interrogation room. Ollie looked up, his eyes heavy and tired. His lawyer, Brian, followed Ford in and patted Ollie's shoulder. Trent smiled at him. Your construction boss has confirmed your alibi. We still have questions, but for now, you're free to go. Ollie gaped at him. What? Brian cleared his throat. No evidence, buddy. They'll bail you out for now. You will have to surrender your passport. Knox can take care of that, Trent interrupted with an apologetic nod to the lawyer. Ollie followed them out of the precinct in a daze. Brian said goodbye, Trent too, and Ollie was left alone on the sidewalk. He began to walk, not paying attention to where he was going, just needing to feel the ache in his leg muscles and the cold air in his lungs. His speed increased and then he was running, pushing himself harder and harder until finally he stopped, chest heaving, the blood pounding in his brain. He was free. There had been moments over the past days when even he had believed himself capable of anything. All he knew now was that he had to get to Inca, to hold her, to protect her. One thought dominated his mind as he turned and began to walk across the city to the waterfront. Inca was in trouble. The image of Nancy's body flashed in his mind, and Ollie couldn't help seeing Inca's face, contorted like Nancy's had been in absolute terror and agony, her body shredded and bloody. No. Ollie's jaw set. Before this ended, Ollie knew in his heart that more people would die. But if it took his last breath, Inca would not be among them. Raffaello stroked his fingers down her bare back. Inca had stepped out of the tub, and now he wrapped a thick, fluffy towel around her. She looked exhausted, drained, and grief stricken. She had woken up screaming from the nightmares earlier, and it had taken both him and Tommaso to calm her down. She had cried for most of the rest of the day, the full impact of what had happened hitting her full force. She leaned against him now, and he kissed her temple. Tommaso is preparing some hot soup for you. You need to eat. I couldn't. Try for me. They walked slowly hand in hand down the stairs. In the kitchen, Tommaso smiled at her and kissed her lips softly. Here, eat. It's good. Inca smiled at him. Did you make it? Tommaso grinned. No. That's how I know it's good. She appreciated both of them trying to make her feel better, and truthfully, she didn't want to be anywhere else. The soup was good, and she managed about half of it. She looked at them both, sitting with her so patiently. Is it weird? What we're doing here, I mean? The three of us. Neither brother looked surprised at her question. Raffaello sighed. I would think to most people, yes. But we are not most people. The love between us is pure, I think. I think so too. Tommaso smoothed his hand down her hair. Inca nodded. I can't deny what we have is incredible. I love you both so so much, but do we have a future? What about when? She got choked up. When do we want to have children? What happens then? That is far in the future, Principessa. Is it though? I'm 28, you are 35. In the next 10 years. We will worry about that when the time comes. Surely if anything what has happened lately shows us we must live in the moment? 
Raffaello's voice was quiet but full of love. When it comes time for children, we will have to talk. She nodded. Because our children cannot be cousins and siblings. That is a step too far even for me. Tommaso nodded. I understand. Although it has happened before, a wife marries a man who dies, then she marries his brother. This is too complicated a discussion for this evening. Mio Carl, are you cold? You're shivering. Raffaello grabbed a throw from the chair next to the fire and wrapped it around her. Inca was only wearing a simple white dress, and she hugged the blanket to her now. But she shook her head. No, I am not cold. I don't know why I'm shivering. The trembling got worse. Tommaso got up and came to her. It's the shock. Raph, help me. They both wrapped their arms around Inca and held her until the trembling subsided. She smiled gratefully at them. No one could love both of you the way I love you, she said simply. Tommaso and Raph looked at each other, each reading the love for this woman in each other's eyes. We will make this work, my love, Raffaello said and pressed his lips to hers. Tommaso nodded. I swear we will. Knox got home utterly exhausted and spent. He collapsed on his couch, taking off his gun belt and closing his eyes. Just five minutes and I'll go to bed. He was on the verge of sleep when his cell phone buzzed. It's me. Ollie. Hey man. What's up? I'm out. On my way home. Is Luna with you? Knox got up and checked the guest room. No man, she's probably at yours. Want me to go check? Would you? She's not answering her phone. Of course I'll. He trailed off when he saw the note on his desk. His heart failed. Ollie, get home now. Now. What? Ollie sounded panicked, but Knox, his chest tight, hung up. His legs felt like jelly. Dear Knox, I'm so sorry. I never meant for Scarlet to get hurt. She was wearing Inca's coat, and when I realized it was Scarlet, it was too late. I ended her pain quickly, but I couldn't take it back. I loved her too. I have to finish this. I'm so sorry. Tell Ali I love him. Goodbye. Luna. It was after eleven when the security guard came to find them. Miss Sardi? There's a Luna Rosenbaum here to see you. I made her wait at the front door because it's late. What do you want me to do? Luna's here? Inca got up, but Tommaso halted her. It's way too late, Inca. Tell Miss Rosenbaum to come back in the morning. No, it's okay. Let me go see her. Thanks, Craig. He nodded and left them. Tommaso shook his head at her. I don't like this. Inca rolled her eyes. It's just Luna. I won't turn my back on a friend. Let her go, Tommaso. Raffaello sounded irritated. You're not her master. Inca threw a grateful look at him and patted Tommaso's hand. I won't be a second. Luna looked as if she were shivering, and Inca reached for her to pull her into the warm of the house. No. She avoided Inca's hand, and Inca frowned. What is it, Bubba? What's going on? Luna was staring at her, studying her intently. Inca got worried. Are you okay? Is Ollie okay? Luna was still staring, her ice-blue eyes wide. It's like a cancer. Inca was confused. What is? She began to shiver now, the night was cold, and her thin white dress was no protection. Come in. I'm cold. Luna gave her a strange smile. You won't be in a minute. Your beauty. It's like a cancer. It infects everything you come into contact with, it always has. All those women. Nancy. Your birth mom. Scarlet. She was wearing your coat. Inca started to get scared now. Luna. She was wearing your coat, and I thought it was you. I thought it was you. Realization dawned, and Inca covered her mouth to stop herself screaming. Oh my gosh. Luna pulled out the gun she was hiding in her pocket and leveled it at Inca. I won't make the same mistake this time. 
No more cancer. And she shot Inca. Inca staggered back, blood blooming across her right side. She stumbled and dropped to the floor as Luna pointed the gun at her again and fired another bullet at her. Inca had raised her arm to defend herself, and the bullet smashed through her forearm and grazed her temple. In horror, she saw Luna place the muzzle against her own head, and as Inca heard shouts coming from every direction, Luna smiled at her and blew her own brains out. The last thing Inca remembered were the horrified faces of her two partner as she lost consciousness. Snowbound Sorrento now. She sat on the stone seat that was carved into the wall of the villa and looked out over the bay. Lights from the city, from the boats that bobbed in the marinas, from Naples across the water, twinkled in the gloom of twilight. Inca rubbed her arm absent-mindedly. The wound, a through and through like the one in her side, had healed now two months after the shooting, but it still ached occasionally. Mostly when she allowed herself to think about what had happened that terrible night. Willowbrook then. She opened her eyes to see Tommaso, Raffaello, and a stranger gazing down at her, all talking at once. There was pain in her side, her arm, her head, and she couldn't see out of her left eye. No, not blind, there was something. Blood. There was blood streaming into her eye. I've been shot. Oh, my Luna. Luna shot me. Luna killed herself. Inca struggled into a sitting position, despite the protestations from her partners and the paramedic attending her, her one good eye searching. She saw the covered body on the marble floor, and the front door to the mansion open behind her. No. No please no, Luna. She pushed their hands away and tried to crawl toward her old friend's body, tears beginning to flood down her face. She screamed at them, hysterical now as they stopped her. Raffaello pulled her forcibly back against him while Tommaso, his beautiful eyes scared, cradled her face in his warm hands. Bella, there's nothing you can do, mio caro, nothing to do, dot let us look after you. Inca stared at him as if uncomprehending. She didn't mean it, she whispered, eventually. It was a mistake. Don't let them crucify her. Please don't let them. Oh my. Ollie. Someone has to tell Ollie. I have to tell Ollie. Miss Sardi, please, we have to take care of you now. The paramedic exchanged worried glances with Tommaso, who nodded. Inca felt the prick of a needle in her arm. They were sedating her. No, she said. No. Please, I need to, I need to. She felt her body betray her again as the sedative took effect. As she lost consciousness, she felt a tear drop down her cheek and Raffaello's lips kissed it away. Raffaello felt sick. He and Tommaso were at the hospital now, waiting in the relative's room as Inca was being examined. When they'd heard the shots and rushed out to the sight of Inca lying on the floor, blood pouring from her side, her arm, and worse, her head, his heart had failed. Looking at Tommaso now, he could see his brother felt the same. Tommaso turned terrified eyes on him. She'll be okay, right? Raffaello knew Tommaso was looking for him to be the strong one again, to be the positive one, but this time, gosh, this time, he didn't know if he could be. The relief at seeing that the head wound Inca had suffered was only a flesh wound, although the blood was counteracted by how she had reacted with panic, fear, and terror. After everything she had been through lately, if she had a psychotic break, no one would blame her. Gosh, what a mess. The horror at seeing Luna Rosenbaum, her blue eyes staring, half her head missing. What had happened? Raffaello felt both rage and sympathy for Ollie, had he put his sister up to this. In his heart, he knew he hadn't, but gosh. I'm going to call Tyler. Tommaso's voice broke into his reverie. He should hear this from me, not the police. Good idea. Tommaso pulled out his phone, but before he could call Tyler, the doctor came in. She'll be fine, he said, nodding to them. Both bullets went straight through with no major damage. Her arm suffered a slight fracture, but it won't even need a cast. Raffaello frowned. I thought she was shot three times. The doctor shook his head. The wound to the head was a deflection, she raised her arm like this. 
He demonstrated, raising his arm in front of his face. The perpetrator aimed at her face, and her arm got in the way. It saved her. From the trajectory, the second bullet would have hit her in the forehead and probably killed her. Raffaello tasted bile then and saw Tommaso wince. Will she need surgery? Minor, just to close the wounds. We'll take her into surgery in a few moments. Would you like to see her before we take her down? Inka was still drowsy from the sedative, but the blood on her face had been cleaned up and butterfly stitches across the grays on her temple. Raffaello couldn't help but see what the doctor had described. She's alive, she's here. He waited until Tommaso had bent down to kiss her, before leaning in. Ti amo. He whispered in her ear as he kissed her cheek. He was aware of a female police officer, a doctor, and a nurse in the room. The last thing they needed now was to have the secret of their relationship out in the open. He didn't think Inca could survive any more pain. Inca nodded at them both. Love you, she whispered and her eyes filled with tears. I don't understand why Luna did it, why? She began to cry quietly and Tommaso sat beside her, his arm wrapped around her. Raffaello was heartsick. He wanted to be able to comfort her like that, declaring his love publicly. Gosh, is that what you're thinking of at a time like this? But Raffaello knew that his love for Inca was becoming his reason for being his whole life. He would give everything to be with her. They're going to take you down soon, but the docs say you could be out in a couple of days. Inca nodded. Will you call Tyler? Tell him not to come back here because of this. Tell him to stay there, stay safe, at least until the funeral. Mom's funeral, that is. After that, please, both of you, can we just go to Italy? I don't want to be here anymore, don't want to be here. She began to sob. She sounded so depressed, so scared, and so devastated that it broke Raffaello's heart. He saw Tommaso blink away tears. Raffaello leaned forward and took her hand. Of course we can leave, Mio Caro. We'll make all the arrangements. Just concentrate on getting well. We'll leave as soon as you're physically able. Inca squeezed his hands. Thank you, Raf. Thank you, Tommaso. Nancy's funeral was attended by most of the townsfolk. Inca clutched Tyler's hand tightly, guilt making her chest ache. She felt the eyes of the congregation on her, judging, blaming. I'm so sorry, Mom. I love you. She felt a hand on the back of her neck, comforting. Raffaello. He and Tommaso had helped carry Nancy's casket into the little church. Hunter, Knox, and a friend of Tyler's, Jim, also helped Tyler as pallbearers. Ollie wasn't there. He had apologized to Tyler with a phone call and told him he wasn't ready to see Inca yet. Tyler had reassured him that they understood, but that was another layer of guilt for Inca. Gosh. The medical examiner hadn't yet released Luna's body, but she knew that when he did, Ollie would not want her at Luna's funeral. Whatever you need, old friend. She sighed. Knox looked over at her and gave her a reassuring smile. She tried to smile back but just shook her head. Knox had been attentive since the shooting. She was grateful, but she knew Tommaso and Raffaello were getting annoyed at his constant presence. Does he think we can't protect you? She thought about that now, staring over at the sound. So much loss. She brushed a tear away. Boomer came wandering around the corner and shuffled over to her, sticking his nose into her hand for a fuss. Hello. She was surprised. Who let you out? I did. I thought he needed a run. Raffaello followed Boomer around the corner. Hope that's okay. She smiled and nodded. Raffaello sat down next to her, pulled his tie apart and undid his collar. He winked at her, reaching out and running his hand lightly down the back of her head. She leaned into his touch. How are you, Bella? She nodded again. Okay. What about you? Same. He gave her a sad smile. It was a beautiful service. Least I could do. Her voice had a catch in it. Raffaello frowned and leaned his face closer to hers. Hey. She looked at him. 
He put his head on the side and smiled. It's not your fault. He slid his hand onto the back of her neck. There were tears in her eyes. How can it not be, Raph? My name cut into her and the other victims. Why doesn't he just kill me? Raffaello winced. Please, Bella. Please stop saying that. I can't bear it. The thought of you dying. It would kill me. Hey. I thought I'd find you hiding out here. Hi, Raffaello. Knox pushed the back door open. Inca turned and smiled at him. Raffaello ignored him, smirking when Boomer started to growl. There was an uncomfortable silence. Knox cleared his throat. Some of your guests are leaving, Inca. Raffaello looked round at the other man and gave him a cold stare. Inca began to stand up, but Raffaello pulled her down. I'm sure they'll find their way to the front door. Raffaello's tone was frosty. Inca's done enough for the day. And they're Tyler's guests too, in case you've forgotten. Knox stared back at him, eyes narrowed. Inca. Inca sighed. It's okay, Knox. They'll find me if they want me. If not, as you wish. Knox turned and went back into the house. Jerk. For once, Inca agreed with Raffaello. Today, Knox felt more like an intruder. His presence had been irksome, his ability to always be there when she turned around irritating her. She looked at Raffaello sleek in his dark suit and smiled. You look handsome in a suit. He grinned, cocky. Oh, I know. She laughed. Boomer, who had been lying patiently on the grass, got up and gave a little woof. Despite Raffaello's initial wariness of the dog, they'd become good friends. I'm actually going to miss this little monster when we go to Italy. Sure you don't want to bring him? I do, but I don't want to put him through that flight. Besides, Tyler wants to take him back to Connecticut. Shame. She sighed and held her hand out to Raffaello. Come with me and help walk this pooch. Yes, ma'am. He took her hand, winding his fingers through hers. They walked down to the cove, the full moon lighting their way. Ollie stood at the edge of the woods, watching Inca and Raffaello walking along the little jetty. He watched them walk to the end of it, both of them looking around to make sure they weren't seen. Then to Ollie's shock, he watched Raffaello Winter take her in his arms, slide his hands into her hair and kiss her. Ollie's jaw tightened, and he slipped away from the scene before getting into his car. So, Inca was cheating on Tommaso with Raffaello? He had to admit he was shocked, stunned actually. To say it was out of character for Inca to be unfaithful was an understatement, or so he had thought. An idea occurred to him then, one he couldn't shake. And so, when he saw the Winters and Inca leave, hugging Tyler goodbye, he followed them home, at a decent interval of course. The Winters' security was laughably easy to get past. Ollie walked around the perimeter of the house, checking in all of the windows. At first, all was dark and quiet. Then he saw the flicker of firelight from a large window at the rear of the property. He edged to the window and peered in. As he watched the three of them, he began to both smile and shake his head. Inca was sleeping with both of them, or rather, from the looks of it, they were the ones sleeping with her, both absorbed in pleasuring Inca's beautiful body. Ollie couldn't stop staring at them. The three of them were so gloriously good looking that it was almost hypnotic to watch. Ollie felt himself getting hard and turned away, making his way back down the grounds. Hey! One of the security guards had spotted him and was running towards him. Ollie sighed. He had his gun, but he didn't want to start any trouble. Instead, he got his badge out. Police! Just following up on a report of an intruder. The security guard looked skeptical, but allowed Ollie to leave. Ollie drove back into town, deep in thought. Did the killer know about Inca and the Winters? Was Nancy's murder a punishment for that? Kevin Harnett was still in jail, and now that Nancy had been murdered, it made no sense that Harnett was the serial killer. From talking to him, Ollie had surmised that his only goal had been to kill Inca for leaving him. He didn't possess the knowledge or means to escape justice if he was behind the other murders. Ollie parked next to the police station and sat in his car. 
like a cancer. He kept replaying Luna's words in his mind. He still couldn't believe that his sister had died, let alone shot Inca. They had grown up together. Was Luna right? Was Inca to blame? No. Even in his grief, he knew she had done nothing to bring this down on them. It was the work of a madman, a psychopath. He just hoped the killer wouldn't get to live out his sick dream. Ollie hoped beyond hope that Inca would be safe. The town seemed subdued still, the week after Nancy's funeral. When Inca took Boomer to the country park on Monday morning, she noticed no one else walking their dogs, and no kids sledding in the snow. With a jolt, she realized that the whole island was mourning the loss of one of its own. She let the dog off the leash and walked slowly across the park to the beach, sitting on one of the large pieces of driftwood. The water, unusually calm, was an emerald mirror. Boomer bounded gleefully into it, and Inca laughed, brought out of reverie by the dog's antics. She glanced around her. No one else was on the beach. In a few days, she would leave with Raffaello and Tommaso for Italy, for sun, for heat, for escape. Tyler and Boomer would be in Connecticut, and there would be nothing left for her here. Would she ever come back? Her thoughts drifted to Ollie, and she felt sadness settle in her heart. Would they ever find their way back as friends? The thought that they might not brought tears to her eyes, and when Boomer came to check on his mistress, she hugged him to her and buried her hot tears in his fur. Sorrento now. And now she was here, her physical injuries almost healed, but still hurting inside for what had happened. More than that, she was angry. Angry at Kevin for tormenting her all those years, angry at Ollie for playing fast and loose with her heart, angry at Luna. Angry at herself. Had Luna been right? Was her perceived beauty a cancer? Was she really responsible for Kevin's actions? Ollie's? No. She knew she wasn't. It disgusted her that she was judged merely on her physical attributes. I'm more than someone's idea of beauty, she thought savagely. What she would take responsibility for, though, was her acceptance of the strange relationship between her and the Winter Twins. Because it was odd, she knew that, and she knew she was being careless with both of their hearts. If their love for her caused a rift between them, she would never forgive herself. A cool breeze blew in through the open window, and she shivered but enjoyed the sensation on her hot skin. She heard voices in the hallway and looked up to see Raffaello push open the door. Tommaso was behind him, and she smiled at them. Hey, how was the meeting? Long and deathly dull, Raffaello said, pulling off his tie. Tommaso grinned. He's not wrong, Principessa. How was your evening? Inca slid off the window and padded barefoot to them. Lonely. Raffaello smiled down at her, bending to kiss her. I think we can do something about that. What do you say, Tommaso? Tommaso's fingers were already at the zipper of her dress, pulling it slowly down to kiss the length of her spine. Inca shivered with pleasure as Raffaello's lips found her throat. I think, Mio Caro, I need to shower first. Would you care to join us? In the shower, Raffaello kissed her thoroughly, while Tommaso teased her. Then he stood, his smile wide, his eyes lazy with desire. Do it, Raff. Gosh, when he did that, Inca felt herself growing. Raffaello picked her up and carried her, still dripping with water, to the bed and pulled her in. They found their rhythm easily. Afterward, they would begin the kinkier games, the brothers tying her up. Inca reveled in the intercourse, it had freed something inside of her, something wild and uninhibited and wanton. When they fell asleep was when she felt most secure, held by both of them, loved by both of them. For her, since they had been in this beautiful country, she had found where she belonged. The next morning Raf who woke her up, his lips against hers. Their gaze intense on each other. I love you so much, she whispered and he smiled, kissing her. Il mio amore, he said softly and stroked her hair away from her face. Beside them, Tommaso slept soundly, and Inca ran a fingertip over a frown line between his eyes. Is he okay? Raffaello sighed. I'm not sure. Inca, there is something you should know about Tommaso. He's very sensitive. Inca looked at him in horror. 
Oh gosh, do you think? Raf smiled, hushing her with his mouth. Not about this. Not about us. You've seen how he is. He loves this whole situation. No, what I meant was. We're here in Italy, where we both want to be. The only thing is, our father is here too. He and Tommaso do not have the best relationship. Why? Raffaello hesitated. That's not for me to tell you. I just know that when our father comes here, and he will come here, Tommaso will need both of us to get through it. Inca nodded, her eyes fierce. He's got us, Raf. I won't let your father hurt him. Raf kissed her. I know you won't. Inca looked over at her sleeping partner. Sometimes he seems so much younger than you, she said softly. And yet other times he's so. Bossy. She couldn't help the laugh that escaped her. Yes. She giggled and Raf joined in, shaking the bed so that Tommaso could open one eye. I'm trying to sleep, Rompicoglioni. He grumbled, which only made Inca laugh harder. She stroked her fingers through his messy curls. Come join us, beautiful boy, she said in a low purr. Tommaso grinned and pulled her down on top of him, her back to his chest. Let me in. He murmured into her ear, and she gasped. He nodded to his brother. Raffaello grinned. Inca sighed happily. Would she ever get tired of this? She loved it when they went out into the city together to hang out at one of the cafes or visit the bar at one of Raf's clubs. Walking through the streets, arm in arm with them both, she would look at people staring at them and wonder if they could tell she had both of the beautiful men at her side. She loved being with both of them, she would do and try anything with them. She had never been so happy in her life. Here, in this glorious city, she could forget the horrors back home and bury her head in the sand about the fact that more than one person had tried, and failed, to kill her. She could forget that she would have to go back to face her adoptive father, her friends. Ollie. Ollie's devastation at Luna's suicide knew no bounds. He had refused to see Inca, and she knew he blamed her for his sister's death. He and Tommaso had nearly come to blows when Tommaso demanded that a thorough investigation be made into whether Ollie had put Luna up to it. She'd used their dad's old service revolver, a gun that Ollie had thought safely locked up in his gun cabinet. It was the same gun used to kill Scarlet. What a mess, Knox had said to Raffaello when they dragged the two men apart, and Raff had hauled Tommaso out to his waiting car and told him to stay there. Raffaello sighed and apologized to Knox. It's okay, dude, the other man had said sadly. There are no winners here. Tell Inca I hope she feels better soon. Come see her. Raffaello had urged him. I know she'd like to see you. He had looked across the room to where Ali was slumped in a chair. I know she'd like to see a friend before we leave for Italy. Raffaello had told Inca all of this as they flew to Sorrento, a few days after she was released from the hospital. Knox had kept his promise and visited her, and he too had told her that Ali didn't want to see her. Inca was sad but resigned. Just tell him I'm sorry and I love him, and I still love Luna. I will, sweetheart. They'd hugged each other tightly and Inca felt moved to tears. I'm so sorry about everything, Knox. It's not your fault, baby. Everything is just messed up. He let her go and studied her. You okay? What's Tyler doing? He said he's going to stay with Nancy's family for a while. He doesn't want to come back here yet, either. Knox sighed. Just tell me you won't disappear forever, Inca. I promise. Inca called Tyler in Connecticut after lunch. It was still early there, and her adoptive father sounded depressed and lonely. Come to Sorrento, Inca begged him, but he demurred. No, sweetheart. I think it's best if you stay there and be happy with Tommaso. Your mother would not want you to be in Willowbrook. I'm staying in Connecticut for the time being. Nancy's nieces and nephews seem to want me here. They love Boomer too. I miss you, Popsicle, she whispered, and she heard him let out a shaky breath. I miss you too, Bubba. And I don't want you blaming yourself for any of this. But she did blame herself, how could she not? 
Raffaello, seeing her blue mood, suggested they go into the city and distract themselves. Tommaso told them he was flying to Milan that afternoon for a meeting. Since when? Raffaello looked startled. Tommaso smiled. I've neglected my work for too long, and there's a chance we could get a meeting with the government's environmental department at last. I have to be there for that. Hey. He kissed Inca softly. Promise me you'll miss me. You know I will, she whispered and pressed her lips to his. When will you be back? Raffaello waited for them to draw apart, before asking. Tommaso rubbed a hand through his hair. I think tomorrow night but could be longer. You'll be okay? Raffaello grinned. Of course. Look, call us when you get in. I will. Raffaello and Inca walked through the streets of the city before finding another cafe to sit in. Inca looked around it. You know, I do miss running the tea house, she said quietly. I used to love the social aspect more than anything, but also the smell of the teas, the organization. I miss working. Raffaello stroked his hand down her cheek. You know, we could always open a tea house here. I'm tired of running clubs. I'm about 15 years too old to be in them, for one thing. Maybe we could open a chain. Inca smiled. Ambitious. Raffaello grinned. Okay, so I took the idea and ran with it. How about we just open one? Totally your baby. I do have the money from the Sakura. No. He said. That's your nest egg. Let me finance it. Inca pondered. Halves. Raffaello rolled his eyes. Fine. Let me just. He trailed off, suddenly staring over the other side of the small square. Inca followed his vision. What is it? Raffaello's eyes raked the street, and then he shook his head. No, sorry. I just thought I saw someone. Who? It doesn't matter. Sorry anyway, yes. So we'll go scout some locations around the city. In fact, why don't we do that now? He seemed in a hurry to move, and Inca didn't question him. They strolled hand in hand, trying to spot empty storefronts or other suitable locations, but by the time they ate dinner at a local eatery, Inca felt tired, just wanting to go back to the villa. She took a long soak as Raffaello caught up with some business calls. She was just drying herself when he came into the bathroom and stopped, his eyes soft on hers. So beautiful, he said simply, and she went into his arms, feeling his hands roaming over her bare skin. Tonight would be the first time since they had been a threesome that Raffaello and Inca would spend the night alone, and she knew he was as excited as she was. Shedding his own clothes quickly, Inca stroked his face. What do you want to do to me, Raffaello? Everything. He groaned, gathering her to him. His mouth clamped onto her shoulder, his teeth biting down, causing pain, but she cried out, begging him not to stop. Animal instincts took them over. Raffaello kept his focus on her. She clawed at his back and bit his lower lip with her teeth. They finished quickly, and then Raffaello tugged her to the floor, grabbing a silk tie and binding her hands behind her back. Unable to touch him, Inca wriggled with pleasure, his hands roamed over her belly. Raffaello felt like a man possessed, not giving her the chance to recover. He felt animal, feral in his desire, his desperation for her limitless. Gosh, Inca. Raffaello collapsed on top of her, freeing her hands. Inca's body was undulating with her breathlessness, but she grinned at him. Raff, have you ever made love in public? Or at least somewhere where you might get caught? Raffaello chuckled. Feeling kinky, Miss Sardi. Always. Well, he said, we can certainly explore that. My club in the city has an office upstairs with a two-way mirror. When the room is dark, no one in the club can see, but we can see everything. Hum. Inca pushed him onto his back and straddled him. Now that sounds like something we should definitely try. Raffaello chuckled and pulled her face down so he could kiss her. I love you, Inca Sardi. Inca nuzzled his nose. She gave a happy sigh. I love you, Raffaella Winter, more than you will ever know.
When Inca was asleep, and when Raffaello was able to drag himself away from her, he walked down to his study and closed the door behind him. He called the head of his security team and asked him to meet him. The man, Pietro, nodded to him as he entered the study. What's up, boss? Raffaello indicated he should sit. Has anyone from my father's team been in contact with you? Not as far as I know. Why? Because I think I saw a couple of his goons follow Inca and me earlier. I hardly need to tell you I don't want my father anywhere near Inca or Tommaso when he returns. I'm concerned they may try to take Inca to mess with us. Pietro made a disgusted noise. He had known Raffaello and Tommaso since they were kids, and he was unfailingly loyal to the twins. Their father was another matter, and Pietro had no time for the man. Edgar Winter was, in Pietro's opinion, a nasty piece of work. Jealous of his son's looks, tastes, and talents, he excelled in trying to destroy his offspring's confidence and lives. We won't let that happen, Raff, I promise. But we won't be able to prevent your father from coming to the house. It does still belong to the family. Raffaello looked unhappy. I know. Just make sure his security knows that Inca is off limits. No problem. You know, if he's here, then at least we can be sure to keep an eye on him. Right. I just worry about Tommaso's reaction. Thank you, Pietro. He went back to bed, curving his body around Inca's. Although he had made his peace with sharing her with Tommaso, after all, he had been the cheater this time, this time alone with her was precious. She had entirely invaded his heart and mind, there wasn't a second, he wasn't thinking about her or their future. Except, how could he think of their future? How would it work? While they were young and free, yes, they could revel in their unusual relationship. But what about when marriage and kids were an issue? Raffaello sighed and buried his face in her hair, breathing in the scent of her shampoo and her skin. For now, he would enjoy the fact that they were safe, that no one here would try to kill her. Back in Washington, he had lived every day in terror that she would be murdered. That terrible night when she'd been shot. Inca murmured in her sleep and turned around, snuggling into his arms. Half asleep, her lips sought him, and as soon as her skin touched his, he responded. Bella, do you want me? He wasn't even sure if she was awake, but without opening her eyes, she nodded and slowly hooked her leg over his hip. Raffaello moved slowly, carefully, not wanting to break the spell of this dreamlike coupling. She whispered his name so softly as he trailed his lips across her soft skin, kissing her closed eyelids and the sweet swell of her cheeks. He allowed himself a fantasy that his child was conceived, and that Inca would be his alone. He wanted more than anything to be with this woman forever, to have her to himself, but he would never tell her or Tommaso that. They were the two people he loved more than anything in this world, and he would not cause them pain. So, he swallowed his own pain and reveled in these small moments, just enjoying the fact their life here in Italy was the happiest he'd ever been. But of course it didn't stay that way for long. Edgar Winter took the envelope from his head of security and opened it. The photographs were sharp and focused. Edgar started to smile. His son, Raffaello, with a dark-haired beauty, gosh she was something else, sitting in the middle of Sorrento, none the wiser that they were being watched. His son was kissing the beauty, his face soft with love. Who's the girl? Her name is Inca Sardi. American, from Washington State. I did some digging, apparently she was injured in a shooting recently. As well, an ex-husband tried to kill her. Her mother was murdered too, not long ago. Adopted mother, I should say. The birth mother was also murdered, but Ms. Sardi never knew her. Edgar raised an eyebrow. That's a pretty horrific history. What does she want with my son? The security man smiled nastily, his eyes triumphant. Sons, he corrected, and handed him another photograph. This one wasn't so clear, taken from a distance through a window. What was unmistakable, though, was that Inca Sardi was being thoroughly and enthusiastically taken by both of his sons. Well, well, well. Edgar was almost giddy with glee. My boys have gotten themselves a tramp. His security head grinned. Look her too. 
Yes, she was. Edgar studied the photograph. Her body was curvy and full, her skin beautiful, her long dark hair tumbling down her back. He looked at his guard. I think it's time I reconnected with my boys and their lovely companion. Make the arrangements, would you? Washington State. Belinda Clements hesitated before she pushed open the door to the police station. It had been years since she had spoken to Oliver Rosenbaum, years since she'd gotten him drunk. He'd been so angry at himself the next morning and had warned her not to tell Inca. She had laughed in his face but inside, she hadn't told Inca. Why? Because she hadn't wanted to burn her bridges with Ollie, she'd been crazy about him since they were kids, only to see him with her mortal enemy, Inca Sardi. Belinda had always hated her for her beauty, her warmth and intelligence, and the way she was popular with everybody. It was sickening. When she heard that Inca had been shot, she cheered on the television. When she'd heard who the shooter was. Gosh, the smile disappeared. So she was here now, a couple of months after Luna's death. A decent interval. Inca had recovered but had been spirited away by her Italian billionaires. Gosh, that rankled, which left Ali all alone. She'd heard, via town gossip, that he was focusing entirely on work and was pushing everyone else away. Knox Westerwick was on the telephone and didn't even look up as she went in. Ollie was pouring himself a coffee but stopped when he saw her. Belinda smiled at him. Hi, Ollie. Hey. His voice showed his surprise. How long have you been back in town? A while. There was an awkward silence, and then Ollie nodded toward the coffee pot. Want some? Yes, please. She took the coffee from him and then asked if she could talk to him for a while. He looked surprised. Sure. How are you? Belinda blew on her coffee to cool it and looked up at him. Ollie shifted a little uncomfortably. You know. Getting there. Keeping busy. I'm so sorry, Ollie. I would have come before, but I thought you might want to be alone. Ollie gave her a strange smile. And we haven't seen each other in what? Ten years? Ten years? Really? Gosh, time goes so quickly. Ollie studied her. What have you been up to? Belinda smiled sheepishly. Married twice, divorced twice. Could never stick at it. You. I heard you and Inca split. Ollie's eyes took on a guarded look, and he glanced away. That didn't stick either, but that was my fault, not Inca's. He was obviously waiting for her to say something about his ex, but Belinda shook her head. I feel bad for the way I used to treat her. Put it this way. I know better now. I wouldn't say we'd ever be friends, but is she still away? Ollie nodded, seeming to be relieved that Belinda was being pleasant. Yes. After. What happened, she didn't want to be around this place anymore. Can't say I blame her. Belinda put her hand on his. No one would judge you if, well, never mind. Look, I wanted to say hi, maybe we could grab a drink one evening. Ollie hesitated, glancing over at Knox, who was studiously ignoring them, then nodded. Sure. Why not? Belinda smiled. I'll call you. Soon though, okay? Sure. Ollie sat back in his chair, not knowing what to make of Belinda Clement's visit. She certainly seemed. Changed? Was that the right word? But he remembered all the times she and Inca had clashed right from childhood, and he'd always had Inca's back. So why was Belinda reaching out to him now? Did she sense that he was still raw from Luna's suicide and see it as an opportunity to stick the knife in Inca's back? He winced at that. Way wrong expression, dude. Knox had disappeared from the office and called out to an incident. Suddenly, Ollie wanted to talk to his oldest friend, his old love. He glanced at the clock. It would be early evening in Italy. Only hesitating for a second, he pulled out his cell phone and dialed. When he heard her warm voice, he knew he had made the right decision. Hi, he said softly. It's me. Inca was so happy that Ollie had called her, that her mood infected dinner. 
Tommaso had returned, and she and Raffaello told him about their plans to open a tea house in the city. Tommaso smiled. I think that's a great idea. I know how bored you've been. He grinned mischievously as she laughed. Oh yes. So bored. Actually, Tommaso, we have an invitation for you. Raffaello tried to hide his smile as Inca giggled. How would you like to come clubbing with us? Tommaso looked surprised. Really? The other two laughed. Yes, Inca said. We have a plan. Okay. He looked suspicious. Will I like it? Oh, I promise you will love it. They took a cab into the city at 10 p.m. Raffaello's club was packed with partygoers, the atmosphere sweaty and sultry, drinks flowing. The three of them stayed downstairs for a while, drinking and dancing, grinding up on each other. Inca was wearing a short dark maroon dress which clung to her full breasts and flared out at the waist, a simple long gold chain her only jewelry, her long dark hair tumbling in waves to her waist. She was a happy drunk, and Raffaello nudged his brother as they watched her dance. Look at her, he said in an awestruck voice. Have you ever seen anything that beautiful before? Tommaso laughed. No, brother, I never have. Inca danced over to them, grabbing their hands and sliding them under her dress. She grinned at their surprise as they encountered bare flesh. I belong to you, she said to them. Soon, Raffaello led them both upstairs to his office, where, as promised, an entire wall looked out onto the dance floor. Inca grinned when she saw it and pressed herself against the glass. And they can't see in. Not when the light is like this. If the lights went out below, then yes they could. Inca turned around and faced them, pausing for a second but then pulling her dress over her head. Under it, she was wearing the leather harness, the straps crisscrossing her beautiful body, her breasts, over her belly, framing her navel. Then let's hope the lights don't go out. Eventually, they decided to walk through the warm night back up to the villa. It was nearly dawn before they reached home, and falling into bed, they slept soundly until mid-morning. Inca was in the shower when she heard shouting. Dressing quickly, she ran to see what was wrong. She heard Tommaso angrily berating someone. Why did you let him in? What the hell were you thinking? Inca saw someone standing a little way down the driveway, and she went to Raffaello. What is it, Raff? What's going on? Raffaello turned to her, his eyes dark. It's our father, Inca. Our father is here. Belinda felt a hand under her elbow, and Knox Westerwick pulled her into an alleyway. What are you playing at? Irritated, she wrenched her arm out of his grip. It's none of your concern, Knox. It is if you're messing with my friend's head. Belinda took out a cigarette and lit it. I'm doing no such thing. I'm merely reaching out to an old friend. Knox snorted. Spare me the crap. Belinda studied him. Please don't tell me you've gone soft on me, Knox. You were the only other interesting person in this shithole of a town. Knox sneered at her. You're not interesting, Belinda. You're what you always were. A stone-cold woman. Belinda smiled coldly. But, apart from that woman who is in Italy, practically the only woman left alive. At least, of your friends. She knew it was a low blow, and she watched Knox's expression shut down. You're mistaken, Belinda. We were never friends. She watched him walk away and smiled to herself. Inca stayed out of the way while Tommaso and Raffaello dealt with their father. Raffaello came to tell her that his father was insisting on staying at the villa for a couple of weeks, and they'd agreed, on the condition that his security team left. He agreed, if he could keep his private secretary with him, an obsequious man called Giuliano, who looked more a mafia heavy than a secretary. After all, Edgar had told his sons, This house is mine. Inca was introduced to him briefly, and in those moments, she formed an opinion of him that wasn't positive. He was handsome and tall, like his sons, but he had none of their warmth or joy. Instead, his dark eyes were small and piercing, and the way he smiled at her, half mocking, half dismissive, didn't make her want to know him any better. 
Instead, she and Raffaello concentrated on their plans to open a tea house and spent a great deal of time in the city. Tommaso accompanied them when he could, but his own work seemed to be keeping him busy. Inca had her own room, they all thought it best while Edgar was there, but Raffaello made sure it had a working lock and Inca didn't fail to lock it at night. Edgar made her uneasy, the way his eyes would rake over her body made her feel nauseous. She managed to escape his presence mostly, but one day, just by chance, he managed to corner her in the garden. Inca had found a little quiet place where she could curl up with a book, but he came upon it, and Inca couldn't see a way to politely excuse herself as he sat down beside her. You have certainly made my son very happy, he began, his tone pleasant. Tomaso's a wonderful man, she said carefully, edging away from him on the seat. Edgar laughed. Of course he is. Tomaso. Inca flushed. Did he know? How could he? They had been so careful. Both of your sons are a credit, she said, not being able to help the snark she felt. To their mother jerk, not you. Edgar smiled at her coldly, she saw her barb had hit home. And how about your family, Inca? I'm sorry to hear about your mother, your adoptive mother, I mean. She stiffened. Thank you. Your birth family is interesting, of course. Inca's heart froze. Not really. Edgar feigned surprise. Really? I would call murder interesting. Inca swallowed, she made to stand, but Edgar's hand shot out and pulled her down again. My family is none of your business, Mr. Winter. Oh, but it is. Your birth mother was murdered. Because of you, I understand. Inca gritted her teeth and said nothing, looking away from his penetrating gaze. Strange, they say bread always falls on the buttered side. Your mother got what she deserved. Creep. Inca lost her temper then. Screw you, she hissed, and he laughed in delight. That's better, a little spirit. So tell me, Inca, will you go crazy like your mother? Will you do to Tommaso, or, let's be honest, Raffaello, what your mother did to your father? Because then, I assure you, my delectable Inca, it will be very much my business. She wrenched her hand away from his grip and stepped away. I have no idea what you are talking about, Winter, but I will tell you this. Tommaso and Raffaello deserve better than a good-for-nothing like you for a father. Whatever it is that you did to them, that you did to Tommaso, I will make you pay for it. Just watch me. She stalked off, her anger flooding through her veins like hot lava. Jerk. She wanted to scream the words, but she knew if she did, the twins would come running and all hell would break loose. No, this was her fight, not theirs. What the hell had he meant by what your mother did to your father? She locked herself away in her bedroom. Later, when Raffaello came home telling her about the premises he'd found for their business, he looked so happy Inca didn't tell him about the incident with Edgar that morning. Inca looked out of the window and chewed her lip. If she told Raffaello what Edgar had done to her, Raffaello would go insane and probably shoot the man where he stood. Inca gave a grim smile. No, she couldn't risk Raffaello going mad, but she had to tell him something, something that made him aware of the depth of Edgar's hatefulness, his threats. Because that had scared her more than anything. Inca went into her bedroom and started to strip, throwing on some old sweats. She moved to the window to close the blinds and then stopped. Edgar Winter was standing in the gardens, staring up at her window. His smile was chilling. Inca slammed the blinds then. Making a decision, she went to find the twins. Tyler Sardi was tired, but happy to be with Nancy's family. Being with them had helped him grieve for his beloved wife, but he missed Inca terribly. He sat alone on the porch of the house, Boomer asleep at his feet. His cell phone buzzed and he smiled when he saw the caller ID. Hello, sweetheart. It's good to hear from you. Hey, Popsicle. How are you? Tyler and Inca chatted easily for a while. Then, hearing his daughter take a deep breath in, he felt his chest tighten. What is it, little one? Dad, I need to ask you something, and it's not going to be easy. But I need you to tell me the truth now. Please. 
Tyler closed his eyes. He had known this moment would come, for years, ever since Inca was a teenager, he had been waiting for it. It's about your birth parents, isn't it? Yes it is. Please, just tell me everything you know, however hard it might be to hear. Tyler sighed. I will but before I do please Inca, just tell me, are you in trouble? Is that why you need to know right now? No, she hesitated. I'm not in trouble, but I could potentially be if I don't know all the facts. There is someone who could make things difficult. His heart was beating hard against his ribs. Inca. I just need to know so I can tell Tommaso and Raffaello, before they hear it, from someone who could twist it. Dad, did my birth mom kill my father? Oh gosh. Yes, sweetheart. I'm sorry, she did. He felt strangely relieved to be telling her the truth. She was very sick, schizophrenic and one day she snapped and beat him to death. She tried to take you with her when she attempted suicide, but you survived. There was a long silence on the other end of the phone. Inca. Are you okay? He was relieved to hear her voice strong, resigned. Yes, Pops, I'm fine. I think I always knew it was something like that, so it's not the biggest shock. I don't remember it. That's good. Yes. Tyler rubbed his eyes. Sweetheart. I think we both need to go home at some point and make our peace with what happened. The lawyers are on at me to get Nancy's estate settled, and I think. Well, I think I'll sell the house and move out here permanently. Nancy would want me to start again, and I do like it here. So does Boomer. Inca chuckled quietly. I miss his shaggy head. But yeah dad, I think you're right. At this moment, I can't imagine going back to Willowbrook for anything other than to say goodbye. Italy feels like home already. Tommaso feels like home. There was a slight hesitation after she said his name, which Tyler picked up on. Raffaello too, yes? Yes. They're good boys. They are truly pops. I know you had your doubts. Not anymore. They've kept you safe and that's all I ask. When Inca had said goodbye, Tyler stared out at the setting sun. It was cold here, but somehow it didn't matter. Inca was safe, the winter twins had kept her that way, and for that he was grateful. Tyler wasn't stupid. He had guessed at some kind of unusual arrangement between his daughter and the winter twins, but he couldn't judge any of them harshly. They made each other happy, and that's all he could ask. Two weeks, Tyler said to himself. Two weeks and I'll go home, settle things. He scratched Boomer's silky ears and sighed. Time to move on. Time to live. Raffaello was like a little kid on Christmas morning as he showed her around the empty coffee house. He'd spotted it by chance as he'd passed to go to a friend's. It had beautiful views over the bay over to Vesuvius. A balcony on the second floor overlooked the streets. Gosh, this is perfect, Inca said as Raffaello pulled her into his arms. You're perfect, Mio Carl, he said softly. His eyes were shining, and she could tell he was excited about the place. We can complete this this week if you really like it. I do, I really do. But his lips were against hers then, and grinning, he danced her back into the empty building. Inca giggled at the mischievous look on his face. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Winter, and you're a very, very rude boy. But she didn't protest as he lifted her onto the counter and pushed her legs apart. Always so much underwear on. He mock protested as he removed her panties. She collapsed into laughter as he bunched up the delicate cotton and threw them out of the window. They were my favorite pair. She protested, but then he was between her legs. He drove her to a state of almost frenzy, then unzipped himself. His eyes never left hers. Ti amo tanto, he said. I love you so much. She clung to him as they moved together, her lips hungry against his. Ti amo, Raffaello. E amo. Inca sposami, sposami et a ser mia per sempre. Marry me and be mine forever. And at that moment, only the two of them existed in the world. She nodded, hot tears dropping down her cheeks. Yes, Raffaello. Yes, I will marry you. 
Of course, when they had returned to reality, they knew it wouldn't be as easy. Tommaso. I can't break his heart, Inca whispered. I won't do it. I love you, Raffaello, I do, more than I love both of you. I can't hurt him. He kissed her softly. I know. I'm sorry I put you in this position. I should never have asked you. It was just in the moment it felt. Right, she said and leaned against him. It did. It does. But not at the expense of Tommaso. Raffaello nodded. I know. I know. Please, do not make yourself unhappy, Mio Caro. We three are happy. Let us stay like this. But however happy the three of them were, there were two things standing in the way. One, their father. While he was there, they had to keep their distance from each other. Inca was growing increasingly tired of letting this man dictate to them. No more, she told the twins, and that night she led Tommaso to Raffaello's room, and they slept together. When they were asleep, Inca woke to see Edgar standing at the end of the bed, watching them. She met his gaze steadily until he smirked and walked out. She slid from the bed and locked the door after him. There. Now he knows. No more secrets. She didn't care what Edgar Winter thought of her, if he thought she was a slime ball, so be it. The other thing that stood in their way was her unfinished business. I think I have to go back for a while just to say goodbye. Neither brother thought it was a great idea, but they understood why she needed to do it. We'll come with you, Raffaello said. We won't interfere, but I don't think either of us feels comfortable with you being there without us. Inca nodded, but something was bothering her. No, bothering was the wrong word. Haunting. And she couldn't pin down exactly what it was, just that soon, very soon, all this would end. That she would die, she could feel death at her shoulder, just waiting for the opportunity. So she was greedy, wanting to spend all of her time with Raffaello and Tommaso, not caring what anyone else thought. At night they shut the rest of the world out and made love to each other, then talked until dawn, making plans. Inca worried about Raffaello, who seemed to be plagued with nightmares and dreams that he would not share with them, but which would keep him up. Inca was thinking about this as she went into the study to return a book. Deep in thought, she pushed open the door and went to the bookshelf. As she slid the book back into place, the door behind her slammed. She turned and saw Edgar Winter smiling nastily at her. Alone at last. That's all he had to say to let her know this wasn't going to be a friendly meeting. She glanced at the window. If she could get to it, she could push it open and get away. He caught up with her before she got halfway across the room. Let me go. She struggled against his strong hands and he laughed. I don't think so, Inca. How about you just lie back and let me show you what a real man could do for you? Losing her temper, she laughed in his face. A real man, you piece of trash, doesn't spend his life trying to destroy his sons. What have I destroyed, Inca? Tell me. Because the way I see it, my boys have had every luxury, and now. They get to be with a pretty woman like you. He had her trapped against the wall, and his hand snaked up under her skirt. Inca screamed, but Edgar clamped his hand over her mouth. Come on, beautiful, what's your problem? After all, you're sleeping with both of my boys. Surely you have something left for me. He was twice her size and struggled though she might, Inca couldn't get free from him. He slammed her down onto the desk. Inca kicked out at him, got lucky, catching his groin with her heel, and he buckled. She rolled from the desk, sobbing, but he grabbed her ankle and pulled her down. No you don't, you little slimeball. I'm going to take what I'm owed, and afterward, I'll decide whether or not I'll let you live another minute. She felt him watching her and struggled to stand up, pain racked her body, and as she looked at him she was horrified to see lust in his eyes. He's enjoying my pain, she realized, he's turned on by it. Adrenaline kicked in then, and she managed to stand up straight. The searing pain in her stomach dulled. Please don't. But he didn't listen. For Inca, the next few minutes were worse than hell. Edgar grinning triumphantly, nastily. Inca was sobbing, her arms flailing around for anything, anything to help her, when her fingers felt steel. 
scissors that had fallen from the desk during the struggle. She gripped them as best she could and drove the point into Edgar's shoulder. He roared in pain and jerked back. He screamed for his guard, who ran in. Hold her down, he ordered as he ripped the scissors from Inca's hand. Inca went cold but she screamed and fought with her captors. As Edgar raised the scissors a shot rang out and plaster from the ceiling rained down on them. Edgar stopped. Tommaso, his face contorted with rage, leveled the gun at his father. Let her go. Now. Edgar gave a nod and Inca was released, still sobbing. She ran to Tommaso, who put his free arm around her, pressing his lips to her temple. It's okay now, Bella. You're safe. Edgar smirked and Tommaso's eyes narrowed. He leveled the gun at his father's head. Give me one more reason, father. Just one. His father's guard edged forward, but from behind them, Inca heard Raffaello enter the room. Don't. He said to the guard, who balked. Raff, take Inca outside and help her. Daddy dearest, and I are going to have a little chat. Raffaello and Inca exchanged worried glances. Tommaso, without looking away from his father, half smiled. It's okay, both of you. Leave us. Whatever had passed between Tommaso and his father, he never told them, but when he came to join them, to tell them that Edgar had left the house, he seemed different. Stronger. He and Raffaello hugged for a long moment, and then Tommaso asked if he could speak with Inca alone. Of course, brother. Raffaello smiled at them both, then left the room, closing it quietly behind him. Tommaso sat down next to Inca, his fingers sweeping the hair back from her face, briefly touching her split lip. Are you okay, Principessa? She nodded, leaning against him. Her eyes searched his face. Are you? He considered the smile. Yes, actually. More than okay. I said everything I had ever wanted to him. I doubt we'll see him again. It's no loss. I'm so sorry for what he did to you. I knew he was vicious, I never realized he would go that far. It's okay. He was going to kill you, Inca, it's not okay. He closed his eyes briefly as if imagining it, and shivered. Inca nudged him. Hey. I'm here. I'm okay. At this point, I'm probably immortal. Tommaso chuckled and kissed her forehead. It wouldn't surprise me. He sighed. I hope I turn out to be a better human being than my father. Pain passed across his face and she touched his arm. Tommaso, you are already a million trillion times the man he could ever be. You are not your father. Her voice hardened at the mention of Edgar Winter. He studied her. Thank you. And you. He hesitated. You are not your mother. You will never be your mother. Thank you, Tommaso. She pressed her lips to his, and he returned the kiss but then pulled away, his eyes serious. Inca, Raffaello told me what happened between you and him, that he asked you to marry him. Inca flushed and started to stand but he made her sit. Inca, I know exactly what you're thinking. I know you. I can tell you feel guilty but let me ask you this. Did it feel right? Be honest. She chewed her lip. I don't know. She sighed, her shoulders slumping. Yes. I suppose so. He leaned in a small smile on his lips. I'm happy for you, Inca, for you and Raffaello. Both you and I know you are meant for each other. I have been selfish, not wanting to give you up, indulging my fantasies. But you and Raff, it is a love for the ages. We all know that. I have to let you go, Inca, and you have to do the same for me. Inca smiled gratefully at him. I wish I knew myself as well as you seem to know me. He shrugged. You do. You just won't let yourself believe it. Inca leaned her forehead against his, knowing that this was goodbye, at least as far as their love affair went. I do love you, Tommaso, don't ever think I don't. I know, Bella, and I will always love you. Just in the right way now. As my sister. My very best friend. She couldn't help the tears that dropped down her cheek then. Tommaso. He wrapped his arms around her. SSH, it's okay, Principessa. It's okay. I promise we will all be happy. They flew back to Washington a week later.
On the plane, they discussed how to explain the fact that the ring on Inca's left hand wasn't from the winter twin people expected. Inca studied it as Raffaello, her fiancé, she thought, laughing to herself, and Tommaso talked about what they had planned for the winter mansion. After she and Tommaso had talked, a few nights later, Raffaello had taken her out to dinner and proposed again. Tears of happiness flowed from both of them as Inca had said yes, and he'd swept her up into his arms and kissed her, clearly over the moon. I'm going to marry Raffaello Winter, she kept repeating to herself. She hadn't wanted a big gaudy ring, instead, she and Raffaello went to choose one. He rolled his eyes when she picked the cheapest one in the store, but she genuinely loved the simple design, the single diamond. Tommaso had congratulated them both, and Inca could see no sadness in his eyes when he hugged her. It was strange to think she would never kiss him again. He'd rented an apartment in the city and moved there to give them privacy. Now she smiled at her family, they were her family, as they enjoyed the luxury of the winter's private jet. Tyler said he'd be with us by the weekend. I can't wait to see him. She'd already told Tyler about her and Raffaello's engagement, and after he'd asked her if she had chosen the one she really wanted if she was sure, he congratulated her warmly. As long as you are happy, Bubba. Now they were on their way to Washington, and Inca felt optimistic about the future in a way she hadn't felt for a long time. The Winter Twins had legally separated their lives and businesses from their father, and they hadn't heard from him since that terrible day. There are monsters everywhere, Inca thought to herself now, but also angels. These two men with her now. They had changed her life completely. Washington was freezing cold and snowing. Tommaso grumbled, to Raffaello's and Inca's amusement. Does it ever get warm in this godforsaken place? They went straight to the mansion, which seemed like a place from another time for all of them. Inca was smiling until she saw the bloodstains on the stone steps. Luna's blood. Someone had obviously tried to clean it, but when it had frozen, the blood had leached into the porous stone and stained it. Raffaello put his arm around her. We won't have to see it much longer. They had decided to sell the mansion and move everything back to Italy. Inca was glad. Although she had always loved her home state and her own country, she didn't feel like she belonged anymore. She didn't belong anymore. Raffaello touched her cheek. Let's get warmed up. Then we can talk about what our plans are. Ollie saw the limousine snake up the hill to the winter mansion and felt his body tremble. She was back. Inca had called him, somewhat nervously, to tell him she was coming to visit, to settle Nancy's matters, and to say goodbye. She was really leaving for good. Ollie couldn't quite get a handle on it. He'd expressed his sadness, and Inca had cried a little. It's not like you don't have a passport, she had said eventually, a little annoyed, and he'd laughed then. That's better, now you sound like you. He heard her chuckle. I miss you, Ollie. I miss you too, Inks. Now she was home, and he was strangely nervous about seeing her. They'd agreed to meet the next day and talk. Then later in the week, Inca asked if they could go and lay some flowers on Luna's grave. Of course we can. Ollie said softly, letting Inca know he didn't blame her for what had happened. He drove back to the police station and pulled off his coat. He felt as if this visit, Inca's last visit home probably, would be one where they would hash out everything. Ollie had never forgiven himself for how he'd behaved when she'd met the Winters. His jealousy, he knew now, had made him go crazy for a while, buying the soccer apartment and not telling Inca and buying that hideous house in the woods, what the hell had he been thinking? Since Luna's suicide, Ollie had been seeing a psychiatrist and taking medication. Both he and Luna had been diagnosed with a personality disorder, but had left it untreated all their adult lives. He was sure now that that was why he had dumped Inca in the first place. If they'd both been treated, maybe Luna and Scarlet would be alive now. Gosh, the things we do to each other. Hey again. Her voice broke through his reverie, and he realized he had been daydreaming. Belinda stood in front of him. Would you like to come to the new coffee shop? He was silent for a moment, then smiled coolly. No, thank you. Actually, I need to run some errands, so... He got up. 
Belinda looked surprised. Oh, okay then, hey, come over for dinner later, to the house I mean. It's just an Irish stew, but there'll be plenty to go around. He inclined his head and smiled. Thank you, but not tonight. I'll be seeing you. Belinda. He left quickly, aware he had surprised her, possibly even hurt her feelings. He climbed into his car and sat for a while, watching her walk down the street. Maybe he had been too dismissive. Belinda. He got out of the car as she turned. I'm sorry. I was rude. I can't make dinner, but yes, shall we grab a coffee now? He was surprised at how grateful she looked and felt better. There was no need for any unpleasantness. After all, he needed all the friends he could around here. Tommaso excused himself at 10 p.m., and Inca and Raffaello walked slowly up to their room. After a good meal and two bottles of a superb red, the Inca were feeling very chilled out. Raffaello grinned at her. You're drunk, Miss Sardi. She giggled and wound her arms around him before suddenly her face dropped. Frowning, Raffaello looked in her eyes. What is it? Oh gosh. What? My name will be... Inca Winter. Raffaello burst out laughing, half with relief. Gosh, you scared me. I thought something was really wrong. It is. My name will be Inca Winter. But seeing her partner collapse with laughter, she started giggling too. Stop laughing, you with your sensual name. Think of your wife's humiliation. He pulled her down on top of him, rolling her onto her back on the bed. If it bothers you that much, keep your name. Or I'll take your name. She stopped, looking in amazement at him. You would do that? Raffaello nodded. Of course. I would be happy to give up the last thing that my father gave me. How does Raffaello Sardi sound? She grinned. Italian and seductive as all hell. Then it's decided. He kissed her, his lips moving against hers slowly. Now we just have to decide when to get married. Um, let's talk about that, but not now. Not while I can't concentrate on anything else but your face or your eyes or... Raffaello grinned, his hands already pushing her dress up. I need you, Mio Caro. It's been too many hours. He moved down the bed and buried his face in her. Gosh, Raff. Inca let herself relax into the heady sensation of his mouth on her. She smiled down at him. Her fingernails dug deep into him. Inca loved it when he got all riled up like this, dominating her body, his hands pinning hers above her head, his mouth rough on hers. His teeth nipped at her lower lip, he growled her name again and again. My gosh, Inca breathed, her body vibrating with pleasure as they panted for air. It just gets better and better with you. Were you holding back before? I mean, when we were with. Raffaello nodded. A little, I admit. Some of Tommaso's kinkier things, like when he used to watch us, I didn't mind him doing so. I even found it weirdly pleasurable, but I didn't feel as if I could ever fully really let myself go. Even when we were alone at the villa, I felt his presence in our bedroom. That's not true anymore. Inca stroked his face. What a strange beginning we had. But I wouldn't change a thing. He brushed his lips against hers. Me neither, my love. He traced a line from her throat down to her navel. Gosh, you're beautiful. I'm going to keep telling you that every day. She grinned through tear-filled eyes. Raffaello Winter, you are the love of my life. And they began again where they had left off. She was back. In the States, in Washington, in Willowbrook, and this time, he would make sure she would never leave again. Not alive. Gosh, it was so close now, he could taste it, taste her, smell the blood she would shed for him. But first, a little welcome home present. He grinned to himself. Before Inca died, she would suffer another devastating loss. Inca was surprisingly edgy as Raffaello dropped her off in front of the restaurant. This is silly, she said. Ollie's my oldest friend, my ex-boyfriend. Why am I so nervous? Think of everything you've been through, of course, it's natural to feel like that. Look, if it gets difficult, I'm a phone call away. 
Inko walked into the restaurant and saw Ollie already sitting at a table. He stood to kiss her cheek, then they both laughed and hugged each other hard. Gosh, I've missed you. Her voice was muffled as her face was buried in his shoulder, and when she looked at him, there were tears in her eyes. He captured one that escaped down her cheek with his finger. And I've missed you, Inks. Come on. Let's sit and get some food going. That's a guaranteed way to break the ice. She chuckled, shrugging out of her coat. You know me so well. They chatted easily for a time, then Inka put down her fork. Ollie. I can't begin to tell you how sorry I am about Luna. I don't understand why she was so angry with me, but I wish I did know, had known, so that I could have found a way to. Inka. Luna was ill. You knew about the breakdown she had, but what you didn't know was that she was much sicker than we thought. He sighed and looked down. We both were. When we were teenagers, we were both diagnosed with a personality disorder. We were on medication, but by the time we were in our twenties, neither of us took it seriously. He took her hand. Inca, if we had, Luna would still be here. Scarlet would still be here. None of it was your fault. And I need to apologize for scaring you that time in the woods with that dumb house. And for wrecking your plans with the Sakura apartment. I really don't know what I was thinking. Inca was crying quietly as he spoke. Then, when he finished, she got up and came around the table to wrap her arms around him. I'm sorry, Ali, I'm so sorry. They held each other for a while, ignoring the stares of the other diners. Later, over coffee, she told him about her engagement. Raffaello? She nodded, giving him a curious smile. You don't sound surprised. Ollie met her gaze and grinned, and she reddened. Oh my gosh. Does everyone know? Ollie chuckled at her embarrassment. No, of course not. Don't worry. I found out by um accident. During a crazy moment. Inca put her burning face in her hands. We really need to invest in drapes. Ollie laughed. That might be a good idea. Well, she said, sighing, it's irrelevant now. I'm marrying Raffaello. How's Tommaso about that? Ollie shrugged when she gave him a meaningful glance. I just know what it's like to lose you, is all. No one is losing anyone anymore, she said determinedly. She had no idea just how wrong she was. Tyler Sardi arrived back at SeaTac and hailed a cab, eager now to see his daughter. And her fiancé, he thought to himself with a smile. Maybe things were finally going to be good. He hadn't called ahead, wanting to surprise them. It was already late, and he wondered if he should get a hotel room for the night. He decided he would, and went into the city first, before heading out to see if he could grab something quick to eat. He wandered down to the waterfront and ate some hot chowder. Afterwards, he wandered along the piers until it got very late. He was about to walk back to his hotel when he saw a familiar face. Hey, hey, how are you doing? His smile spread across his face. He was still smiling when his throat was slashed open and he was pushed into the dark, freezing waters of Elliott Bay. Inca hugged Ollie goodbye. She saw her friend give Raffaello a friendly wave as she got into the car. How was it? Raffaello kissed her softly. Great. Really great. He sent you congratulations, and he said, the jerk, commiserations because he knows how much trouble I am. She chuckled. And Raffaello laughed. You're glowing. He said, smiling, and she nodded. I'm with you, she said simply. At home, the house was quiet, and they went straight to their room. Desire pulsed through Inca's body, and Raffaello took her hand and led her to the bed. He slid his hands under her t-shirt and pulled it off, kissing from her neck down to her belly. Inca gasped under his touch, waves of pleasure shuddering through her. She kissed him, her longing for him all-consuming. Inca pulled her phone out to call Tyler, but when someone else answered, her heart froze as she listened to them and realized the nightmare wasn't over. Ollie's eyes widened in horror as Inca burst through the door of the police station, breathless, tears pouring down her face. What the hell? Inca interrupted him. Tyler is missing. 
he's been missing for days. He didn't tell anyone he was coming to see me in Seattle, so they didn't know how to inform the missing persons here. Ollie, oh my gosh. She was shaking badly, her distress making Ollie's chest hurt. He made her sit down, calmed her, and took her trembling hands in his. Okay, sweetheart, just breathe. Knox? His deputy had come in to see what the commotion was. Ollie quickly filled him in. Knox nodded. I'll get on it. Inca, you okay? She nodded, unable to speak. Ollie hugged her as she calmed down. Please, not my dad, Ollie. Not my dad. It's okay, darling. We'll check it out. It may be nothing. He may be just. He faltered when he saw the disbelief on her face. Yeah, okay. Knox came back into the room. Tyler got off a plane at SeaTac on the evening of the 5th. That's the day you and Ollie had dinner, right? Inca nodded, her face drawn. Yes. Gosh, Knox. Ollie. She was trembling so violently that Ollie put his arms around her and nodded to Knox, mouthing something at him. He left the room and Inca sighed. Ollie, if anything has happened to him, I don't think I can handle it. I can't handle. SSH, SSH, SSH. Ollie held her as she sobbed. After a few minutes, Inca dried her eyes. Who is doing this, Ollie? Who hates me so much? I don't know, sweetheart, but we don't know what this is yet, so let's be positive. Exhausted, Inca leaned against him. I don't know. I just hope he's still alive and okay. I couldn't bear it if another person died because of me. But she couldn't finish. Ollie wrapped his arms around her, but his face was serious. Listen to me, Inca Sardi. You listen well now. You are not responsible for everyone. You can't save everyone. People make their own decisions. Your mom did when she killed your dad. Luna shot Scarlet and you, that was her decision. Tyler, wherever he is, made the decision to fly here. You are only responsible for the choices you make. I know it will take time, but you must start today. Start what? Stop blaming yourself for everything. They both turned to see both Raffaello and Tommaso in the doorway, and Inca realized Knox must have called them. Ollie released her, and she went into Raffaello's arms. The police search for Tyler went on for days. They found his luggage in the hotel in Seattle and traced his credit card to a waterfront restaurant. Blood was found at one end of one of the piers. Inca let the police into her parents' home and waited while they went over it with a fine-tooth comb. Raffaello was with her, his presence comforting, but when the police were finished, she turned to him. Baby, can I ask a favor? He touched her face. Anything. She drew in a deep breath. In my heart. I know he's gone. I know it. And I'd like to. Be alone with them for a while. Do you mind? Of course not. Just promise me you'll stay locked inside. Call me when you want me to come pick you up. I promise. Inca watched Raffaello drive away, and now she was alone for the first time in. She didn't know how long. She had thought it would be good to have the house to herself, to breathe, to think. She walked through the house now, lingering in each room, trying to find the peace she craved. It didn't come. Ghosts of the living and of the dead hung about the rooms. Inca realized that it hadn't ever been her home, it had been their home, hers and Nancy and Tyler's. And now that they were gone, and any connection she felt to it was broken. She went into the kitchen to fix herself some tea, splashing her face with cold water while she waited for the water to boil. She reached for the towel to wipe her face, her fingers knocking against the chalkboard that hung next to it on the wall. She scrubbed her face dry as the kettle began to whistle. She turned to fill her cup, then froze. Her breath caught in her throat. A photograph she'd never seen before dropped from behind the chalkboard. Nancy, Tyler, and herself, it must have been on her birthday last year. Scarlett had photobombed them, and Luna and Ollie were at the edges of the group. A year. Just a year. Inca took the photo and sat on the floor of her parents' kitchen. 
Once again, she went over and over everything that had happened, looking for a clue that might tell her why. It was a weird sort of comfort that she could take some responsibility for Kevin's attempt on her life, at least. But Nancy had been murdered after he had already been arrested. Luna, having admitted to killing Scarlet, couldn't have done it. So who? Who hated her that much? When Ollie had been acting crazy, she had wondered if it could be him. Tommaso taking that restraining order out might have tipped him over the edge. But now? No. No way. She went upstairs to her old room and lay down on the comforter. They hadn't changed it much since she'd left. Some of her old books and paintings were still on the shelves and walls. But it felt like a stranger's room, another life a million years ago. She had no more tears to cry and soon she fell into an uneasy sleep, wrapped in the comforter. She didn't hear the intruder slip quietly through the back door, thanks to the tricky lock, and pad quietly up the stairs. He'd seen the good-for-nothing billionaire drive away and couldn't believe it. He'd left her alone? Geez. But he wasn't prepared for the kill. He had it all planned and now wasn't the time. But he couldn't waste an opportunity to be near her. So he waited until he saw her go upstairs and gave it another ten minutes. He figured when she didn't come back down, she had gone to sleep. So he broke in. He knew of old that the back door was tricky and crept upstairs. She was in bed, asleep. Inca. His voice was a whisper. She murmured. He pulled out the hypodermic he always carried, regretting not bringing his knife with him, and slipped the needle into her neck. She moaned as he pressed the plunger. Sleep, my darling. He waited until he heard her breathing deepen, becoming steady. He stripped down, took the knife from his pocket and lay down beside her. He drew the tip of the blade over her skin. Soon. But not tonight. Raffaello sat in silence, waiting for Tommaso. The bar wasn't busy, there were just a few customers drifting in and out. Raffaello felt antsy. He wanted to see Inca, a day away from her made him nervous. The TV was on behind the bar, the sound muted. Raffaello stared at it, watching news reports, reading the headlines running across the bottom of the screen. A drug-related shooting in the city, a building collapse, and a body being pulled from the dark water of Elliott Bay. He leaned over and turned the sound up. The body has been badly mauled by marine life, but the police were able to tell us that the victim was a man in his 80s and that his death is suspicious. Further details are expected to be released later today, after a full autopsy. That's what I came to tell you. Ollie's voice made Raffaello both start, and as he turned to him, he could see the strain on his face. Raffaello's heart began to thump heavily against his ribs, and he knew what Ollie was going to say before he said it. It's Tyler. Raffaello stood, his gaze intent on the cop, and Ollie nodded. King Country confirmed it to me just now. Raff. Ollie's voice was low but urgent. We need to get to Inca. Now. Raffaello was already out the door before he'd finished his sentence. The funeral was a sad repeat of Nancy's, except this time, Raffaello stayed with Inca as her father's coffin was brought in. She hadn't slept since the night Raffaello had come for, and she'd opened the door, seen his face, and knew. She hadn't cried. Numb was the only emotion she felt now. After Tyler's coffin was lowered into the ground, she turned and walked away before the pastor had even finished his prayer. She kept walking and walking until she reached the road. She knew Raffaello and probably Tommaso and Ali would be following her, but she didn't care. Nothing mattered. She stopped and let out a howl of complete rage, grief, and frustration. Come and get me. Come on. I'm right here. Kill me and let's get this done. She went on screaming and cursing until her voice gave out. When Raffaello wrapped his arms around her, she struggled, but he wouldn't let her go, and eventually she cracked, sobbing in his arms. Raffaello closed the bedroom door and went down to the study. Most of the furniture had been covered or taken to storage now in preparation for their move back to Italy, and only a skeleton staff remained to tend to the winters and their guest. Tommaso was waiting for his brother. How is she? 
Raffaello looked exhausted. The sooner we get out of here, the better. Tommaso nodded. You're right. Raff. I didn't want to tell you before, what with the funeral and everything, but I have some news. Raffaello rubbed his eyes. Not more bad news, please. Tommaso chuckled softly. No. Not exactly. It's just that when you and Inca move to Sorrento, I won't be coming with you. Raffaello's eyebrows shot up. What? Tommaso smiled. It's time we lived our own lives now, Raf. This past year, loving the same woman, although I'll never ever regret one day, well, after the crap with Dad, I think I realized I have to move on. Find my own Inca. She gave me a beautiful glimpse of what could be. I'm looking forward to finding out what the future holds. Raffaello got up and hugged his brother tightly. Don't go too far. I won't. I promise. They made plans to travel back to Italy at the end of the week. Inca told Raffaello she wanted some time with Ali and Knox before they left. She still couldn't believe they were the only ones left. So much death, so much sorrow. Ali opened the door, and Inca saw he was wearing pain spattered overalls. He looked sober and even, Inca couldn't believe it, relaxed. He held up a brush. Painting the living room. Come on in. She followed him into the kitchen and studied him as he made coffee. You look remarkably chipper. He grinned, and he looked like the Ollie she'd loved and adored for more than half her life. Chipper. Make sure you drink your coffee with your little finger out if you're going to come around here using them posh words. She giggled. Loser. Seriously, though, I mean it. He shrugged, flushing in embarrassment. Took some time off. I needed this time to get my head right. Sort out my priorities. Let other things go. He gave a small laugh. It's been good. I've been regrouping. Inca said nothing, sipping her coffee. Ollie's overalls were spattered with green paint, and she nodded at them. Suits you. How's things with the whirling derb? Ollie had told her, hesitantly, that he'd sorta, kinda been dating Belinda Clements. Inca's reaction had been unexpected. She'd burst into peals of laughter and told him to, have at it, but boy am I going to make you suffer for it. Ollie snickered but tried to look disapproving. All right. His smile faded. How's things at home? Inca sighed to herself. She could see behind the question. She spoke carefully when she replied. I'm getting there, Ollie. It'll take some time. It will. Look, for what it's worth, I think you're doing the right thing. A new start. I hate to admit it, but I like your Raffaello. He's a good man. Inca grinned. Still not keen on Tommaso, then? Ali laughed. He's okay, too. Inca smiled, but then her face became serious. You know, you'll always be welcome in Italy. For however long. Ali nodded. You're sweet, but I think it's time for me to build my own new life. Inca raised her glass to him. Here's to a new life. Later, Knox came to pick her up, and they decided to get pizza and go back to his place. Raffaello would pick her up at eight, but Inca glanced at the weather with concern. Another winter storm was coming in, and the snow was getting really heavy. She and Knox talked and ate, but she couldn't help being a little nervous about Raffaello in the snow. She kept looking at her watch. After the fourth time that Inca glanced at the clock, Knox grinned. He said he'd be here at eight, and he'll be here at eight. She grinned. Sorry. It's just. Finally, we get to be happy, and it would just be our luck if the weather. Well, you know. Knox rubbed her shoulder but said nothing. Inca smiled at him, then frowned when she noticed he wasn't looking at her. What is it? What's up? Knox sighed. Oh, you know. I just wish I had what you and Raffaello have. What Raffaello has. Inca swallowed, embarrassed by the compliment. Knox. You look really beautiful tonight, Inca. Inca glanced down at herself, a simple white t-shirt, admittedly a little skin tight, and old tattered jeans. She looked at him askance. You need your eyes tested. 
Knox's face was red and he threw back the rest of his drink. Sorry. He got up and went to the kitchen. Inca hesitated for a moment. She hated to see him like this, shy embarrassed. Knox? I'm good, Inca, really? I'll be out in a sec. His voice seemed normal. She shrugged and glanced again at the clock. Rafaela will be here in five minutes. Gosh, she hated herself for saying it, but she hoped Knox would go. She wanted Rafaela all to herself tonight. Knox came back, handing her a soda. She waved the remote. Wanna watch some crap? He smiled. Sure thing. Inca flicked through the stations until she found a comedy show. She grinned and turned to him. Knox, I. Knox, calmly but forcefully, slammed his fist into her temple and everything went dark. Raffaello couldn't wait any longer. He wanted Inca to have her time with her friends, but the snow was turning into a blizzard now, and he had no intention of sleeping apart from her tonight. He left a note to tell Tommaso where he was going, then got into his car. The storm was bad. By the time he got into town, it was hard to see out of the windshield. Raffaello knocked on Knox Westerwick's front door and waited. Strange. No answer. He knocked again. Knox. Inca. Nothing. His heart began to pound. He went to the window and looked in. There was nobody there, but something caught his eye. A smashed bottle and blood. Not much, but drops of it on the floor. Raffaello cussed and went back to the door, kicking it in easily. He dashed into the living room and stopped, terror screeching into his veins. There was more blood on the floor. Raffaello grabbed it and turned, and his heart stopped. In blood. Incas. Scrawled across the wall were written six words. You'll never see her alive again. Everything fell into place. Knox. Knox Westerwick, the easygoing cop, the flirt. Everybody's buddy. As Raffaello raced out of the house and into the snow towards Ollie's house, he could only think one thing. How did we not see it? Ollie took one look at Raffaello's face and knew. Geez, no. It's West Erwick. Raffaello spat. He's taken her. There are signs of a struggle at the house. Blood and a message. Ollie held up his hands. Now wait. We don't know that it's him. Someone might have taken them both. Raffaello fumed, his terror making him antsy, but Ollie was right. Ollie picked up his cell and tried to call Knox. His deputy answered in a happy sing-song voice. Hey boss. The storm is really closing in. Ollie frowned and looking at Raffaello, switched the phone to speaker. Hey Knox. Where are you? We thought you were with Inca. I am. You went out in the storm? Knox laughed, and both of the men listening heard the slightly hysterical tone. Well, I wanted to make an event of it, you know? I could have just killed her at my place, but what fun would that have been? This way, in this storm, I get to take my time, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Raffaello moaned, and Ollie looked appalled. Knox, what are you talking about? He needed to hear him say it. I'm going to kill Inca, of course. Ollie felt the breath being pushed out of his lungs. You? Knox? All this time? Knox laughed. Gosh, you were all so blind. Yes, me, Ollie. Yes, I killed those women. Yes, I'm going to kill Inca, and believe me, she will suffer the torments of the damned before she dies. Why? Raffaello was now on his knees. Please, Knox, please, don't hurt her. There was a silence on the phone, then, in a mocking voice, Knox said, I'm sorry you won't be able to say goodbye before I kill her, Winter, but you should never have loved her. She is mine. The line went dead, and Raffaello howled. Ollie grabbed him, trying to calm him down. Raff. Raff, come on. We have to think straight, think about where to find her. What's going on? Behind them, Tommaso, his face pale, was standing in the doorway. Raffaello stared at his brother, his eyes bottomless pits of sorrow. It's Inca, he said, his voice breaking. She's been taken. Inca woke, dazed, in the trunk of a moving car. 
Her hands were bound behind her back and although she tried, she could feel they were bound with plastic ties. What was going on? Knox? He was the killer? She tried to clear her fuzzy head, her mind whirling. Knox was the killer. He had killed her mother, her father, and now he was going to kill her. It didn't make sense. Why? The car stopped. Oh gosh. The trunk opened, and she was hit with a blast of freezing snow. Knox easily pulled her out of the trunk. Inca screamed, but the sound was lost in the blizzard. Knox carried her over to another car. Then she saw the other car and Belinda Clements waiting. Hey you, Belinda said as Knox dumped Inca into the new car's back seat. Go screw yourself, Inca growled, then winced as Knox stuck a hypodermic into her arm. Unconsciousness came quickly. Belinda smiled at Knox. Do me a favor, make sure you cause her serious pain. Knox was stone-faced. A knife in the gut will do that, I think I can promise. Get inside. We have a phone call to make. Belinda smiled as they walked into her house. I still don't know why we have to bring Ollie into this. Because, Knox said impatiently. With the storm, they won't be able to bring in any more police, and I get to take my time with Inca. Now call your damn boyfriend. Panicking, Ollie and the Winters made a list of where Knox might take Inca. He'll want to take his time, Ollie said, feeling sorry for Raffaello as he said it. So it'll be somewhere that's not easy to find, or which would be cut off in the snow. Ollie got a map out and began to circle where he thought they might be when Raffaello put his finger down on the place where he'd first met his love, the Winter Mansion. Ollie shook his head. It's too obvious. But Tommaso agreed with his brother. I'll go with you. Raffaello shook his head. No, we need to cover as much ground as we can. I'll go to the mansion. They decided Tommaso would go to Tyler's house, and the twins left Ollie to search the town. He was about to leave when his cell phone buzzed. Belinda. He made an annoyed sound. Belinda, this isn't a good time. I'm sorry. He's here. Who's here? A flash of irritation took before what she said had sunk in. He says he's going to kill me, Ollie. Knox. He says he'll kill me unless you come. Ollie's face hardened. I don't believe you, Belinda. He heard a scuffle, and Belinda cried out in pain. Then his stomach turned over as he heard his voice. Rosenbaum, I currently have a .22 caliber pistol pressed against your girlfriend's throat. I will kill her unless you get here in five minutes. Do I need to tell you not to bring anyone else to come alone? No. Do it. Knox hung up. Ollie took off, out into the storm and down the road. He parked and jumped out of the car, weapon drawn. The door was open. He went in, checking around him, his police training kicking in. He got to the living room and stopped. Knox was standing against the fireplace, smiling at him. His gun sat on a chair, away from his reach. Ollie frowned. Hello, chief. Ollie glanced around him, never taking his weapon off Knox. Where's Inca? Knox laughed. That's just typical. Even now, with your girlfriend in danger, your first thought is of our lovely Inca. Inca isn't your problem anymore, Ollie. Soon she'll be no one's problem. Why did you call me here, Knox? When you could have gotten clean away. Knox's smile dropped. Lucens. Ollie's eyes narrowed. Where's Belinda? Knox laughed. Right behind you. And then there was pain, a searing, shocking blow, and Ollie's head felt like it had exploded. Ollie dropped to his knees. Another blow, and then there was nothing. Knox nodded at Belinda as he walked casually over to Ollie and relieved him of his gun. Belinda beamed. Did I do good? You did good. Belinda looked down at Ollie's prone body. Pity. He was a good if nothing else. Knox smiled. And yet your hatred of Inca Sardi outstripped your need to get laid. Belinda laughed. Just the thought of you gutting her is keeping me warm. So what now? Knox met her gaze. Like I said. Loose ends. And he shot her in the head. 
Tommaso raced along the road to Tyler's house, the car skidding and swerving on the icy roads. The car almost smashed into the porch steps of the house, such was Tommaso's hurry and panic, but one quick search of the house proved fruitless. He was back in the car in seconds and racing back towards town. Then he stopped as he reached the main street. Ollie's car was outside another home, one he didn't recognize. He got out of the car and searched around, calling Ollie's name, the blizzard taking his words and flinging them to the wind. Then he saw it, glinting, half buried in the falling snow. He went over and picked it up. Inca's watch. His heart began to beat fast, there were tracks leading away from where the watch was, half hidden now by the snow. A movement to his side caught his eye, and he looked around to see Ollie, blood pouring from his head, staggering from the house. Tommaso dashed to help him, moving back into the house, out of the blizzard, kicking the door shut behind them. Then he saw her. A woman, dead, prone on the floor. Jeez. Tommaso stepped over her and checked her pulse, but it was obvious she was dead. It's Belinda. She was working with Knox. He killed her. I didn't. If she was working with Knox, then she got what she deserved, Tommaso spat. He grabbed a towel from the kitchen and pressed it against Ollie's head wound. What happened? Ollie gave him the basics. Knox is insane, man. He'll kill Inca. I know it. Tommaso's face was pinched and pale as he pulled out his phone to call Raffaello. I think Raff was right, if he's this petty, he'll want to kill her where it'll hurt us the most. Our own home. The snow was three feet deep by the time Knox pulled Inca from his car and marched her, hands bound behind her back, into the night. She shivered uncontrollably as the freezing air hit her skin. She recognized the garden immediately, and she gritted her teeth. Creep. He would use her murder to add more hurt and pain to Raffaello and Tommaso. Creep. Knox pulled her into the open garden, a vision of pure white snow. The killing ground. He'd fixed up a light so that it shone in a pool on the snow. I'm going to stab you to death here, Inca, he said matter-of-factly. You're insane, Inca whispered. Completely insane. Knox smiled, then cuffed her around the face, splitting her lip. And you're a dead woman walking, Inca. Your billionaires aren't going to save you now. Listen. All around them, all she could hear was the cold wind and the snow whipping around her. Knox forced her down onto her back. Her skin reacted to the cold snow, and he knelt above her. I waited until it was like this, because I don't want you to die too quickly. I want to savor this, I want you to feel the utter agony of what I'm going to do to you. The cold will slow your heart. The knife in his hand was a bayonet knife, Tyler's knife. He saw her look at it and smiled. Yes, I killed your mother with the same knife. Both of your mothers. And your father. And all those women who looked like you. Practice runs for the big event. Now, and he placed the tip of the knife into the hollow of her navel, I'm going to do this real slow. And he pushed the blade slowly into her belly. Inca gasped, the pain unimaginable as the steel sliced through her. Knox smiled. Beautiful, beautiful. He pulled the blade out, and Inca felt her blood pumping out of the wound onto the snow. She could smell it, rust and blood. Dark spots were at the corner of her eyes, and they whirled in her head. Knox slapped her face hard. Don't lose consciousness now, baby. I'm not nearly done with you. From somewhere, she thought she heard a voice. A shout. A cry in the night. Another stab from the knife. Her systems began to shut down. Just let me die. She heard Knox laugh. You're not getting off that easy, my darling. There was a needle in her arm, and she was shocked back to full alertness. Knox's face was very close to hers. I told you, we're going to take our time here. Just kill me, she said. I'm already dead. The blessed delirium of unconsciousness had been taken away by whatever he had injected into her, and she watched the knife dripping with her own blood as he raised it above his head. Suddenly, despite the agony and hopelessness, Inca began to laugh. That stopped him. What are you laughing at? His face was a picture of rage that she could have the nerve to be laughing at him at this moment. 
I know, Inca laughed at him, and I'll probably die right here. But right now, behind you, Raffaello Winter is holding the gun that's going to blow your head off. Knox whipped around and saw Raffaello's furious face just for a second before he blew his head off. The adrenaline left Inca then, as Raff dropped to his knees beside her, ripping his coat off and wrapping it around her, and she began to feel the agony burn through her body. He pulled his sweater off and pushed it against her wounds. You live. You hear me. You hang on. Inca nodded, knowing that it was impossible to hope, but in her final moments with this man, the man she loved so very deeply, she didn't want to be sad. I love you so much, Raffaello. So very much. Raff's face was pale, but he had never looked more gloriously handsome to her. And you are my life, Inca. Please, I know it's bad, but please try. She leaned her head against his chest as he carried her back to his car and laid her in the passenger seat, grabbing a blanket from the front seat and tucking it around her. Keep talking to me, Inca. Keep putting pressure on your wounds if you can. I have to drive us back through the storm. Raffaello saw she was shivering violently now and knew the cold and the blood loss meant her body was going into shock. Gosh, please, no. He was having a hard enough time seeing her so badly hurt. Dying. No. No way. Inca, his love, his life, was going to be okay. Inca touched his face. Where's Tommaso? Raffaello hesitated. He's dealing with Rosenbaum. Ollie's pretty badly hurt. Inca's eyes opened wide. What? Another pause. Knox attacked him, knocked him out. We think your old friend Belinda had something to do with it, but it doesn't matter anymore. She's dead. Inca moaned softly, and he looked around. Inca. I'm okay, are you or Tommaso hurt? Raffaello swallowed. No, we're fine. Look, we've got some people just up here. Rosenbaum gave us a few places he could think of, so we split up. It was just luck that I found you, my darling. I'm so sorry. You saved me. Her voice was growing weaker. Inca, stay with me. Keep talking to me. I love you. Raffaello couldn't help the tears that poured down his face then. I love you, Inca Sardi. Don't you dare die on me. You're so attractive when you curse in that accent. You want to pull the car over and we'll get busy right now. He laughed. Even now, you're making jokes. He knew why she was doing it, so that when, no, if she died, he would at least have a happy memory of their last moments together. Gosh, I love you so much, but I will kill you if you die. He was gratified to hear her chuckle, but he could also hear the pain in her voice. Baby, I want you to know, it was always you, Raffaello. Always you. That broke him, and he began to sob, his whole body shaking uncontrollably. Oh gosh, Inca. Please don't leave me, we're so close, so very close. I'm trying, baby. I promise. I don't want to die. But her voice was getting weaker. The car skidded all over the icy road, the snow battering down, almost completely obscuring his vision. For a second, just a second, he considered pulling the car over and dying with her, but something was stopping him. The promise, the hope for their future. We have survived so far, we'll survive now. There is a reason I love her as much as I do. He reached back and held her hand for a moment. We're going to be okay, Inca. I swear we will. And I'm going to marry you. Inca laughed softly. Well, you'd better. Hope suddenly soared as he saw the lights of the town in front of him. Raffaello almost laughed. Almost there, Leo Caro, almost safe. Inca was silent and Raffaello, half-crazed, looked around. Her eyes were closed, the blanket soaked with blood. No, no. The car screeched into town towards the blue and red lights of the emergency vehicles, breaking sharply, and he was out, opening the passenger door, desperate to get to her. Raff. He heard his brother through the storm. Raffaello gathered Inca up in his arms and trudged through the snow towards the emergency vehicles. Hot tears were flooding down his cheeks. He saw Tommaso's expression when he saw her. Fear. Grief. 
Then they were surrounded by paramedics, police, and everything was a whirl. Inca opened her eyes and drew in a long, deep lungful of cool, fresh air. Alive. There was pain, yes, but nothing she couldn't handle. Because there, right in front of her, Raffaello Winter saw her eyes had opened, and his smile was better than any morphine. Three months, four days, six hours. That's how long they had been back in Italy. Back safe alive. Inca stroked her fiancé's face, marveling at his glorious beauty, the way he looked at her, the feel of his arms around her body. They sat in their bed in their new villa in Naples, across the bay from Sorrento. They decided, like Tommaso in Venice, like Ollie in Portland, on a new life, a new home. It was summer, and the evening was sultry. They had dinner in a small trotteria in the city, then walked back up the hill to their home. As they walked into the villa, Inca had pulled her little white dress over her head, looking back over her shoulder at a grinning Raph. She lost her clothes on the way to their bedroom, Raph lost his shirt and pants. Now, they held each other, enjoying the feeling of skin on skin. Nothing was hurried, nothing was desperate. They knew they had forever. Inca glanced down at him and smiled. They did it slowly, leisurely, shuddering and vibrating, kissing each other and murmuring their love. Outside, the sun slid beneath the horizon and lit up the sky with fire as the lovers, catching their breath, began all over again. The End Sneak Peek for Hot Nights in Sturgis Chapter 1 Blaze Vibrations filled the air as the fifteen of us made the last leg of our journey to the motorcycle mecca of the world, Sturgis, South Dakota. After our gang met up at the Ohio headquarters of the Brothers of the Scarlet Dragon, the motorcycle club I belonged to, we headed out for the three-day trip to the rally, which beats all motorcycle rallies. This is the third year that I've made this trip. I have to fool my entire family each year to be able to do this. I'm a business lawyer. That means I push papers for the law firm that my grandfather started way back before even my father was born. Thanks to that man we all are stinking rich. That alone was good enough reason for me to be able to flake off my entire life. But one of the stipulations of being able to receive one's trust fund is that you have to show my grandfather your college degree. Oh and it must pertain to the law in some fashion. So I had to keep my grades up in school. I had to be able to get into Harvard, and that is where I stayed until I successfully completed my master's degree in business law. A thing that I hate with every fiber of my being. I'm the youngest in my family. My father's an only child. So the billions upon billions of dollars my grandfather has managed to make with my father's help, and now my oldest brother's help too, keeps us in our fancy mansions, cars, and motorcycles, in my case. After six years of college, I was placed in the family firm. That's where I've been the last six years, and I'm going to be completely stir-crazy in the New York office. Only a mere thirty now, I'm ready to sow a few wild oats. My family has kept me so damn busy, I've had little to no time for extracurricular activities. Those snooty East Coast ganks just don't do it for me anymore. Especially the ones that my family approves of. That's another reason I hate my life revolving around the law firm. One must always keep the family name of Worthington in good standing. My name is Benjamin Franklin Worthington, of the Manhattan Worthingtons. That's how I am introduced at all functions, and do you think anyone is ever allowed to call me anything other than by my full first name? No. I am to be called Benjamin at all times, according to my stuffy grandfather, who insisted on naming my brother and me. He got saddled with Theodore Roosevelt. Poor man. But my older brother is different than I am. He actually likes to be stuffy, just like our father and grandfather. Mom's okay, but when father is around she has to act a certain way, or he belittles her. I really hate it when he does that. Thankfully mom has her act down pat. I can only call her mom when no one else is around. Other than that, I must call her mother. Even the tiniest infraction of civilized rules and etiquette 
is dealt with hastily. And the ever-present threat of being cut off without a dime is always in the air when anyone is even thinking about doing something my grandfather deems inappropriate. So, as far as he knows, I'm on a learning mission to better understand the legal conditions under which motorcycle manufacturers can get by with violating the safety standards that other motor vehicles have to follow. I came up with that whole idea all by myself. I had to purchase a very impressive piece of machinery to make this learning mission I am on. Each year, I get a brand new bike to test. Of course, he makes me sell it afterward, but for the month of August, I get to be a free man with a badass motorcycle under my butt. My ride for this trip is a brand new Harley CVO Street Glide in red. It's one amazing machine and a killer ride. The last three days have flown by, as I do feel like I'm gliding over the road with my gang of fellow bikers. My family knows nothing about my involvement with the gang. They would lose their shit if they knew about this. The higher-ups in this gang know about my real name and my real life. But all the others know me simply as Blaze. The badass who happens to be a lawyer too. And when I get to be this man, the man I really feel I am, I go all the way bad. Drinking, smoking, cussing, womanizing. You name it. I do it. The day after Labor Day marks the end of Blaze, and back I go to the slightly depressed version of myself, Benjamin Worthington. But those first few weeks after I go back still have me feeling kind of high from all the fun I've had. And I know that this trip will be the same. Attractive chicks are everywhere in Sturgis with the bike rally. And they are ready to go at all times. You can get laid just about anywhere in the town that overflows with bikers for a limited amount of time. And I plan on getting a different one every single night I'm there. I had already booked myself a private motel room and had a whole box full of clothes and assorted devices sent up to the motel where I was going to be staying. I am ready to roll. The rumble of another Harley moves up next to me, and I see out of the corner of my eye it is a couple who have been in this gang for quite some time. Rod and Ashley Manning are one of the few married couples in the gang. She rides behind him for this trip, but she's got her own ride and she even rides on her own sometimes. They have two teenage daughters and take this trip each year to get away from all the family and just be the couple they are. It's cool, I suppose. But I wouldn't want to take a chick to this babe fest. No way. As they move ahead of me, another couple pulls up and I see it's the newest couple, Paco and Phoenix. From what they said when we were camping last night, they met only three months ago and hit it off so well, they've been together non-stop ever since. Paco's going to surprise her by going through Vegas after the rally and marrying her to make it all good and legal. I told him he should keep it easy to get the hell out of if it goes south. One never knows how a relationship is going to work out. If I would have married the first woman I got, then I'd probably be dead right now instead of cruising down the highway on a cool August morning. Sandra Moore was my first love when I started college. We dated all through college. I kept her around mostly because she made the cut with my family. She was from an upscale family and a law student. So much money no one can count it all, just like our family. And snooty to her very core. I got lucky, and she found what she called a real lawyer. He took her off my hands, and after the initial shock of being dumped, I found myself very relieved to be rid of her. Playing the field in the New York scene was okay. But when you have to maintain such high standards to keep from losing your trust fund, you can't find many women who like the things I do. After three years of that crap, I found the love of motorcycles, and it took me no time at all to find this gang that took me in quickly like a very dysfunctional family of sorts. There are some jerks, just like in any family. But there are some good people, too. And they all accept each other for who they are. No judging is done by anyone. I don't think it's allowed. We're getting close to the town we've been waiting for. You can tell that by the way the whole cluster of bikes begins to speed up. Our hearts are beginning to pound in all of our chests as the excitement starts to key up. A cold beer and an attractive woman sitting on my lap are close at hand, and I find myself getting nearly giddy over that fact. It is not much longer 
until I get to put my little vacation from boredom into play. Girls, you better watch out. My bike makes a little bump, and then I feel something odd happen. It went down a little. Something doesn't feel right. Shit. Looks like my plan of a cold beer and an attractive girl will have to wait for me to stop off at one of the many garages they have in town. This would be how it starts for me. This whole year has been a giant cluster. I single-handedly lost a major client a few months ago when I dared to ask him how he could live with himself. He's a wealthy individual and bought the rights to manufacture the main medication used in treating AIDS. He jacked the price up so high that most people with the disease couldn't afford to buy it. He came to our firm to seek help in keeping the product at the price he set, as he was being asked by the federal government to reduce the price to what it was when he originally purchased the licensing. Wanting our help in keeping his price, he came to us and gave a very healthy sum of money to the firm to help him. At the meeting we had with the jerk, I told him off. My grandfather was pissed, but my father and brother, though silent, agreed with me. So I managed not to get cut off without a cent and retained my place in the family firm. But it was a nightmarish few months with my grandfather giving me the cold shoulder. I know that doesn't sound so bad, but my grandfather knows how to make the cold shoulder really hurt. For instance, he bought the entire legal staff their own individual, personal drivers for a whole year. Not me though. He also brought in gourmet lunches on Fridays, but I was not invited. He would walk right past me, telling everyone who came before and after me hello. That kind of shit. He finally stopped a few weeks ago, and things went back to normal. The man can keep that up for a very long time. It's probably taking years off his life. That's what I tell myself, anyway. Around the bend we come, and my bike is getting lower and lower. I'm glad it waited until we were almost here to do this. The first large bar we see is where our leaders pull in, and I pull up alongside Rod and his wife. We all cut off our bikes. Hey Rod, I'm going to catch up with you guys in a little while. I have to find a shop to see what the hell is going on with my ride. He gives me the thumbs up, so I turn the bike back on and take off to find what looks like a reputable motorcycle repair shop. I don't want to get screwed here. Not too far away from the bar, I see a sign that says, Phil's Motorcycle Garage. The sign under it says he specializes in Harleys. So I think this might be the best place to at least start it. Especially since the bike just keeps on getting lower. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of people in the parking lot. Only one other bike is parked here. An older model Sportster. Looks like a chick bike. Maybe there's some attractive chick in here who can sit on my lap while I wait for the bike to be repaired. I turn the bike off and get off to walk it into the large bay with the metal garage door opened on it. It's dimly lit in here and hard to see. But I don't see anyone yet. Stopping to get my cell phone out of my pocket, I check the time. Shit. It's noon. Lunchtime. I'll probably have to wait here for a damn hour before I can get any help. The hits just keep on coming. 19 hours of riding to get to some real fun, and I have this little hitch in the scene. I hope this isn't a sign of things to come with this trip. It's supposed to be fun, after all. Not headache after headache. A group of motorcycles blast past the garage, and the entire bay vibrates with the loud noise they make. It makes my heart skip a beat. I love the growl of a pack of bikes. I just want to be out there, having a great time with my brothers from the gang, sipping some cold suds. Instead, I'm in a dank and dark garage seeking mechanical attention for a bike that shouldn't need it yet, it's so damn new. After the last few bikes in that group get past, I listen hard and hear some tapping. Maybe a computer keyboard. But as I look around, I don't see anyone. So I put the kickstand down and leave my bike in the bay, and make my way up a set of steps. A smell wafts past my nose and I stop and breathe it in. Fresh flowers are what it smells like. That and clean linen. What a misplaced scent in a motorcycle repair shop. Oil and gasoline are predominating, but that little trickle of wonder manages to seep in. 
I smile for no reason other than it smells good and seems out of place in this very rugged town. Even most of the chicks around here have remnants of road dust and the oil and gas mix that comes with a pack of bikes and their exhaust systems. The alcohol helps one not to care much about the smell of what's on your lap. The feeling is what matters the most. More tapping, and a bit of low muttering, I can hear. It's a woman. What kind of woman would be working in this grease pit? I prepare myself to see a hun of a female. I'll try hard not to react too unfavorably when I see the brute. Hey. I shout. But nothing comes back as my voice echoes off the metal walls of the garage. I wait a moment and then shout again, but there is still nothing. I'm sure I hear someone typing though. Then the sound of a phone ringing fills the air and a female voice mutters again, Shit. Maybe she can't hear well, either. Ugly and deaf, yikes. So I shout very loud in my best New Yorker voice, hey, a little help here, I ain't got all day. Chapter 2 Angel With the mechanics gone for lunch, the garage will be somewhat quiet for the next hour, so I can actually get some work done. Parts need to be ordered and I've yet to do that. I was quietly watching Cletus work on a two-year-old Honda all morning long. I'm in my last year of college. At the end of May next year, I'll be the proud holder of a master's degree in engineering. To design motorcycles is what I long to do for my career. Hopefully not too terribly long from now, I can do just that. But for now, I'm working part-time in my uncle's motorcycle repair shop. It's helping me get some hands-on experience with the miraculous machines. It's not that the mechanics let me actually touch any of the customer's bikes. I do watch them, though. As long as I stay quiet and don't ask any questions, they let me watch. I've learned a lot by working here the last few years. I grew up on the outskirts of Sturgis, South Dakota. Motorcycles kind of come with life here. I got my first one when I was 15. Uncle Phil gave it to me. He was married when he was younger. No kids though. His wife died when she was only 32. They had a real love, and he never saw fit to take another wife. So my sister and I became like his kids in a way. He managed to get me interested in bikes, but my younger sister is much too girly. The latest bike he gave me a few years ago is a Harley Sportster XL883L in black. It's cool enough and runs great. My parents moved off to California last year, leaving me alone here as my sister married a Marine and they now live in France. What they're doing over there is top secret, or so she told me when I asked what the hell they need our Marines in France for. Uncle Phil keeps an eye on me. I don't get into trouble though. I stay out of the many bars here. I don't really date as I think men all suck and make you think they love you but then leave you with no reason why. Yeah, I have men's issues. My first love was a biker with cool tattoos and a beard that was just the right amount of scratchy when he kissed me. I thought what we had was real. He made me believe I was the girl for him. We were together for three years before he told me one day he wanted to see the world. I was all for it. Thought I could finish college when we got done with our world adventure. Only I didn't realize he meant he wanted to go alone. I had to watch him pack up and kiss the top of my head, and then he told me he hoped I had a very nice life. A nice life? Words couldn't come to me as he left. I was dumbstruck. I watched him ride off into the sunset and I never heard from the guy, I thought he loved me as much as I thought I loved him again. That was a couple of years ago. I'm over him and guys in general. Who needs a man anyway? I have my own little house, which I rented at the edge of town. My little poodle, Maltese mix pup, accurately named Cuddles, keeps me protected. And thanks to modern technology, there are machines to do what a man can for me. One day I will make enough money to take complete care of myself. The paltry amount I make here is enough to get me by. But just that. With my diploma in hand, I hope to change my financial outlook in just over a year or so. I have my plan for the future. Men do not need to apply. 
I used to dabble at the bars a little now and again, but the few guys I thought would be random one-night stands all somehow wanted more than that from me. So I stopped going to the bars. Work and home are all I do now. My classes are all online, and only once a month do I have to go and check in with a few of my professors. Life is good and things couldn't be better. I've learned how to keep men at bay with a don't mess with me attitude. As one can imagine, I get a ton of biker guys who come in here with their broken motorcycles. And a lot of them hit on me. I hit back though and not in a nice way. There's no reason to act as if I might actually go out with them. I won't. When what's his name left me, I refused to say his name ever again, I kind of broke down. He taught me some things. First, never let yourself fall into a deep love. You lose some of yourself in that person. When they leave, as they all do, eventually, you lose that piece of you too. The second thing he taught me is how to be tough as hell. You have to be, or men will come in and tell you nice things. You'll believe their lies, and it will end with you crying yourself to sleep way too many nights. The third thing he taught me was how meaningless intercourse is. I thought what we did was special. I mean he and I found we liked the kinky stuff. It was fun from time to time. He'd let me be the boss sometimes, and I'd let him be the boss too. Fun and I thought deeply. I was a dumbass. It wasn't deep to him. We didn't share a special bond. It was just intercourse and it meant nothing. And the handful of times I did it after him were very meaningless. And the guys were kind of wimps. When I smacked them with the belt. Only one let me handcuff him to the bed. Wimps. How could I have explained that I like a little pain in the game? So I just ignored the men when they tried to get me to have some type of a relationship with them. My grandmother lives 30 miles away, and if I couldn't get them to leave me alone, then I'd escape to her place until they moved on. Me and Cuddles are fine alone. She's kind of a complainer, just like I am. When dumbass male dogs come into the yard, she barks and goes at them like she's a Doberman. She's the same way with the human variety of men, too. My poor mailman had a package he was trying to get to my door with. She ripped his pants leg as she tugged at it to make him stop coming to the door. He told me I needed a vicious dog sign, and if I ever got another package, I could take myself down to the post office to pick it up, unless I tied the little dog up. I took her inside and gave her a steak and a good doggy pat on the head. She tried to do her job. Keep the evil lying no good men away from her mommy. Thanks to her, I never have to worry about some man getting into my house without her trying to kill them. A large group of bikes pass by the shop, and it makes the whole metal building rattle as they do. I put on my headphones and listen to a little music on my phone to drown out the outside noise. The annual motorcycle rally is growing very close, and large groups of bikers are already coming into town. Trashy women are already showing up and strategically placing themselves on bar stools in every bar and lounging around area parks, hopeful of scoring some biker jerk. I don't know where most of these females come from. We have a few, but not as many as pop out of the woodwork when the rally is in town. It's quite amazing, actually. It never fails to surprise me with all the ready-to-go women that I still get hit on just walking down the street. My uncle tells me I shouldn't dress in tight leather pants and halter tops if I don't want the men's attention. He may be right but damn, I should be able to dress the way I want. I ride a motorcycle everywhere I go. I need the leather to protect my skin. If I ever fall that is. I looked around and found the clipboard with the wooden back on it and I knocked on it three times. No reason to tempt fate. With the good lord's grace I have never wrecked. I've come close a time or two but never ate it. I knock on the wood again, for even thinking about it. The computer freezes up for a moment, and it scares the crap out of me that I'll have to start this parts list over. I mutter to myself damn piece of crap. My uncle needs to buy a new computer but it's too cheap. This one will have to completely crap out, before he'll see fit to make the several hundred dollar investment and I'll be stuck having to use my own laptop to order parts until he does. The man is a notorious penny pincher. 
Another thunderous bunch of bikes pass the shop, and it has me looking out the glass door at them. It's a gang all wearing matching leather jackets and looking all cool. I've never been in a gang. Not that I haven't thought they looked kind of cool. I'm just a real loner and loners don't belong in groups. Loners like to be alone. Do some stormy nights, have me wishing for more than my puppy as a companion? Sure. Does watching a love story on television have me searching for someone to love and love me? Sure. That's why I don't watch that anymore. Does the sight of a well-tattooed bearded man with mountains of muscles get me fired up? Of course I am only human. But will I give a man a chance to fill those voids? Hell no. That leads to heartbreak again, and that's a place I'm never revisiting. But as I watch the pack of bikers ride past the garage, I see chicks riding behind their boyfriends or husbands or whatever. And I secretly wish I could do that. Maybe just one time. Maybe I wouldn't fall in love with the douchebag. Maybe I could keep things light and easy. Then the phone rings and it comes through on my headphones since I have them plugged in, and it scares the shit out of me. Shit. I scream out loud as I pull the cord out of the phone. It's a damn 800 number, so I'm not even going to answer it anyway. Man, what a way to ruin a little daydream. Hey a little help here ain't got all day, some man shouts from the bay. I want to yell back that I ain't got all day either, but Uncle Phil talked to me just this morning about not being rude to the customers. So I don't yell anything and get up off the tall stool and go see what the jerk wants. Just as I get to the stairs that lead down into the bay, I see a tall figure standing in the shadows as the mechanics turned the overhead lights off when they left for lunch. His broad shoulders stand out against the dim backlighting. As I look past him, I see a bad-to-the-bone Harley just inside the bay and it looks brand new. A rich jerk I bet. As he turns to look back at his bike and hitches his thumb, gesturing to it, I can see his long beard. Got some bike troubles. I need to see a mechanic, he says with a gravelly deep sensual voice. But I'm sure he's a jerk like all men are. He steps forward and I step back. He keeps walking forward and I keep stepping backward. All the way, until we're inside the lighted waiting area and then I see him. His hair is dirty blonde and cut so close to his head on both sides it looks almost like it's shaved. The top is a long flop of waves. His aviator sunglasses are so dark I can't see the color of his eyes. He pulls them off and some piercing blue eyes look at me. Running over me as he looks me up and down, and it sends chills through me quickly followed by heat. Wow, he's attractive. His black leather jacket has red letters stitched into it. Seems he's a member of a gang called the Brothers of the Scarlet Dragon. And there's a name stitched in red just over his nicely defined peck on his left. Blaze. Hum, bet it's because he's like a flash of fire. Hot and then gone. Tight black leather pants hug some massive legs. The defined muscles make the leather bend to conform to them. They must be hard like steel. His motorcycle boots are dusty from the road. He must have ridden quite some ways to get here. He and his gang of motorcycle riding hellions. I'm sure he's looking for some action while he's in town. A wealthy banker on a little retreat from a wife and kids. Cheater. The form-fitting white tee is sheer enough to see his six-pack of abs, and the lines are all so defined it almost seems unnatural. Most likely all steroid muscles. No real work. I'm sure he's a bunch of lies all wrapped into a nice-looking package. I see no visible tattoos from which to gauge his realness. I'm an avid tattoo advisor, and very critical of ones that don't mean anything or lend beauty to the owner. His caramel lips part, and I can see a nice set of white teeth behind them. Then I realized I'd pulled my lower lip between my teeth and was in a hurry to let it go. Damn girl. For reasons I can't figure out except it's kind of hot in here and now that he's walked in it seems a lot hotter, he's taking off his leather jacket. Oh my. His biceps are enormous, and his arms are covered in art. I mean real artwork. It's not just dumb tats that make no sense. He's a canvas for some very skilled artists. I'm ashamed to admit that my body is fired up. I swallow and do my best to regain myself then say, 
What can I do for you, Blaze? Chapter 3 Blaze I seem to be looking at my first conquest, and man, is she smoking hot. It's so hot, in fact, that I'm having a hard time forming words. How do you know my name? With a nod, she gestures to the jacket I've taken off, and tossed it on the little beat-up sofa in the waiting room. Oh yeah. My jacket. Um, so my bike is um. Her dark brows arch up as she asks, making a strange noise. She runs the tip of her tongue out just a hair to move over her plump bottom lip. A plum-colored lip gloss covers them and makes them look delicious. I shake my head, as that's not the problem with the bike, but damn it, I can't recall what the problem is as she's so completely distracting. Her hand moves to her hip, and she shifts her weight to her other leg. Her long black leather-covered leg looks so long lean. A pink sheer top she has on, and a dark pink silk bra she's wearing peeks out underneath it. She turns around and goes back behind the tall counter, and sits back on the tall stool there, and looks back at the old computer on the top it if. She has a pair of angel wings on her back, I can see underneath the sheer shirt. Her deep's gorgeous blue eyes peer at me over the top of the old grease-stained monitor as she asks, is it vibrating too much? Huh. I ask, as I was looking at how pretty she has her black hair braided. The long braid lays over her right shoulder. Is it vibrating more than usual, she asks, then looks back at the screen. It's a new street glide, isn't it? I know the answer to that one. Yes, yes it is. But it's not vibrating any more than usual. I just got it a few days ago, in a Harley shop in New York. Have you ever ridden one before? I could take you on a ride. I stop myself because I'm coming off way uncool. If you want, I mean. I don't need you to go on a ride with me. But if you were wondering what a beast like my bike rides like, I could take you on a ride that is. I could take you on a ride. Not take you. You know what I mean. I shut up as she looks at me with her mouth slightly open and she says, I know what you mean. No, I don't want to ride it. I mean it's a badass machine and I'm sure I'd enjoy the ride but not with you. Why not with me? I ask as I lean on the counter and try to catch another glimpse of that sweet tattoo on her back. Those wings on your back, any significant reason for them? Without looking at me she answers, my name is Angel, hence the wings. And it's nothing personal. I just kind of hate men. That's why not you. Of course. She's a lesbian. So, into women then. What a loss for men everywhere. I stand back up and turn away. No reason to make myself sick over a girl who likes girls. No, not into women, she says with a huff. Why is it when a woman says she hates men, they always assume she's a lesbian? Can a woman simply hate men? She looks back at the ancient monitor. Not making a strange noise, not vibrating too much. Is it getting lower? Shock runs through me. Yeah. That's it. How? It's a common problem with the air ride suspension system when you're traveling over rough surfaces. It's most likely a small prick that punctured the line. I'm sure our mechanic can get it going for you fairly quickly. If you have a credit card on you, I can go ahead and write up a ticket so he can get busy on it as soon as he gets back from lunch. She holds out her hand and on the inside of her wrist there's a little angel, complete with a halo. I take her hand and look at the tat. I take my wallet out with my other hand. Nice. She allows me to hold her hand, and I find sparks shooting all through me as I touch her. That's never happened before. I let it go to retrieve my credit card and find the sparks starting to dissipate. That had to mean something. Placing the card in her hand, I purposely graze her palm with my fingertips, and the sparks come back. I notice her eyes are narrowed at me. Then she looks away quickly. I bet she felt that too. So, how do you know so much about bikes, Angel? I ask as I lean back on the counter since she isn't a lesbian, and she is into men, and she has such an amazing effect on me. I'm nine months away from getting my master's in engineering. I want to build bikes. 
preferably ones with women in mind. She looks at me with a smile after she sees my card. Worthington? And you are Benjamin of the famous Worthington Law Firm in New York. I had pegged you as a banker, not a billionaire lawyer. A married banker with kids. Not an extremely eligible bachelor. And now this hard demeanor she's had will fade away like cotton candy in a rainstorm. You found out. I lean in a bit closer. So how about that ride now? Ha! Ah. Not the sound I thought I was about to hear. She goes to typing and not looking at me. So I ask although hesitantly, why the loud ha? Huh? I see men with money around this town all the damn time. Her eyes level on me. I can become some billionaire's bimbo, anytime I want to. The thing is, I don't want to. But you should watch out for the other ladies in this town. And when I say ladies, believe me, I am using that term very loosely. I put the card back in my wallet, as she has taken off all the information she needed, and placed it on the counter rather than placing it back in my hand. You are one of the three people in this town who know my real name, Angel. No one else will know me by anything other than Blaze. I trust you can keep my little secret. Her deep blue sensual as hell eyes, which are framed by the darkest and thickest of lashes, flutter at me as she moves her hand to her chest and says, Me? You can completely trust me to keep your name to myself. I wouldn't want to be the one responsible for getting you mauled by the pack of hungry females who are running amok through my hometown. If this is your hometown, then why haven't I seen you around before? I've been here for the last two rallies. I'd remember you, if I ever saw you around before. I take the opportunity to pick her braid up and finger it a bit, as she's close enough to do that. She yanks it out of my hand. Look, Benny. No messing around with my personal stuff. Not my braid, not my mind, not my body. I stand up and feel kind of sheepish, as she's a bit intimidating and it's not very easy for a woman to intimidate me. But her use of a nickname for me has me wanting to laugh. And I know she'd get even more pissed if I laughed right now. I shouldn't have touched your hair. You're completely right. It won't happen again unless you ask me to, of course. Then I'll run my fingers all through that silky heaven on top of your pretty little head. Her glare tells me that I have spoken the wrong words. Those porcelain cheeks fill with red, and that can only mean one thing. Anger. Pretty little head, she says with a very even and low tone. It's a scary tone, and I can see fire in her gorgeous eyes. Look, I had me a biker once, and he made me believe he loved me. He made me think we had a future, and he took off and went on a world tour alone. He broke me, Benny. I'm not a repairable person, based on how he left me. So I stay to myself. I don't want a man. Especially a biker with a love for the road, fast women, and booze. No offense. Yeah, of course. I mean, what's offensive about any of that you just said? Not a thing, right? Not one thing. I tap my fingers on the top of the counter and wonder how I can repair this damage. She pounds at the poor keyboard in front of her as she finishes writing up the ticket. Muttering indiscernible things as she does, I decide to take a walk around and look out the glass door as a group of bikers ride along the roadway in front of the garage. Hey, I hear her say, so I turn back around and see a little smile on her face. I'm sorry. I know you aren't just a biker in some gang. I know you're this high-powered lawyer who likes to ride once a year. I shouldn't have said all that to you. I'm a little high-strung at times. With slow steps I walk back toward her. I have a feeling you don't apologize often. She nods. Try never. She smiles again. It's a wide and genuine smile. Please don't tell my uncle I was so harsh to you. He just gave me a lecture this morning about not being rude to his customers. I give her a wink. So the owner is your uncle then? He is she says, standing up and coming around the counter to fix some brochures about oil and things for motorcycles. I'm working here part-time until I finish college and hopefully move on to working for some motorcycle manufacturer. Uncle Phil was nice enough to keep me employed these last few years. 
I lean on the counter and watch her as she leans over to straighten up some magazines. So, I lean a little lower to help make that not so obvious. She seems to be calming down nicely, and I'd hate her to turn back around and see me all huge for her and get mad again. So you stay home and never go out. Is that why I haven't seen you around before? I ask as I look away. Kids playing baseball. Eating ice cream cones. Riding on a merry-go-round. Damn. None of those worked. She turns back around and says, that's why. I'm a homebody. Work and school take up my time. The crazy bar scene is not for me. So, how about dinner then? I ask as she goes back to sit on the stool behind the counter again. She shakes her head and laughs. No. No dinner. No date. Nothing. Look, Benny, I don't want you to take this personally. It's not. It's just that I'm done with love. A loud laugh comes out of me. Damn. Who said anything about love? I was talking about getting some food and eating it. Not running away to Vegas with me to get hitched. Her cheeks go pink and now I've embarrassed her. Shoot. She won't look at me as she shakes her head and looks down. No. I know that. I didn't mean for you to take it that way. Sorry. Just no thank you for dinner. I think I hear them all coming back from lunch. Your bike will be looked at soon if you'd care to take a seat. How old are you, Angel? I ask as I find her way too young to be so cynical and set on a life of being alone. Her blue eyes shine as she looks back at me. 24. And you're around 30, right? I nod. I am 30. And I'm in no rush to settle down. I'm here to sow some wild oats. So I get it. Why don't you want to date anyone who comes in with this crazy rally? Good, she says with a smile. A burly man comes in from the back with a stained up blue uniform on. What you got, Angel? His voice is all messed up from years of smoking and being around harsh fumes. She gestures toward me with an open hand. This gentleman has an issue with his bike. It's the red one in the bay. He looks me up and down. In town for the rally? I nod. He looks back at Angel. He hit on you? She shakes her head. No, Uncle Phil. He was a complete gentleman. Good, he says, then turns his large body around and walks out of the room toward the bay. Once he's out of earshot, I give her a wink as she looks at me. Thanks for that. He looks like he packs a wallop. With a laugh that sounds like heaven to me, she says, he does. And I've seen the mess it leaves. I didn't want your first night in town to be with a shiner and a busted lip. The tramps would just hate it if your pretty face got all messed up. I lean over the counter again and smile at her. So I have a pretty face, do I? She blushes and shakes her head. You are incorrigible. I'm smitten is what I am. I've never been smitten before, but this has to be it. Come on, angel. Just dinner. Just one dinner and if you hate me, then I'll never bother you again. Nope. She gets up and walks out of the waiting room, leaving me there alone and wondering how the hell this chick has gotten under my skin so damn quick. I drum my fingers on the counter until she comes back. She's beaming as she goes back to her chair. Well, what has you all smiles? I ask. Oh, just the fact I was right about your bike. Just a little pinhole. It'll be ready in about an hour. Cool, I get to hang out with you for another hour. I go take a seat on the very uncomfortable old sofa and grab a magazine and sit back. Seems so. Or if you want, I can give you a ride to wherever your gang is and drop you off with them. Someone can give you a call when your bike's ready, she says. Nah, I'm going to hang out here with you and hopefully talk you into dinner tonight. I give her my million dollar smile. That won't happen, Benny. We'll see about that. End of Sneak Peek for Hot Nights in Sturgis by Michelle Love Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio Copyright 2024 BFA Publishing
Please like and subscribe to support this channel, it helps more than you know.